They say that everybody who was alive at the time remembers the day it happened, and that it was one of the most shocking events in recent American history. A president rides along in an open-top limousine on a bright November day in Dallas, Texas. The sound of gunfire rips through the air, and onlookers are horrified as the most powerful man in America slumps forward. The day that changed history was followed by some of the most widely believed conspiracy theories of modern times. The bizarre chain of deaths following the presidents did little to quash these conspiracy theories. But what do we know happened, and what do we have yet to learn about the events of that fateful day? That's what we're about to find out in this episode of the Infographic Show, What Do We Know and Not Know About the JFK Assassination? Dallas, Texas, November 22nd at 12.30 p.m. The 35th president of the United States is fatally shot as he rides in his open-top limousine. He was announced dead at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Former U.S. Marine and Communist Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested by the Dallas police about 70 minutes after the shooting and charged under Texas state law with the murder of John F. Kennedy. In a strange twist, two days later, with live television cameras filming, Oswald was fatally shot at police headquarters by Jack Ruby, a nightclub owner. Oswald was taken to Parkland Memorial Hospital where he was pronounced dead, and Ruby was convicted of Oswald's murder and died in prison four years later. A 10-month investigation by the Warren Commission concluded that Oswald acted alone in killing JFK, who was the fourth American president to be assassinated. The others were Lincoln, Garfield, and McKinley. A 1964 report also concluded that 1. The shots were fired from the 6th floor window at the southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository. 2. The shots were fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. And 3. There's no evidence that either Lee Harvey Oswald or Jack Ruby were part of any conspiracy, domestic or foreign. In a 1979 Warren Commission, the United States Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that Kennedy was probably assassinated as a result of a conspiracy. An analysis of audio recordings suggests that a second gun was used during the incident. John F. Kennedy's assassination is still subject to across-the-board debate and is one of the most prevalent conspiracy theories today. New documents relating to the event are currently being released by America's current president, Donald Trump. A poll conducted from 1966 to 2004 discovered that up to 80% of Americans still suspect that there was some sort of plot or cover-up. Some people believe that a second gunman fired from the grassy knoll as the president's open-top limousine passed. Jefferson Morley, a former Washington Post reporter who has written several books on the incident, says, I've never written about a conspiracy theory. I report facts about the assassination. Look at the Zapruder film, he says in reference to home footage of the event. Kennedy's head goes flying backwards. I know there's a theory that if you get hit by a bullet from behind, the head goes towards the source of the bullet. But as a common sense explanation, it seems very unlikely. That sure looks like a shot from the front. What do we know about Oswald? He was born on October 18, 1939, and was an American Marxist and ex-Marine. He lived in the Belarusian city of Minsk in the Soviet Union from October 1959 to June 1962. He returned to the United States with his Russian wife Marina and eventually settled in Dallas. So what don't we know about the assassination? Well, the fact that nobody kept a written record of Oswald's interview alerts suspicion and leaves much unknown. Every policeman involved violated standard procedures on interviewing detainees. In the 1960s, notes were always kept, but for some reason, these records have gone missing. This was the assassination of the most powerful man in America, and standard protocols were not followed? There's one hell of an information gap right there, but just why do onlookers shout conspiracy anyhow? Why would the government kill its own president? Well, it seems JFK was planning to withdraw from Vietnam and the Cold War, and the theory goes that too many corporations had begun to depend on the war economy and would have suffered huge losses had JFK continued on his peaceful trip. That's one of the theories. But the bizarre red flags are what really keep the conspiracy theorists chomping at the bit. Red flags such as the one raised by Jack Ruby's lone wolf attack on Oswald in a police basement. Why would he do it? Is such an attack not simply suicide? And then the sudden death of Ruby a few years later also raises suspicion. Had the Secret Service visited Ruby in jail? Was he ready to talk? Then there's that photo of Oswald that did the rounds in the press after his arrest. It was thought that the image of Oswald holding a rifle published in the press was in fact a faked image. An image of Oswald's face was superimposed onto the body of another man. Although the faked photo claim has been debunked by experts, 
the red flag remains in people's consciousness. Then there's the Umbrella Man. A figure holding an umbrella on that tragic, sunny day is thought by some conspiracy theorists to be signaling to a gunman or gunmen. The Umbrella Man was caught on a home video recording of the event and added to the conspiracy myth. In 2017, the US government released 2,800 previously classified files related to the assassination, and we can conclude from those pages the following. The FBI warned Dallas police of a threat to kill Oswald, according to a memo by director J. Edgar Hoover, but the police in Dallas, for whatever reason, failed to protect him. The FBI Dallas division was trying to track Oswald down in the days leading up to the assassination. He was of interest to the Bureau, according to Cuban sources. Pages from the file indicate that Oswald's killer, Jack Ruby, operated a shady bar with no interference from the police department, according to an FBI informant who shared the information days after Ruby was shot dead. The informant also went on to say he was surprised that Ruby actually killed Oswald rather than simply wounding him in the leg to get publicity. On the 24th of November, Hoover had begun to fear about a conspiracy theory arising, stating, The thing I am concerned about is having something issued so that we can convince the public that Oswald is the real assassin. There's two ways to read that memo. Either the head of the FBI is concerned that the real conspiracy plot will be unraveled, or he thinks that circumstances surrounding the death of the president are so bizarre it seems like a conspiracy. November 22, 1963. A warm, sunny day in Dallas, Texas. Multiple shots ring out. Moments later, the President of the United States is dead. Two days later, the man responsible was also dead. The man who killed him, Jack Ruby, descended into an unfathomable mental illness and himself died not too long after. And as you'll see today, many other people connected in some way with the JFK assassination quickly bit the dust. Number 6. So what really happened to Jack Ruby? So what happened to Jack Ruby? How come he lost his mind after he killed Oswald? One man who'd done a lot of research on this topic and a lot of research into the Manson murders isn't quite sure, but does say some things look out of the ordinary. His name is Tom O'Neill, and he just had a book come out after researching the Manson murders for over 20 years. In a podcast, he said this about Ruby's meeting with Louis Jollyon Jolly West, a man that for a long time denied he was working with the CIA on mind control program NK Ultra. O'Neill said, My most important finding is that a CIA contracted agent or researcher for mind control became that witness's doctor right before he testified and told his story, and then he goes crazy. The problem is no one who worked in MK Ultra will talk about it. It would have remained a complete secret had the CIA got away with destroying all related files. We know that just before Ruby was to testify to the Warren Commission, West visited him in his jail cell. No other people were present. West said Ruby had gone mad and was a paranoid rambling mess of a man. We must remember here that prior to this, when West wrote to the CIA's mind control master, Sidney Gottlieb, he said his specialty was inducing insanity in people without their awareness. We know that after Ruby shot Oswald, some strange things happened. The police pinned him to the floor, and out of his mouth came these words, What am I doing here? What are you guys jumping on me for? It was as if he wasn't in control of himself. A psychiatrist later said that Ruby had suffered from a fugue state with subsequent amnesia. A fugue state is characterized by someone who suddenly loses their sense of themselves, having a kind of breakdown where they don't know what they're doing. Remember, no one had any idea that West had been working with the CIA on mind control. West tried very hard to get involved with Ruby, at one time asking Judge Joe B. Brown to appoint him on the case. According to documents that were found by Tom O'Neill a long time after the trial, West had been asked by someone to work on the case, but he never said who. At first, the judge refused to give West access to Ruby, but with some effort, West insinuated himself in the case. It was thought that perhaps West, with all the skills he had, could help Ruby recall the day he shot Oswald. On April 26, 1964, West boarded a plane and went to see Ruby. Not long after, West came out of Ruby's cell and stated the man had a complete psychotic break. West said that Ruby was positively insane. No one knows and will likely never know what happened in that cell. In a sworn affidavit, West wrote that Ruby was hearing things and seeing things going as far as to hide under his table because he thought all the Jews in the US would be slaughtered. West said that Ruby said he'd seen his brother tortured, horribly mutilated, castrated, and burned in the street outside the jail. West wrote that Ruby could still hear the screams of Jewish children being boiled alive. It sounded like a really bad trip. After that, any other doctor that met with Ruby came to the same conclusion. He had suddenly gone mad. Still, doctors who talked with Ruby before West had seen him 
had said he was absolutely fine, not crazy at all. West wrote, Tonight, my own findings make it clear that there has been an acute change in the patient's condition since these earlier studies were carried out. A doctor that had seen Ruby before and after he had met with West was astounded by the change. His name was Dr. William Beavers, and he wrote that there was a possibility that someone had done something to Ruby, perhaps given him some sort of very powerful drug. He wrote the possibility of toxic psychosis could be entertained, but is considered unlikely because of the protected situation. Obviously, Beavers could not have had an inkling that West was involved in a project that forced powerful drugs on unwitting victims and tried to mess with their minds. A good point is, what if he had known about West's involvement with the CIA's dark program? He probably would have looked into the matter further. What's even stranger is the fact that Ruby was visited by Dr. Werner Tudor in 1965. He made an evaluation and sent the notes to West so they could be submitted to court. West looked at the documents and he erased one part. It said, there is considerable guilt about the fact he sent guns to Cuba. Why did West expunge that line? Did he have anything to do with Ruby's breakdown? We don't know. There is a possibility that there is more to the story than we already know. After all, the CIA wasn't exactly forthcoming about its mind control efforts. Now listen to how three men all walked into a room one day and not long after were all dead. Number 5. Enter at your own risk The journalist Bill Hunter received some acclaim for writing Three Days in Dallas after the JFK assassination. He also wrote about Ruby shooting Oswald. He was one of the few people that actually got permission to have a look around Ruby's apartment right after he shot Oswald. In April 1964, Hunter was sitting at a desk in Long Beach Police HQ and he was shot. The gun of a policeman named Crichton Wiggins had apparently accidentally gone off and a bullet had entered the chest of Hunter, killing him instantly. The officer said he had dropped the gun. Investigators soon found out that there was no way that Wiggins was telling the truth. He admitted that he hadn't dropped the gun at all, but had been playing around with it when it accidentally fired. It's believed Hunter was still working on the case, and that's why his death is seen as suspicious by some of the JFK conspiracy fraternity. Ruby had been living with a man named George Senator. We've seen the court transcripts, so this is very much a fact. Senator said this in a court about Ruby. He was a good, sound American citizen, and politics, he never messed around with that. He never messed around politically at all. The majority was connected with the music industry, the nightlife, you know, his club, his competitors, what they were doing. It was because of Senator that Hunter was allowed into Ruby's room. Also allowed inside was Dallas Times Herald journalist Jim Cothey and Ruby's attorney Tom Howard. On the 21st of September 1964, while writing a book on the assassination, Cothey mysteriously died. Some sources say that he had been karate chopped to the neck, but other sources say that he was strangled. No one knows what happened, although Time Magazine in 1966 attempted to dampen the flames of conspiracy by saying the journalist was well known for hanging out with thugs. Time said police at the time said the motive was somehow connected to homosexuality, but didn't expand on that. We found a news clipping from back then with the headline, Newsman's Death Termed Murder. The police captain said this in the report. He could have been killed by a karate blow to the neck or have fallen and struck his neck on a table or a bedstand in the room where his body was found. The apartment had been ransacked, and there were signs of a struggle. Police in the end said it was a burglary that had gone wrong, although people have said it had something to do with the notes the journalist had written about the assassination or what he knew about Ruby. One year later, Howard also died. His death was ruled a heart attack, although as people are quick to point out, there was never an autopsy. Still, the New York Times wrote that he had died of a massive coronary infection, stating, Mr. Howard had been ill for several days but continued his law practice. He was just 48. As you'll now see, not only men tied to the case died. Number 4. Was this woman really going to crack the case? One journalist actually got to chat with Ruby and her name was Dorothy Kilgolfin. She was not so sure about the conclusions that the Warren Commission came up with, and she let it be known. She also published some of the commission's findings before they were officially released to the public. What happened to her? On November 8, 1965, she was found dead in her apartment in Manhattan. Prior to that, she had written that the CIA and the Mafia had worked together. Some people have also said that she was a CIA asset. After the assassination, she reportedly told her friends that she was going to crack the case. She said to one person, in five more days I'm going to bust this case wide open. By all accounts, she had given the first draft of her book to Florence Smith, her friend, and the wife of the ambassador to Cuba. When Kilgoffin's body was found, it was determined that she had died from an overdose of booze and barbiturates. According to some sources, she was found in a room she didn't go in often. She had a book in her lap that she'd already finished, and her reading glasses, which she couldn't read without, were in another room. As for Florence Smith, did she have those notes? 
No, is the answer. She died one day after Kilgoffin of a cerebral hemorrhage. She was 45. No book or notes were found. Still, she had reportedly been ill for some time and had only just gotten out of the hospital. There is evidence that Smith was friends with JFK and Mrs. Kennedy, and it's never been revealed where the New York Times got the information from about her illness and stay in the hospital. That's just what the paper wrote in her obituary. The next one has had conspiracy theorists talking for years, but they might have been seeing things that just weren't there. Number 3. The Benavides Brothers Then there were the brothers, Edward Benavides and Domingo Benavides. Domingo was one of the witnesses who saw police officer J.D. Tippett get shot after the assassination. Some sources say he testified that the shooter looked nothing like Oswald, but from what we can see he just gave a vague description that could have been a lot of people. Some sources say that a dark presence feared that he would blow the lid on something so he needed to be taken out. But he wasn't killed. Instead, his brother, who looked like him, was shot in a tavern in Dallas. But, and this is important, the brother was shot after the Warren Commission had people testify in court. Conspiracy theorists have argued that he was shot during the investigation, but we've actually seen his death certificate. Indeed, he was murdered on February 16, 1965. This means he couldn't have been taken out accidentally by someone who wanted to kill his brother. It's just another death that you could say is the type of thing to start making lights go off in someone's head. Now let's look how one official thought that the CIA took out JFK. Number 2. The Insiders Did a man who worked for the CIA have extensive knowledge about the assassination and know that his own team had done the job? The man was named Gary Underhill. According to some books, after the assassination, he said this to a friend, You're going to Spain? That's the best thing to do. I've got to get out of the country too. This country is too dangerous for me now. I've got to get on a boat too. I'm really afraid for my life. Oswald is a patsy. They've set him up. It's too much. The bleeps have done something outrageous. They've killed the president. The CIA denied that this man worked for them. But then the CIA, it has to be said, has always been very sparing with the truth. It's a fact that Underhill worked in the military intelligence service, so he is a person of interest. It's also stated by credible sources that he did actually say those things after the assassination. Shortly after, he was found dead in his house. According to the District of Columbia Department of Public Health, his certificate of death dated May 8, 1964 read that he shot self in head with an automatic pistol. Some people have remarked that he had been shot behind the left ear, and the gun was discovered in his left hand. He was right-handed. But then, if he did kill himself, maybe he was an unorthodox kind of guy. Also, would CIA hitmen be that stupid? Now we turn to the FBI and an agent named Gary Bannister. This guy was a serious anti-communist who later went on to form his own private investigation agency. He was accused by one of his colleagues of knowing about the hit on JFK being an inside job. This guy told a lot of people about that and he became a big part of the investigation. Bannister died soon after in 1964 from coronary thrombosis. He was 63. Number 1. The Lover According to various mainstream sources, a woman named Mary Pincho Meyer was a mistress of JFK and a friend of his wife. She was also a good buddy of the wife of a very high-ranking CIA guy. In 1964, she was murdered and her death to this day remains a mystery. Her affair with the president had been a big secret, and so that information only came out later. As for her death, it was said the shooter must have had extensive training with a firearm. An African-American man named Ray Crump was charged with the murder, but when the case went to trial, he was acquitted. So why would someone have taken this woman out execution style? It's well known that she kept a diary, and in it were things that some people thought the world didn't need to know. After she was killed, people went in search of that diary. One of them was a CIA agent who was caught trying to break into her apartment, according to journalist Ben Bradley. But, so what if the diary exposed the president? So what if he and his mistress smoked weed together in the White House? Did that really qualify for her execution? Well, some of the people believed that this woman knew too much, maybe more than has been let on, and that's why she had to go. It's also worth noting that after the Warren Commission came up with its report, she was very skeptical. Maybe that was one of the reasons why the agency was wiretapping her phone. This is all true, and you have to admit her death and the timing of it do sound quite suspicious. November 22, 1963, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy's open-top Lincoln Continental limousine drives through the streets of Dallas, Texas. Crowds are ecstatic, cheering, holding flags aloft and taking photos. Nellie Connolly, the First Lady of Texas who's also in the car, turns around to the President and says, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Filled with joyousness, the President replies, no, you certainly can't. 
Moments later, as the car passes the Texas School Book Depository, shots ring out. The president's hands move toward his neck as he leans forward and a little to the left. His wife Jackie grabs hold of him. Another shot hits him in the head. Jackie, utterly distraught, cries, They've killed my husband. I have his brains in my hand. This was one of the most shocking events in US history, and not without controversy. For many years after, right up until today in fact, various theories have been put forward as to how it actually happened and who exactly did it. However, one man, and one man only, was ever charged with the crime, and that was Lee Harvey Oswald. You've all heard the name, you've likely heard some of the countless conspiracy theories about the assassination, but we guess not so many of you know much about the man who is said to have pulled the trigger. Today you're going to meet him, and you're also going to ask yourself what would drive a person to do such a thing. That's something you can tell us at the end of the video. Lee Harvey Oswald is born on October 18, 1939. He doesn't have the best start in life since his father dies of a heart attack just two months into his life. The family, now the mother named Marguerite, young Lee, and his two half-brothers John and Robert are thrust into poverty. Those kids move around in the city of New Orleans, from orphanages to children's homes to boarding schools. Not having a father figure around young Oswald's development is what you might call strangled. As his older brothers once said very early on, he learned that he wasn't wanted. We weren't wanted. Mother was always alienating herself from us. When he's 12, Marguerite takes him to New York City, where they live in a rundown area in the Bronx. He's pretty much asked to take care of himself as his mother goes out to work. He hardly goes to school at all. Instead, he hangs around the zoo and rides the subway system. It's at the zoo where one day a truant officer sees him. Oswald is not happy about being found out, calling the officer a damned Yankee. He ends up in a detention center called the Youth House, and while there he has a psychiatric evaluation. He said to live a vivid fantasy life and possibly has some kind of personality disorder. One thing's for sure, the kid desperately needs some love and attention. His social worker confirms this, saying he is emotionally frozen, having never really developed a relationship with anyone. You get the feeling of a kid nobody gave a darn about, says the social worker. In his early teens, he has an awakening. He's walking down the street when an old woman hands him a pamphlet. It's socialist in ethos and has in it two folks named Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Those two are sentenced to death in the US for spying for Russia. Sometime later, Oswald writes in his diary, I was looking for a key to my environment, and then I discovered socialist literature. I had to dig for my books in the back dusty shelves of libraries. He writes this to the Socialist Party of America. I am 16 years of age and I would like more information about your youth league. I would like to know if there is a branch in my area how to join, etc. I am Marxist and have been studying socialist principles for well over 15 months. Later, after running from the clutches of truant officers, Oswald and his mother return to New Orleans. They live in an area beset with poverty and vice, something that affects young Oswald deeply. Drug addicts, prostitutes, violent crime, pervasive racism, dilapidated housing, oppressive cops, no help for the poor, and no opportunities for those not born with silver spoons. He's taking it all in, guided by his socialist sympathies. At age 16, he becomes a cadet with the Civil Air patrol. He also tries to join the army, but is turned down for being too young. This doesn't stop him from memorizing from back to front the Marine Manual. The obvious question is, why does this budding communist want to join the US military during a very cold war with the commies? This is a kid who tells a friend he wants to kill the President Eisenhower for exploiting the working class. This is a boy who regularly showers praise on the Russian leader Nikita Khrushchev. One day, a friend's father kicks him out of his house because he's expounding the communist doctrine and saying communism was the only way of life for a worker. It seems his reason is he just needs to get away from his mother. That, or it's the fact his father had been a Marine and his brother has joined up. The Warren Commission later wrote, His study of communist literature, which might appear to be inconsistent with his desire to join the Marines, could have been another manifestation of Oswald's rejection of his environment. You should also remember he's a boy who just wants to be accepted. So at age 17, he becomes a Marine. Nothing much changes though. He makes a few friends and not so many people like him. He isn't really seen as mentally unstable, but he just doesn't fit in. Nor does he ever rise above the rank of private first class. Still, he knows something about foreign affairs because he reads voraciously. At times, he picks fights with officers, according to one soldier, so he could come out top dog. This kid still hates authority with a vengeance, but he's also smart and can be likable to certain people. One day, he shocks some folks listening to his rants by saying, all the Marine Corps did was to teach you to kill, and after you got out of the Marines, you might be good gangsters. During this stint in the Marines, he has two court martials. One for having an unauthorized pistol he accidentally shoots himself with, his other court martial 
is for calling an officer out to fight him. He still holds sympathies towards the Soviet Union and he even teaches himself some Russian, albeit he's not very good. He gets taken off active duty to look after a sick mother, but then he decides he's going to go to Russia. For that decision, he's undesirably discharged. So there he is, in Russia, telling people how much he loves the Soviet Union in his rudimentary Russian. He tries to apply for citizenship and is turned down. This is what he writes in a letter to his brother. I've been a pro-communist for years, and yet I have never met a communist. Instead, I kept silent and observed. And what I observed plus my Marxist learning brought me here to the Soviet Union. I've always considered this country to be my own. He also writes this, in the event of war, I would kill any American who put a uniform on in defense of the American government. Any American. Just before his visa runs out and he's about to leave the country, he cuts himself on purpose, after which he's taken to a psychiatric facility. He actually can't believe that the country he's given his heart to has snubbed him. In his diary, he writes, I am shocked. He says his dream has been shattered because one solitary official has taken it upon himself to turn his visa down. He finishes an entry in his diary with these words, I decide to end it, soak fist in cold water to numb pain, then slash my left wrist, then plug wrist in a bathtub of hot water. Somewhere a violin plays as I watch my life whirl away. I think to myself, how easy to die, and a sweet death. When he gets out of the hospital, he goes straight to the American Embassy. He has a signed note with him, which he hands over to an official. On it are the words, I, Lee Harvey Oswald, do hereby request that my present citizenship in the United States of America be revoked. He says he wants this for political reasons. He's a Marxist now, and damn American poverty and the life he lived as a kid. He says the only real reason he joined the Marines was that he wanted to have a chance to observe American imperialism. He writes in his diary, I'm sure Russians will accept to me after this sign of my faith in them. He's right, he's allowed to stay. But does he then become a tool of the Soviet government? Is he hired as a spy? Is he trained as an assassin? Perhaps not. And later investigations will say that. Not only that, that the Russians are obviously a bit suspicious of him. So the KGB follow him around a lot and plant bugs in his house. Oswald is actually working for neither side. He's sent to work as a lathe operator at an electronics firm in Minsk. Over there he's given quite a good wage packet and lives in an apartment that's better than most people's places. Still, his distrust of authority doesn't change. He talks about the oppressive Soviets. Communist Party officials, he writes, are given benefits that he believes they shouldn't receive. His conclusion is that they are fat, stinking politicians over there just like we have over here. In January of 1961, he writes in his diary, I am starting to reconsider my desire about staying. The work is drab, the money I get has nowhere to be spent, no nightclubs or bowling alleys, no places of recreation except the trade union dances. I have had enough. He subsequently gets in touch with the US Embassy and says he wants to come home. Prior to that happening, he has a whirlwind romance with a 19 year old pharmacology student named Marina Prusakova. After six weeks, they marry, and around a year later, they have their first child. Not long after, the three of them land on American soil, ready to live out the American dream. But something happens on Oswald's return. He suddenly becomes not himself, not the man Prusakova knows. He's become easily enraged, irritable, she later told the court. After coming to the United States, Lee changed. I did not know him as such a man in Russia. What has happened to him? Well, that's the million dollar question. Maybe his demons have caught up with them. This is a young man who's had psychological problems as a child. He's trained in the Marines and that hasn't helped. He's tried moving to the Soviet Union and that hasn't helped either. Here's a man that now tests both communism and capitalism. This is evident in this writing, of which one diary goes like this. No man, having known, having lived under the Russian communist and American capitalist system, could possibly make a choice between them. There is no choice. One offers oppression, the other poverty. He believes there can be another system, one which doesn't have the shortfalls of capitalism and one which isn't a corrupt and twisted form of Marxism. He writes that he hates the mass exterminations of Stalin and how communism oppresses people. He equally detests what he considers a corrupt form of capitalism in the US. He gets a job as a sheet metal worker, but he soon leaves that. He then starts working as a photo print trainee, but is fired after wrangling one too many people when waxing about his beliefs. He isn't very good at the job either. But what really peeves his fellow employees is the fact that one day he brings to work a Russian language newspaper. His employer said the newspaper incident wasn't the only reason he was let go, but it didn't do him any good. Oswald is rejected once again. Is he now ready to put his hand on the trigger? In March 1963, he pays $29.95 for a second-hand 6.5mm Carcano rifle. He buys himself a revolver, too. The next month, retired U.S. Major General Edwin Walker is sitting at his desk in his home in Dallas when suddenly there's a loud crash. He's injured after bullet fragments connect with his arm. To investigators, it looks like an assassination attempt, and it is. One it will turn out that was undertaken by Lee Harvey Oswald. This isn't discovered until later, though. Why has he done it? 
Oswald despises Walker for his far right-wing sentiments, his anti-communist stance, and his racist attitude. According to his wife, he believes that if someone had killed Hitler in time, it would have saved many lives. He thought he was doing the right thing. The family moves to New Orleans, where Oswald becomes more infatuated with the Fair Play for Cuba committee. There, he distributes leaflets supporting Cuba, and even though he gets on the radio twice, he doesn't really garner that much attention for the movement. Not only that, Cuban exiles can't stand him. It seems Oswald is as much concerned about getting attention for himself as he is for the plight of Cuba. His wife later said in court he wanted to be arrested. I think he wanted to get into the newspapers so that he would be well known. He then tries to get to Cuba via Mexico. In Mexico, he pleads to the officials at the Cuban embassy saying he supports the cause and can he have a visa. He says he's also intending to return to the former Soviet Union. After speaking with officials and even the KGB, he's turned down. The Cubans say he'll do more harm than good for the cause. So now, it's just days before JFK is gunned down in the street. His heavily pregnant wife is happy when he returns from Mexico, seeing as he is in a pleasant mood and treats her well. He seems like his old self again. She said later in court, he helped me more, although he always did help, adding that he was delighted about the prospect of having a second child with her. Strange, because he's about to give it all up. It's this kind of fact that will later give birth to a thousand conspiracies. Around this time, Oswald's told about a job that's going at the Texas School Book Depository, and after an interview on October 16th, he's hired there for $1.25 an hour. It's now just over a month before the fateful day. He's apparently pretty good at his job, things are looking up, and then his second child is born. Life couldn't be any better, on paper anyway. He still argues with his wife at times. Because of his radical left activities, he's now on the radar of the FBI. Agents visit his house, but he isn't there. They go again, and he isn't home. With feathers ruffled, Oswald goes to the FBI office in Dallas and asks to speak with the man on his case, James P. Hostie. Hostie isn't available, so Oswald leaves a note. That note, people later say, included a threat that said, stop bothering me or I'll blow up the FBI and the Dallas Police Department. Hostie later said there was no such threat, and the note actually read, if you have anything you would like to learn about me, come talk to me directly. If you don't cease bothering my wife, I will take the appropriate action and report this to the proper authorities. Does that sound like the words of a soon-to-be killer? The night before the assassination, Oswald goes to bed before his wife. When she later retires, he says nothing to her, even though she's pretty sure he's awake. When she wakes in the morning, he's gone. His wedding ring is sitting inside a cup on the dresser. $170 is in a wallet in a drawer. He's only taken $13.87 with him, hardly enough to flee the country. The next day, after JFK is fatally injured, Oswald is seen in a second-floor lunchroom by a cop who has a gun drawn on him. Oswald's supervisor is also there, so Oswald's allowed to walk on. He appears calm. Not long after, Oswald is apprehended after a short altercation in a movie theater. During questioning, he's forthcoming and seems composed. He denies all wrongdoing. He says he's a patsy, meaning he thinks he's being framed. The evidence against him is overwhelming. He's seen by multiple witnesses shooting and killing a policeman when walking down a street. When he's arrested in the movie theater, he says the words, well, it's all over now. But this isn't another JFK assassination story. It's a who was Lee Harvey Oswald story. So then why did he pull that trigger? It's not easy to ascertain the answer. Far from it. He was shot and killed two days later by a nightclub owner, Jack Ruby, while being escorted through Dallas police headquarters. Ruby himself was later treated by the CIA's brainwashing specialist, Louis Joylin West, and diagnosed with psychosis. That's a story to get conspiracy theorists excited. While behind bars, Ruby got in touch with the Warren Commission and said, I want to tell the truth, and I can't tell it here. Nothing came of it, and Ruby died not too long after losing his mind. Was anyone else involved in the assassination, from abroad or at home? We just don't know. Theories range from the spectacular to the heavily rejected Oswald, often insecure, having argued with his wife and just gone off the deep end. Maybe he just wanted to become the center of the world. Maybe he really thought he could help society, or perhaps, as many theories go, the Mafia was involved, the KGB was was involved, the Soviets were involved, or the Cubans were involved. If you like rabbit holes, this is a deep one. Polls show that way more Americans believe he was part of some kind of conspiracy rather than acting alone. Was he an insecure guy that managed to shock the world without any help, or was he a pawn in a much bigger game? If you had picked up a copy of the New York Times on November 22, 1963, you would have seen the historic headline, Kennedy is killed by sniper as he rides in car in Dallas. The article explains that the 46-year-old President of the United States John Fitzgerald Kennedy died from an injury to the brain. If you look at the timeline of events that day, you'll find he made his last public speech at 9.25 a.m. He grabbed some breakfast after that. Then at 11.20 a.m. he boarded Air Force One and headed to Dallas. Somewhat sadly ironic, he landed at a place called Love Field where he was greeted by admiring fans. Surrounded by bodyguards, JFK smiles and shakes hands with people, waiting behind the fences. In approximately 45 minutes, his life will be over. 
This event in some ways changed the course of US history. As most of you know, a man called Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested for the murder. Three minutes after the assassination, he left the Texas School Book Depository building. Around 30 minutes after the president was shot, doctors at Parkland Hospital announced that indeed, the beloved president to many was no more. At 1.22 p.m., police found a rifle hidden in the building where Oswald exited earlier. He was arrested soon after, but by that time, he'd already shot and killed a police officer on the street. He'd hidden in a movie theater after that, but was picked up by cops for the police officer slaying. Some hours later, he was charged with killing the president. Oswald himself wouldn't live much longer, being shot and killed by a nightclub owner called Jack Ruby in the basement of the Dallas police headquarters two days later. This is the bare bones account of what happened that day and soon after, and we're not going to attempt to investigate what might have happened. Something called the Warren Commission concluded that Oswald acted alone and fired three shots. The FBI and Secret Service agreed. Nonetheless, many Americans didn't agree and still don't. There are numerous theories as to what happened that day, where the bullets came from, who did the firing, and who, if anyone, sanctioned the hit. This isn't a show about the multiple theories, but a show about a missing body part, namely the president's brain. If you look at the death certificate, you can find that JFK died from a shot to the skull, but he was also shot in the back. Part of the report written by JFK's personal physician reads that what happened was a shattering in type causing a fragmentation of the skull and evulsion of three particles of the skull at a time of the impact, with resulting maceration of the right hemisphere of the brain. In the crudest terms, he literally had part of his head blown off. You can see a diagram drawn by the House Committee of what damage the bullet to the head did, and after seeing that, you will surely agree that it would have taken a miracle to survive such an injury. That said, even though the impact was devastating, his brain didn't just explode. The skull was indeed fragmented, but it remained held by flaps of skin. This isn't a story about pieces of tissue or bone going missing in the street that day, or on the way to the hospital. What we're saying is that President Kennedy's brain is literally missing, the full item. What we want to know is where is it? You see, JFK's brain was removed during the autopsy and stored in the National Archives. Three years after that autopsy, it was gone. The president's brain had mysteriously sprouted some legs and taken off. That or someone had taken it. The fact that this brain had disappeared, of course, has sparked numerous conspiracy theories. Word on Conspiracy Street is that someone had sequestered the dead man's thinking organ because, had they not, it would have been revealed that he was not shot in the back of the head, but actually in the front which would have somewhat challenged the Oswald did it alone theory. By the way, it's not a conspiracy theory that the brain vanished, it is absolutely true. If you were around in 1978, you might have seen a paper written by the Congressional House Select Committee on Assassinations, and in it, you'd have read that JFK's brain was officially missing. Ok, so what really happened? It's the million dollar question. Some doctors at the hospital who were around for the autopsy would testify that they witnessed first Lady Jackie Kennedy holding the brain at one point, but not taking off with it. Others would say the organ was put inside a stainless steel box and then handed to the Secret Service. It was supposedly stored at the White House and then JFK's brother, Senator Robert F. Kennedy ordered that it be held in the National Archives. Is that true? Well, in 2016, the National Archives, under the Freedom of Information Act, released 3,063 documents that had been fully withheld since the assassination. The problem is, none of those files tells us where the brain is, and some sources tell us that the National Archives inventory didn't have JFK's brain on it. Anyway, if it was there, it's not there now, that's for sure. How an assassinated president's brain can just go missing seems totally absurd, especially when it's a piece of a puzzle that has conjured up so many conspiracy theories. Let's face it, the fact it's missing is enough to pique the interest of the least skeptical person. You don't have to believe the moon is made of cheese or that a spherical earth is a joke to be very curious about where the brain went and why it vanished into thin air. There is a theory though that the missing organ may have been down to the brother. There was a book published in 2014 called End of Days, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy, and the author James Swanson said the brain might have been removed by Robert Kennedy, perhaps to conceal evidence of the true extent of President Kennedy's illness, or perhaps to conceal evidence of the number of medications that President Kennedy was taking. He said it could have been a face-saving operation by the sibling to protect his brother's name. It wouldn't be the first time a brain of a famous person went missing. Albert Einstein, one of the biggest brainiacs ever to walk the earth, 
had his organ taken by the pathologist who performed the autopsy, even though the family didn't know about it. He kept it for years, but now it's partly at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. Body parts of other geniuses and renowned people have gone missing in time and turned up again, such as Mozart's skull, Galileo's fingers. While the writer and revolutionary Thomas Paine was exhumed in the USA and then taken back to his native England only to go missing. Still, this seems more like ancient history, and the JFK assassination is still busy toying with conspiracy theorists' mind. In an interview with the Boston Magazine in 2013, that author we just mentioned, James Swanson, said he had meticulously researched the JFK assassination. He said there is no doubt whatsoever that President Kennedy was buried without his brain. The government records and reports prove that it's so. He added that he hates to say it, but it's just totally bizarre. The reason he doesn't like saying it is because there are so many myths and conspiracy theories about the assassination already. But the missing brain is real, make no mistake about it. He said documents show that it was at the National Archives, but it wasn't alone. His exact words were that it was placed with dozens of medical glass slides from the autopsy, tissue samples, blood samples, and bone fragments. Then it was discovered on all days of Halloween on 1966 that not only the brain, but the entire locker and autopsy materials had vanished, and those materials have never been seen since. As you know, he thinks the brother took it, and he certainly doesn't think it was taken because there was evidence pointing toward Oswald not doing the killing. He thinks what happened is the official version of events. In his words, this is why Robert Kennedy took the brain. To preserve his brother's legacy and image and legend, John F. Kennedy was very sick through much of his life. He was in great pain, he was taking multiple medications that was never known to the American people. Still, a cleanup operation by the brother to ensure the American people's bubble didn't get burst regarding their legendary leader might be a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people. John F. Kennedy remains unique among American presidents. Not only was he the youngest man ever elected president at 43 years and 163 days on the day of his election, but he was also the only American president to ever win either the Navy and Marine Corps medal or a Purple Heart, let alone both of those distinguished awards. Yet when questioned about how he'd become a war hero, Kennedy was famously tight-lipped and simply responded, it was involuntary, they sunk my boat. The date is August 1, 1943, and a young 25-year-old Kennedy is a lieutenant in the U.S. Navy in charge of a patrol torpedo boat in the Solomon Islands. The PT boats, as they were known, were widely used by American forces across both the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Mediterranean against the Axis powers. While other navies of the world made use of small high-speed patrol craft, it was the Americans who embraced these agile craft with a murderous gusto. Known as Speed Demons or as the Devil Fleet by the Japanese it terrorized, PT boats operated in groups and relied on sheer speed to overwhelm much larger and more dangerous opponents. The boats were often made of nothing but light woods, with no armor plating and little, if any, protection. The lightweight gave the boats incredible speeds, reaching as high as 46 miles per hour, and allowed small groups of them to descend on much larger and slower vessels, launch their torpedoes, and tear away before the enemy could react. Often PT boats would operate at night with the help of radar, and they would slowly cruise near enemy ships before launching into a high-speed suicidal charge and then howling away into the night. The Americans made great use of PT boats in the Pacific, where they regularly went up against much larger ships, such as destroyers, cruisers, and even battleships. Many of the first PT boat crews had either been high-speed boat racers back home or race aficionados, and their expertise was quickly put to use in developing tactics and upgrades for the PT boat fleet. As the war raged, PT boat crews got particularly creative and often made very unofficial upgrades to their boats, like bolting on additional main battle tank guns and anti-aircraft cannons. A PT boat could never have too many guns and bristled with firepower, making them a small but terrifying threat. JFK's PT boat, PT-109, was famously decked out with a stolen US Army 37mm anti-tank gun, which was bolted to the bow of the boat. If it was big and it could shoot, PT boat crews would inevitably find some way to lash it onto their ships and roar off into combat with their completely unsanctioned upgrades. On the night of August 1, 1943, JFK's PT boat was one of a four-boat flotilla on a mission to intercept Japanese destroyers undertaking supply runs in the Solomon Islands. Intense island-island fighting had stretched out Japanese supply lines, and intercepting incoming supply drops was critical to the success of the men fighting on the beaches and jungles of the Pacific. 
Each destroyer that made it to its destination full of vital supplies meant that many more American lives lost, and the PT boat crews were determined to stop the vital flow of supplies no matter the cost. Yet, going up against a modern Japanese destroyer was no easy feat, especially when a single shell from its main armament would be enough to kill all on board the light and unarmored PT boats. Speed and mobility was their only protection, and the PT boat crews relied on surprise and sheer aggression to get home safely. That night, however, the situation was about as poor as could be for a flotilla of PT boats on the prowl for a victim. There was no moon out and cloud cover blotted out the stars. Visibility was limited to only a few hundred meters, and to make things worse, only one of the four boats had a radar unit installed. Suddenly, the boat with the radar roared off into the dark, chasing after a Japanese target. But the other three boats were left behind, completely blind. They silently chugged along at a low speed. Because while the visibility was poor, any Japanese aircraft would be able to easily spot the wake of a PT boat due to the phosphorescent plankton that their propellers churned up. JFK was especially cautious as just days before on his first patrol, a Japanese fighter had dropped two bombs near his boat and seriously injured two of his crew. Scanning the pitch dark ocean, a gunner in the forward gun turret peers carefully into the dark. Alarmed at what he suddenly realizes is a Japanese ship coming straight for them, he yells out a warning, ship at 2 o'clock. Scanning the ocean though, Kennedy can't see anything, until finally at 200 yards and closing fast, he sees it, a wall of rapidly approaching water, the wake from a large Japanese ship. Kennedy attempts to move his boat into position to launch a torpedo at the oncoming ship. But while trying to avoid enemy air patrols, he had turned off one of the engines. Now he desperately tries to throttle the second engine up while the first struggles to move the boat out of the way. The Japanese, however, are equipped with radar and don't need to see their target. They've realized the small PT boat isn't running with both engines, and they accelerate and put themselves on a direct collision course. With a roaring of seawater and splintering wood, the huge Japanese destroyer strikes the PT boat directly in the middle. The steel bow of the Japanese ship shatters the much smaller boat and splits it in two across the midsection. Two of the 13-man crew are instantly killed, and a third is thrown overboard and sucked into the destroyer's wake where the force of the water displaced by the mighty propeller beats him mercilessly. JFK himself is hurtled against his boat's deck and severely injures his back, while an engineer below decks has his face and arms badly burned burned by the igniting gasoline before the ocean sucks him down into the depths and then spits him back up. The Japanese ship doesn't even bother to stop to pick up survivors and take them prisoner, and instead simply continues on into the inky darkness. The PT boat's light wooden hulls prove to be a lifesaver here, as incredibly both halves of the boat remain afloat. Kennedy, who had been a member of the Harvard swim team, then leaps into the water and spends the next half hour rescuing the 11 survivors and dragging them back to the remains of the boat. At dawn, though, there was no sign of rescue, and Kennedy knew that they couldn't remain on their stricken vessel as it would eventually sink. An experienced sailor and navigator, Kennedy had familiarized himself with the Solomon Islands and their currents, and spotting a small smudge in the distance he knew to be a small island called Plum Island, he told his men to prepare for a very long swim. The engineer who had been below decks, however, still had fresh and agonizing burns across his body and was in no shape to make the three-mile swim on his own. Despite his injured back, Kennedy incredibly let into the water and cut a strap loose from the engineer's life vest, gripping it in his teeth. For five hours, Kennedy slowly swam, pulling along the injured engineer, refusing to let the man drown. When he finally made it to shore, he had swallowed so much seawater that he had become violently ill and immediately vomited. Back at base, the crew of the PT-109 had already been given up for dead, leaving Kennedy and his men on a tiny island behind enemy lines and armed with only two pistols, no food, and no fresh water. Determined to get his men safely back home, Kennedy ignored the threat of prowling sharks and incredibly swam back out into the ocean that night, carrying a lantern and a pistol, which he hoped he could use to signal any passing PT boat. Unfortunately, none would materialize, and to make matters worse as he tried to swim back, a rogue current dragged Kennedy far from the island. The president-to-be would spend the entire night treading water, convinced he'd never see his men again and that he'd eventually drown. Yet, as the morning sun climbed into the sky, Kennedy was amazed to find that another current had actually carried him back to the island. Having ditched his heavy boots so he could more easily swim, Kennedy then made his way across a razor-sharp reef, badly cutting his feet. 
With no food, the crew was now starving, and the next day Kennedy rallied them once more and convinced them to swim to another nearby island where there might be coconuts to eat. Once more he told the injured engineer for another incredible three-hour swim, this time with badly lacerated feet and once more risking the threat of shark attack. At the island, the men found edible coconuts and fresh water in the leaves of the island's bushes and trees, which the men greedily drank up. Unfortunately, they wouldn't notice until dawn that the leaves had all been covered in bird poop the entire time. For the next few days, Kennedy and another of his crew would swim from island to island, constantly looking for food to bring back to the crew. On August 5th, four days after the collision, Kennedy and his crewmen were spotted by what he feared were Japanese soldiers, but turned out to be friendly natives. Kennedy inscribed a simple message into a coconut shell with a knife so that the natives could relay it to the US Navy personnel as they spoke no English. The message read, Naro ISL Commander, Native knows pose it. He can pilot, 11 alive, need small boat. Kennedy. Incredibly, the shell made its way to a New Zealand infantry patrol who then put JFK in radio contact with his PT base. Kennedy would go on to use that shell as a paperweight in the Oval Office when he won the presidency. Despite a serious injury, Kennedy did as he had promised and brought his men home, and the incredible fortitude and courage he showed serves as an example to this day. If you were ever skeptical of John F. Kennedy's assassination being an inside job, this is the story that could change your mind. Welcome to what many believe to be the most convincing of all JFK conspiracy theories. Before we talk about the evidence, and there is tons of it that may surprise even our most skeptical viewers, we need to talk a little bit about the motive. Why would the CIA, perhaps with various other officials of the American government, want to take out their own president? After all, if found guilty, it's a crime that would disgrace America forevermore. The risk involved was monumental, so there had to be a very, very big reason to go through with such a risky and treasonous plan. So we'll start our story in Cuba, Veradero Beach to be exact, about two hours from the capital of Havana. The French journalist Jean Daniel is having lunch in the living room of the summer residence of the Cuban leader Fidel Castro, a man the CIA went to almost ridiculous lengths to try to assassinate. At about 1.30 p.m. Cuban time, the phone rings. The news from the other end is that someone had tried to assassinate John F. Kennedy. Castro and Daniel had already talked quite a lot about Kennedy before they received that news. The Cuban leader had pointed out he was reassured by how JFK and the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev had been getting along so well, and that they were possibly working to effectively end the Cold War. At one point, Castro told Daniel, I know that for Khrushchev, Kennedy is a man you can talk with. I've gotten this impression from all my conversations with Khrushchev. Castro told him that he was looking forward to working with Kennedy once the president secured a second term. This was a man the CIA despised. So when news outlets confirmed that Kennedy was dead, Castro, according to Daniel, was very solemn. Castro turned to him and said, everything has changed. Everything is going to change. It certainly did. There were to be no more peace talks with the Soviet Union, that's for sure. The Cold War would rage on for many more years. On March 13, 1962, the United States Army General, Lyman Lemnitzer, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, presented a plan to the Secretary of Defense, a man JFK trusted, Robert McNamara. Like many of the people working in the highest echelons of the American military and intelligence, Lemnitzer wanted to invade Cuba. Nonetheless, to do that, the US would need a good reason, so Lemnitzer introduced Operation Northwoods to McNamara. This plan pretty much sums up the kind of people that surrounded Kennedy. Operation Northwoods was what was called a false flag operation, a fabricated event in which a fake hostile action requires an offensive response. Lemnitzer wanted to attack the US military bases and blame it on the Cubans. Among the bullets and bombs, US intelligence propagandists would spread rumors on the radio about this vicious attack on innocent Americans. They would hire friendly Cubans to walk around close to the attacks in Cuban military uniforms. They'd then pretend to capture those men. There would be fire set, aircrafts burned, installations bombed, ships attacked, and later even funerals for mock victims. Lemnitzer said they would publish casualty lists in all the biggest newspapers, along with sad stories to get enough popular support to start an invasion of Cuba. In part four of the proposal, he wrote, we could develop a communist Cuba terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even Washington. He said there would be wounding of innocent people to be widely publicized. They would want to explode a few plastic bombs in carefully chosen spots. U.S. citizens would be outraged, and of course, they'd say, yeah, go kill those commie terrorist bastardos. As crazy as that all sounds, it was par for the course. Such subversion was not unusual during the Cold War. 
Lemnitzer said all the Joint Chiefs were on board with the plan and the CIA was firing on all cylinders to make it happen. They believed the evil communists had to be stopped at any cost, which is partly why the CIA committed or encouraged human rights abuses all over the world during the Cold War. This was the political environment JFK entered when he was elected president. To appreciate the JFK assassination conspiracy theory, you have to understand what length certain people in the US military and intelligence would go to. Kennedy dismissed Operation Northwoods, telling Lemnitzer and other key advisors he could not foresee anything in the near future that would justify and make desirable use of the American forces to overt military action in Cuba. This is all well documented, as is everything we'll tell you today. JFK was isolated in his own government, according to the conspiracy theory. He'd already lost support among many of his advisors after the 1961 Bay of Pigs incident when the CIA secretly sent 1,400 Cuban exiles that they'd trained into Cuba. Kennedy was a much younger president, one with different ideas about how to carry out politics. This plan had been drawn up during the Eisenhower administration before him, and even though JFK would go on to dismiss similar plans during his term, at the end of the day he was expected to do what he was told. This all started when Castro's forces overthrew the Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista in 1959. The CIA now wanted to throw Castro out, just as they'd covertly done with success to leaders in Iran and Guatemala, with plenty of assassinations along the way. To get the job done, Cuban exiles were trained by the US at guerrilla training camps in Guatemala. American involvement was supposed to be kept secret, which did not happen. The whole thing was a total disaster. Castro's troops won and then captured many of the exiles. Kennedy later told friends that the Bay of Pigs was a trap. The older men around him had thought that he'd be drawn into sending troops in. He told his friends Dave Powers and Ken O'Donnell they were sure I'd give in to them. He added they couldn't believe a new president like me wouldn't panic. He said they had me figured out all wrong. JFK did not trust many of the older guys who advised him, and especially the CIA director Alan Dulles. Dulles admitted in memoirs found after his death that the plan was always to get Kennedy to send in troops rather than permit the enterprise to fail. Instead, JFK handed Cuba $53 million worth of baby foods and medicine in exchange for the prisoners Castro had taken. It was a total embarrassment. And while JFK gave the green light on assassination plans for Castro, he still had to keep pushing back the hawks around him that kept telling him to invade Cuba. Then there was Vietnam. The US had been active in Vietnam for years. In 1954, Vice President Richard Nixon said if the French withdrew, the United States might have to take the risk now by putting our own boys in. The CIA later helped French forces through its Saigon military mission, SMM, directing paramilitary campaigns against the communists and assisting with propaganda. The US even considered using tactical nukes on Vietnam to help the embattled French under Operation Vulture. Much later, in May 1961, JFK agreed to send 500 Special Forces troops and military advisors to help the pro-Western government of South Vietnam. A year later, close to 11,000 American military advisors were working in South Vietnam, and of course, Kennedy approved that. The Americans did not want the Communists overrunning Southeast Asia. So, under JFK, US presence did indeed increase, but Kennedy would soon start thinking differently about Vietnam. He was under a lot of pressure to send actual combat troops to Vietnam. As the Pentagon Papers later showed, he was willing to send in advisors and let the CIA do what it needed to do, but he was against sending in units capable of independent combat. The Pentagon Papers, by the way, were thousands of pages of top secret Department of Defense actions up until 1968 in Indochina. They were released in 1971 and showed the American public a very different side to military America, which would include secret campaigns in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and result in many, many thousands of dead civilians. The CIA was out of control, which likely wouldn't have happened had JFK not been taken out. That's what the conspiracy theorists think. Daniel Ellsberg, the military analyst and activist behind the Pentagon Papers, had always been unsure about where Kennedy had stood on Vietnam. It didn't seem to make sense to him, sending in more men yet remaining reluctant to send in the combat troops. So he asked JFK's brother Robert Kennedy, RFK, when he got the chance to in 1967. RFK, soon to be assassinated in 1968, 
too, told him that his brother had rejected the urgent advice of every one of his top military and civilian officials, which was to send in troops. Years later, Ellsberg recorded this conversation and said that this is what RFK had said when he was asked why his brother wouldn't send in the combat troops. RFK said, because we already were there in 1951. We saw what was happening to the French. We saw it. My brother was determined, determined to never let that happen to us. JFK knew what would happen partly because of the Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield, who he'd sent on a fact-finding mission to South Vietnam in 1962. Mansfield returned and told JFK that getting into a war in Vietnam would be a mistake. JFK later signed a National Security Action Memorandum 217, which forbade high-ranking military and civilian personnel from going to South Vietnam without State Department clearance. This rattled the Pentagon. JFK told Mansfield he was thinking about a full withdrawal from Vietnam, but he would wait. His actual words were, but I can't do that until 1965 after I'm re-elected. If he tried before, he'd be criticized by the conservatives and might lose some of their vote. JFK told his friend and consultant, a man we mentioned earlier, Kenneth O'Donnell, in 1965 I'll become one of the most unpopular presidents in history. I'll be damned everywhere as a communist appeaser, but I don't care. McNamara later surprised the military hierarchy in a meeting in Honolulu when he told them 1,000 military personnel were to be withdrawn from South Vietnam by the end of the calendar year 63. McNamara told them to draw up concrete plans. It seems the military had other ideas. After JFK's death, those combat troops were sent en masse. This happened when U.S. officials and subsequently the media said there'd be an unprovoked attack on American vessels in the Gulf of Tonkin. But the facts about this attack were at best manipulated and at worst totally contrived. They served as a pretext to go to war with Vietnam. The Tonkin Gulf Resolution, written by Congress, gave the president virtually unlimited power to do whatever he wanted in Southeast Asia, a power that was very much exercised by both Lyndon B. Johnson and later Richard Nixon. Almost 200 documents that the National Security Agency, or NSA, declassified in 2005 and 2006 show us that Congress was misled. We won't go into all the details today, but what was said and what happened were two very different things. And at the time, the misinformation was enough to make war with Vietnam look justifiable. But JFK's Vietnam withdrawal plan wasn't everything. In July 1993, a Canadian newspaper, through a Freedom of Information request, had 21 secret letters that were written between JFK and Khrushchev declassified. They talked about mountains and lakes and other beautiful things, and they also talked about atomic weapons and the destruction of the world. In one letter, Khrushchev compared their situation to the mythological Noah's Ark, saying they might see each other as clean and unclean, but in the bigger scheme of things, they were on the same ark together and wanted the same thing. They didn't want to blow the whole world up, JFK replied, saying he liked that analogy, adding, whatever our differences, our collaboration to keep the peace is as urgent, if not more urgent, than our collaboration to win the last world war. They might have been on friendly terms in those letters, but that didn't stop the Cuban Missile Crisis. After the Americans deployed missiles in Italy and Turkey, the Soviets deployed ballistic missiles in Cuba. This was fighting talk. In fact, what happened next is generally thought to be the closest the world ever came to nuclear war, despite both countries knowing that many, many millions of innocent people would die. In the middle of the crisis, JFK was under pressure to launch an attack, which he knew would mean a full-scale nuclear war. RFK, who was then the U.S. Attorney General, told the Russian Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin, We are under severe stress. In fact, we are under pressure from our military to use force against Cuba. He then said, please pass this message to Khrushchev through unofficial channels. He said, even though the president is against any action against Cuba, an irreversible chain of events could occur against his will. Against his will. This is important to understand. JFK knew when people such as General Curtis LeMay said hit them now and be done with it, they were deadly serious. In that particular instance, JFK replied sarcastically, and what do you think the reprisal would be? JFK later told his friend and special assistant, Dave Powers, can you imagine LeMay saying something like that? These brass hats have one advantage in their favor. If we listen to them and do what they want us to do, none of us will be alive to tell them they were wrong. JFK and Khrushchev came to an agreement. Khrushchev withdrew those missiles from Cuba. The US did the same in Europe, but that was done in secret, so Mr. Khrushchev lost the vote of confidence in Russia. He was seen as a weak man for trying to save the world from obliteration. JFK later told the historian Arthur Meyer Schlesinger Jr., the military are mad. 
They wanted me to do this. They were also mad at him, not just mad in general. They got even madder when he made his commencement address at the American University in Washington on June 10, 1963. He started the speech by telling the students in attendance he wanted to focus on one topic, peace. His words have gone down in U.S. history. To understand why he was taken out, you need to hear some of his speech. Like Eisenhower before him, JFK understood the danger of what had become what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. What kind of peace do we seek? JFK asked. Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I'm talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on Earth worth living. The kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children. Music to the ears of many Americans, but not what the military-industrial complex wanted to hear. He was talking about wasting billions of dollars on nuclear weapons that could destroy the world. He said peace would not be easy, but the U.S. and its enemies should work toward mutual tolerance. And he added that disarmament was favorable to war. He even had the nerve to say, let us re-examine our attitudes toward the Soviet Union. A war with this enemy, he said, would destroy all we have built, all we have worked for. He said he hoped our military forces are committed to peace and disciplined in self-restraint. Our diplomats are instructed to avoid unnecessary irritants and purely rhetorical hostility. He said the words peace and disarmament. The word peace for the Pentagon is like garlic for a vampire. Did JFK really mean it though? Was he serious about disarmament and ending the Cold War? Documents on this matter and his actions say yes, he was serious, according to the conspiracy theorists. With all of these talks of peace and disarmament, JFK had basically put a target on his head. Then on July 25, 1963, JFK delivered a 26-minute televised address on the nuclear test ban agreement. He and Khrushchev had agreed not to test new nuclear weapons. Kennedy told Americans in their living rooms that since the nuclear weapons had been created, all mankind has been struggling to escape from the darkening prospect of mass destruction on Earth. This was not disarmament, but he did say a journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step. On October 11th that year, he signed the initial order to withdraw 1,000 troops from Vietnam. That target on his head got much bigger. In Action Memorandum 263, he said, that the major part of the U.S. military task in Vietnam can be completed by the end of 1965. This memorandum later came out in the Pentagon Papers. Even so, when JFK signed that order, the CIA was doing things in Vietnam that he had no control over. The reporter and editor for the Washington Daily News, Richard Starnes, wrote that the CIA had penetrated every branch of the American government in Saigon. They ran the show. There was what Kennedy wanted in Southeast Asia, and there was what the CIA wanted. They were out of control, and always had been, which is why Kennedy said he would splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it into the winds. He said this about an agency that hired mafia assassins to take out politicians and had an assassination manual that talked about throwing people from buildings to make their deaths look like an accident. The manual explained in some cases, a CIA assassination must be made to look like it was committed by a fanatic of some sort. It added politics, religion, and revenge are about the only feasible motives, although it is intended that the assassin die in the act. You'll hear more about this kind of fantastic assassin later, but first, let's finish this first part of the show. Our mode of explanation with National Security Memorandum 239, which was titled U.S. Disarmament Proposals and was signed by John F. Kennedy. It said, I have in no way changed my views of the desirability of a test ban treaty or the value of our proposals on general and complete disarmament. Further, the events of the last two years have increased my concern for the consequences of an unchecked continuation of the arms race between ourselves and the Soviet bloc. He wanted again to talk about general and complete disarmament of nuclear weapons, and he said he would be the one to lead the talks and make this happen. He was effectively talking about ending the arms race and possibly the Cold War. He meant what he had told those students about peace and stopping humanity's slow crawl to total annihilation. Ending the Cold War, say the conspiracy theorists, was about as much as JFK's official foes could take. The target on his head was shining like the North Star on a clear night. Kennedy now only had a few months of his life left to live. Now, you have a motive, but as yet, no evidence. On October 31, 1957, a man named Lee Harvey Oswald arrived at the American Embassy in Moscow and met the consul, Richard Snyder. Oswald, who two months before had been discharged from the U.S. Marine Corps, 
told Snyder he wanted to renounce his US citizenship. He then handed Snyder a letter that explained, My allegiance is to the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. In an era of rabid anti-communism in the US, this was incredibly risky, especially if Oswald ever returned to the US. Soviet officials who were present were led to believe that Oswald might know something of special interest. Oswald said he would make known to them all the information concerning the Marine Corps and his specialty therein. All of this is documented. But what did he know? Wasn't he just a regular soldier, as people were later told? It's often said that Oswald was a kind of nobody in the military, but his job as a radar operator at Atsugi Air Force Base in Japan was not a nobody's job. This is a crucial base of operations for the CIA as it acted as its headquarters in that part of the world. With one more base in the region, this was where the CIA's very secretive U-2 spy planes took off from. This program was run by CIA officer Richard Bissell, who worked closely with CIA director Alan Dulles, both of whom were tasked with using these planes for spying missions over the Soviet Union. Rather than a nobody, Oswald had crypto clearance at the radar control room where he worked, meaning the most top secret of top secret clearance. Oswald often listened to the radio communications of the U-2. He certainly would have known many things the Soviet Union would have wanted to know. Marine Corps Lieutenant John E. Donovan was later Oswald's officer at another base where Oswald had the same access to ultra top secret information. But what's incredibly strange is that when the Warren Commission later interviewed Donovan about Oswald's involvement in JFK's death, they asked not one thing about Oswald's U-2 work and his access to top secret information. You'd think that that would have been important, say the conspiracy theorists. When Donovan was asked about that years later by a writer, he told the writer that he actually asked the Warren Commission investigators, don't you want to know anything about the U-2? They replied, we asked you exactly what we wanted to know from you, and we asked you everything we wanted for now, and that's all. Donovan then asked another guy from the program if they had asked him about Oswald's U-2 work, and he confirmed that he wasn't asked about it either. Weird. It's also weird that six months after Oswald defected, the first U-2 plane was shot down by the Soviets. It was as if they had insider information. But guess what? When a year later Oswald returned to the US after some factory work in Minsk, the Americans who had been made aware of Oswald's possible connection to the U-2 attack allowed him to walk right back into the country without a problem. They gave him a passport and even a loan just 24 hours after he applied for the passport. This was insane considering that Oswald had worked on classified spying technology and defected to the enemy shortly after. Many would see this as treason something fishy was going on. People who later wrote about this said every single obstacle was removed for Oswald on his return to the US. The Warren Commission never uttered a word about Oswald's crypto clearance and his U2 work. But why? Something else the Warren Commission didn't talk about was the fact that Oswald worked near the CIA site in Japan where MK Ultra mind control experiments were conducted on captives and its own soldiers. A CIA memo declassified just recently titled Truth Drugs and Interrogation, tells us that the CIA dosed agents who performed dangerous overseas missions. Maybe the Warren Commission didn't know about the mind control stuff, but that would be surprising since the commission used CIA and FBI personnel for the investigations. Yes, some say the CIA was tasked with investigating a crime it had committed. Former CIA agent Victor Marchetti, who wrote the book saying many things the CIA did not want to be published, said back then the CIA ran an operation from the Office of Naval Intelligence in which young men were to appear like they were angry at the US and disenchanted with its capitalist ways. They were then sent to the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe as spies. About 40 men were in the program, each of them trained at Nags Head, North Carolina. They learned how to act and what to say, with the Americans knowing the KGB would pick these men up at some point. The Americans hoped the KGB would try to turn them into spies, making them valuable double agents. Is that what Oswald was doing when he went to the Soviet Union? Very possibly, say the conspiracy theorists. Oswald's former roommate in the US, James Botello, said Oswald's whole pro-communist thing was a total lie, a pretense. He told writers that Oswald was actually anti-communist. He added, I was sure that Oswald was on an intelligence operation in Russia. He said when Oswald returned and was welcomed back with open arms, not even being questioned by US police or intelligence, he knew Oswald was definitely working for intelligence. Moreover, considering Oswald defected to the USSR and told the guys at the embassy on record that he had information to give the Soviets, how come he could move around without constantly being surveilled? 
How did he manage to kill JFK with that kind of history? With the CIA knowing he was working where JFK would one day pass? The conspiracy theorists say this guy makes about as much sense as the movie Inception. Well, I mean, they didn't exactly say that, but you get the point. It's believed a man named George de Morenschlitt was Oswald's CIA handler. In 1977, he gave an interview saying this was true. He explained that a CIA agent named J. Walton Moore put him in touch with Oswald. Morenschlitt said, I would never have contacted Oswald in a million years if Moore hadn't sanctioned it. The New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison, depicted in the movie JFK by Kevin Costner, called Morenschlitt a CIA babysitter. Garrison said some of Morenschlitt's family told him Oswald had been made a scapegoat for JFK's assassination. Morenschlitt's wife and daughter said on record that he was the one who got Oswald a job in Dallas at a graphics arts company. This firm, Jaggers, Childs, and Stovall, was according to the Warren Commission, just a regular commercial advertising outfit, and left out the fact that the company made highly classified maps for the US Army, possibly maps of Cuba and the Soviet Union, which Oswald could have helped with. Three hours after Morenschlitt opened his mouth about his relationship with Oswald, he was found dead in a house in Florida. This happened just minutes after Gaten Fonzi, an investigator with the House Select Committee on Assassinations, had come knocking at his door and left a card. The writer James Douglas, whose investigations we've used a lot today for this show, believes Morin Schlitt was just a pawn in the game. Garrison understood only too well that people who talked tended to suddenly die, which is why he hid one female witness we'll discuss later. We'll also show you a bunch of very mysterious deaths. The man running the CIA's counterintelligence programs from 1954 to 1967 was James Jesus Angleton. This Yale graduate was a fervent anti-communist and was the head of the CIA's assassination program, which he ran with Army Colonel Boris Pash. The latter is more famous for investigating Robert Oppenheimer for alleged spying activities for the Soviets regarding the atomic bomb. Pash also led the Alsace mission when the Americans tried to grab Nazi scientists who'd worked on the atomic bomb and chemical weapons. After that, he took charge of the CIA's so-called wet affairs, which were assassination and kidnapping programs. When the Church Committee and the House Select Committee on Assassinations HSCA, looked into such men, they found that Angleton's Special Investigations Group had a file on Lee Harvey Oswald. It was called a 201 file. The CIA had this on Oswald for three years before JFK was killed. The Warren Commission had not found this, and if it had, things might have turned out very differently. 201 files were for CIA operatives that needed to be watched closely as they become suspicious. But what's also interesting here is that documents were unearthed that showed the CIA had been creating phony 201 files for the ZR Rifle Project, which was related to the assassination of political leaders. The reason that some of these files were forged was so the CIA could one day use that person as a scapegoat. They could say, look, we already knew this agent was up to no good, and then place all the blame on him. The HSCA interviewed a woman named Ann Egerter. She worked for Angleton and had seen Oswald's 201 file. It was her testimony that showed us that Oswald was actually a CIA asset, but one who was under investigation by the CIA or perhaps being set up to become a scapegoat. We should say that she was indirect with her answers when interviewed, but researchers now say her testimony implies strongly that either Oswald was indeed a member of the CIA or was being used in an operation involving members of the CIA. The former CIA finance officer Jim Wilcott also backed up the fact that Oswald was a CIA asset. Wilcott became a whistleblower who said he left the CIA when he realized the work they were doing had nothing even remotely to do with humanism. His wife, who was also CIA, left too. They both testified that by leaving, they'd be able to sleep better at night. Jim testified that another reason was that while working at the Tokyo station, other loose-lipped CIA agents told him the CIA killed JFK. Jim testified, I thought these guys were nuts, but then a man I knew and had worked with before showed up to take a disbursement and told me Lee Harvey Oswald was a CIA employee. I didn't believe him until he told me the cryptonym under which Oswald had drawn funds. Jim then realized that he himself had advanced funds to this same cryptonym, which in his eyes made him partly involved in his beloved president's assassination. In 1978, after Jim had left what he saw as a disgraceful agency, he told the San Francisco Chronicle, it was common knowledge in the Tokyo CIA station that Oswald worked for the agency. It was also widely known that he'd been employed to become a double agent spying on Russia. 
Jim explained Oswald was recruited from the military for the express purpose of becoming a double agent assigned to the USSR. More than once, I was told something like, so-and-so was working on the Oswald project back in the late 50s. He added, one of the reasons given for the necessity to do away with Oswald was the difficulty they had with him when he returned. Apparently, he knew the Russians were onto him from the start, and this made him very angry. After this kind of talk, both Walcotts had their lives made very difficult, which, as you'll soon see, happened to many people. They were followed everywhere they went. They struggled to find work. Their car tires were slashed. They regularly received threatening phone calls. Now we should talk about Richard Case Nagel, a CIA double agent who was arrested on September 20, 1963 after walking into the State National Bank in El Paso, Texas and firing two shots into the ceiling. He said he'd purposely got himself arrested because I would rather be arrested than commit murder and treason. Nagel had worked for Field Operations Intelligence, which was tasked with covering up the true nature of the CIA objectives. As a double agent, he also worked for the KGB, and one of his tasks was surveilling Lee Harvey Oswald. Nagel admitted all of this later at a time when fewer people believed Oswald had acted alone in killing JFK or even acted at all. Nagel also said the KGB knew about the JFK assassination plot before it happened. He said if anyone wanted to stop the assassination, it was the KGB. JFK was a much better leader for the Soviets than anyone who might replace him. The KGB told Nagel to either kill Oswald or to at least try to convince him that he was being set up to become a patsy, he told him when he met Oswald in New Orleans. Nagel also sent FBI boss J. Edgar Hoover a registered letter saying he'd been ordered to kill Oswald and that there was a plan to assassinate JFK. Nagel believed that he would somehow be implicated in this assassination, so he got himself arrested. Jim Garrison interviewed him and later said he was the most important witness there was. Nagel said after talking to Garrison, he survived three attempts on his life and then agreed to stay quiet for a nice pension. But what about his letter to Hoover? He said he wrote it in a way to persuade the reader that its sender was familiar with CIA procedure, that it was not a crank letter. He used the alias Joseph Kramer, a pseudonym of a Soviet agent known to the US. Surely that would mean the FBI knew what was going to happen to JFK. The FBI has always denied it received such a letter. Since there is no letter, Nagel has been painted as a loon. But then, in 1995, the Assassination Records Review Board ARRB, got in touch with Nagel, saying they would take him seriously as long as he told them everything and handed over every document he had that could show he was telling the truth. They mailed him a letter saying that on November 1, 1995, which was the day he was found dead in his bathroom in his house in LA. It was said to be a heart attack, in spite of him being in good health and having no heart issues. We should add that under MKUltra, the CIA worked on methods to cause people to have heart attacks. His son Richard was left the key to a storage lockup in Tucson, Arizona, where his dad had told him he kept all of his documents in a purple trunk consisting of everything about his time in the CIA. When Richard arrived, he found all of his father's things, minus the purple trunk. It was gone. It was also strange that the day Richard went to Arizona, his house was broken into and ransacked. Weird. We should also mention Thomas Arthur Valley the man believed to have been the CIA's first patsy, who was to be blamed for the assassination of JFK on November 2nd in Chicago rather than November 22nd in Dallas. This was only made public knowledge four decades after JFK was assassinated. Information about Valley, the fact that he looked like Oswald and had a background similar to Oswald's, was never made available to federal agents in Dallas at the time of JFK's visit. The assassination in Chicago failed, but Valley was still arrested. The file on Valley said he was a far right wing lunatic obsessed with guns, a loner, and paranoid. This fits perfectly with what the CIA like to call lone actors when they need to blame a crime on someone. The Secret Service had learned about the Chicago assassination plot, so raced to Valley's house where they found an M1 rifle and 500 rounds of ammunition. They told the Chicago police to watch this man 24 hours a day. A day later, policemen Daniel Groth and Peter Sherla pulled over Valley's car and found a hunting knife in the back. In the trunk were 300 rounds of ammunition. When investigators later interviewed Valley, he told them he'd worked in Japan on the secret U-2 program. They found his car's license plate had been frozen. Journalists were told the plate information was classified. As for those two detectives, they went on to have astonishing careers in police intelligence. The academic Daniel Stern investigated Groth's police career and said he'd never had anything close to a normal career. He went missing for long periods. He and other researchers said Groth actually worked for counterintelligence. 
Had they been part of a plot to make Vali a patsy, placed there just in case the assassination was successful? Vali's sister, Mary, believes her brother was set up as a potential assassin. She said Thomas was never the lone nut he'd been portrayed as, although he did have a history of some mental health issues. That's why he was honorably discharged from the Marines in September 1956. What's more, Valley later told the journalist Edwin Black that he'd worked for the CIA at a training camp in Long Island, training Cuban exiles in the art of assassination. Just like Oswald, he'd somehow managed to find a job right where the Chicago assassination attempt would happen, where JFK's motorcade would pass. It was as if his life was the double of Oswald's. Later investigations showed Valley also had access to a window at his new workplace that had the perfect view of the motorcade that was to pass through Chicago. Secret Service heard that two snipers with high-powered rifles were believed to be waiting for the president to pass through. The Secret Service, now knowing about the threat, arrested three men as possible snipers, and another two men were being held. These men were in custody just as the Chicago cops arrested Valley. The possible snipers arrested that day also didn't become known to the public for decades. Abraham Bolden, the first black person to ever guard a president, was there in Chicago. He later said he couldn't understand why some of JFK's security was so lax. He said some of the men were drunk half the time. Bolden started drawing lines between what happened in Chicago and what happened in Dallas. On May 17, 1964, he tried to call the Warren Commission about this, but he didn't get through. On May 18, he was arrested and accused of trying to sell Secret Service files. He was disgraced, even though there was hardly any proof. At his home in Chicago, as he sat in prison, his garage was burned down. A shot was fired through a window, scaring his wife and kids. When he spoke with Jim Garrison, he was subsequently put in solitary confinement. In 1995, when AARB got on the case, the Secret Service destroyed all records of the Chicago plot after AARB investigators asked for access to them. So, the theory goes that Oswald was framed, but to frame him, he needed to be seen doing a lot of sketchy things prior to the investigation. More than just going to Russia or seeming like he was pro-Cuba, that's where his double comes in. Prior to the assassination, there were many sightings of a man who looked like Oswald. He was seen at a firing range on a few occasions. The theory says that the CIA was trying to make this man look guilty by sending a body double to the local firing range. One of the witnesses in the Warren Commission, Malcolm Price, said someone who looked like Oswald asked for help with his scope at a Dallas firing range. The witness Garland Slack said he was at another firing range, and this Oswald character drew attention to himself by burning up his ammunition on Slack's own target. Slack said when he complained the man gave him a look he would never forget. The problem was, when the Warren Commission was told about these events, Oswald was supposed to be in Mexico City visiting the Russian and Cuban embassies. There were too many Oswalds. The conspiracy theorists say they weren't just setting up Oswald, but indicting the whole of the Soviet Union in a Cold War they needed the American public to support. Four days before JFK was shot and killed, the Soviet embassy in Washington received a letter written by Oswald, or at least signed by Oswald. J. Edgar Hoover's FBI read the letter before it ever got there. In the letter, Oswald admitted to meeting with Valery Kostikov, the KGB's undercover assassination specialist. So the man who apparently killed the JFK four days prior to killing him sent a letter talking about hanging out with the Soviet assassin. This was a perfect setup. But how do we know Oswald wrote the letter? Asked the conspiracy theorists. The Russian ambassador wrote, this letter was clearly a provocation. It gives the impression we had close ties to Oswald. He said the US must have been aware of the letter. He added that whoever wrote it was no doubt behind the assassination. When Lyndon Johnson became president after JFK, he actually decided not to scapegoat the Soviet Union, but he didn't question the fact that Oswald was guilty. The Warren Commission would later make out that Oswald's plan was to escape by plane to Cuba after he knocked off the president. This obviously didn't happen since Oswald was arrested and later shot dead by someone we'll discuss later, Jack Ruby, maybe not a man who you think he was. Oswald didn't fly away, but it had to look like he had planned to do it. The Patsy needed a fake getaway. On November 20th, 1963, a car drove into Red Bird Airfield just outside Dallas. It parked close to the American Aviation Company, a private airline. One man stayed in the car and a woman and a guy entered the office. They said they wanted a Cessna 310 for November 22nd and wanted to fly to the Yucatan in Mexico, not too far from Cuba. 
Wayne January, who was the owner, became suspicious when they asked lots of strange questions such as how far the plane would go, at what speed, and where else they could fly besides Mexico. These were amateur sounding questions, the type a kid or criminal would ask. January also said he looked in the car at the guy that didn't come in and not surprisingly, he said it was Lee Harvey Oswald. He said that after the assassination, of course, Redbird Airfield was just five miles from where Oswald lived. In 1991, through a Freedom of Information request, a British man named Matthew Smith got hold of the FBI's report on the Redbird Airfield incident. Smith then flew into the US to find Wayne January and told him what the FBI had said about the incident. January was shocked. The FBI had written that the incident occurred in July, not November, two days before the assassination. It also said January had been unsure about it being Oswald in the car when he had told him it was for sure him. His exact words were, I gave them a 9 out of 10 chance. The reason for all the lies, say the conspiracy theorists, is that in January's testimony he said he thought those two people were thinking about hijacking a plane to Cuba. After President Johnson decided not to implicate Cuba or the Soviet Union in JFK's death, they now didn't need this Red Bird Airfield incident. It had to be played down. Just half a day after the Red Bird incident, a police lieutenant in Louisiana named Francis Frug was called into a hospital in Eunice, Louisiana. There he met a woman who was in withdrawal from opiates. Her name was Rose Charmaine. She said she'd been driving with two men, who later threw her out of the Silver Slipper bar that they were drinking at, and she got run over. Frug took her to another hospital where she could have her withdrawal in more comfort. And on the two-hour journey, Charmaine told him the two guys she'd been driving with had told her they were going to kill the president when he arrived in Dallas. She said they were either Cubans or Italians. He didn't, of course, think so much of it since she was in a bit of a state at the time. But when two days later JFK was shot, Frug called the hospital and told him not to let Charmaine out of there. He couldn't believe it. Had she really known? After JFK was killed, they contacted the FBI about what she had told them and they were told they already had their man. They didn't want to know about Charmaine's story. In a strange twist of fate, it also came to light that Charmaine had once worked for the nightclub owner Jack Ruby. She also told Frug that through Ruby, she had met Lee Harvey Oswald. She explained that Ruby and Oswald were actually quite close. She never got to testify in the subsequent JFK investigations. On September 4, 1965, she was found dead in the middle of a road in Big Sandy, Texas. The driver of the car that had hit her said that he had swerved to miss some suitcases piled in the road, only when he swerved, he went over a body. It's never been explained why a woman at 3 in the morning was lying in the road next to a pile of suitcases. Dr. Charles Crenshaw, who later wrote the book about JFK's assassination, said her autopsy showed the kind of head wound that's usually associated with a gunshot wound. She might not have even been hit by the car. Jim Garrison wanted to exhume her body, but the state of Texas refused his request. When Mac Manuel, the owner of the Silver Slipper, was later interviewed, he identified the two men that she was with as Sergio Smith and Emilio Santana, two Cuban exiles. Santana told Jim Garrison that he had worked for the CIA in 1962 when he first got to Miami. He was involved in moving weapons on the sea for guerrilla fighters in Cuba. The CIA admitted to using him but said they terminated his contract in 1963. Charmaine's story might sound unbelievable, but it's just a little bit strange that she talked about knowing JFK was going to be killed at a time that she was seen with Cuban CIA operatives. The conspiracy theorists say this is just one coincidence of hundreds of strange coincidences. As for the other man, Smith, he'd once been arrested in Venezuela on charges of plotting to kill President Ernesto Betancourt, the so-called father of Venezuelan democracy. Records show Smith was released from prison and the US Embassy came to his aid. He went straight to New Orleans, where he worked with a Cuban exile group, and it was there he befriended the detective-slash-intelligence agent Guy Bannister, who also knew Oswald. Small world, eh? Say the conspiracy theorists. Bannister and Smith had offices in the same building, the Balter Building. The witness, David Lewis, who worked for Bannister, later testified that Oswald and Smith knew each other. Ok, let's move on a little bit. 23-year-old Julia Ann Mercer said on the day JFK was murdered, she saw a green truck parked close to Dealey Plaza, where the president would be killed in one and a half hours. A man exited the truck and pulled out what she described as a rifle case. The man then walked over to an area that would later become known as the Grassy Knoll. She said three cops were standing nearby and not one of them did anything about this man walking around with a rifle case. She then pulled up next to the truck and looked at the driver. She got a clear look at him, but only recognized him two days later when she saw his face on TV. 
she was absolutely sure the guy driving the truck was Jack Ruby. She said that well before anyone ever asked her questions about some conspiracy. After seeing the guy with the rifle, she'd been overheard telling her friends about it at a restaurant. Police officers later stopped her and told her she'd been heard chatting about seeing a man with a rifle, and what's more, the president had just been shot. She was then questioned for four hours at a Dallas police station. When Jim Garrison interviewed her later, he showed her and her husband the statements she had made to the cops. She looked at them, and she said she'd never said anything like that. Her actual words to Garrison were, they've all been altered. They have me saying just the opposite of what I really told them. She said she'd been given photos to look at by the cops of who might have been driving the green truck. She picked up one of them and said it was him for sure. She turned it over and on it was written Jack Ruby. They definitely showed me Jack Ruby and I definitely picked him out as looking like the driver, she told Garrison. Just imagine if this had gotten out before Ruby killed Oswald. It would have been massive, but the cops wrote that Mercer had been unable to identify the truck driver. She told Garrison that she told her family the day she saw Ruby on TV that this was the guy she'd seen driving the truck. She then notified the FBI that not only had she seen Ruby in the photo, but that she had seen him again on the TV. But this wasn't in any FBI report. The only thing the official report said that was indeed one of the photos she'd been shown was of Ruby, but they said she hadn't picked him out. Garrison told her the FBI report said she said the words air conditioning were written on the truck, but she told Garrison that she told the FBI the truck had no writing on it. I clearly said there was no printing on the truck, she told Garrison, but that didn't stop the agents from spending two days looking for air conditioning trucks. She also told Garrison neither of the signatures on these two pages of the affidavit are mine, although they are close imitations. On the day of the assassination, Sheriff Bill Decker and Police Chief Jesse Curry were both nervous. They knew the president would be exposed. Both of them had been told by the Secret Service to lighten security that day. Decker had told his men they were to take no part in the security of the presidential motorcade. The House Select Committee on Assassinations later said both these men were just following orders from the Secret Service, orders that proved to be fatal to the president. The Secret Service said that JFK was the one who didn't want officers all around him, but subsequent interviews refute this. Air Force Colonel Fletcher Prouty, who'd protected President Eisenhower before, said all the windows of buildings in the vicinity should have really been locked down with tape over the order do not open, but that never happened. There was a vacuum of security for JFK. Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig said just after the president was shot, he saw a man running down the hill toward another man driving a light green Rambler station wagon. He tried to stop them, but he couldn't get across the street and the car took off. Craig then ran toward the Texas School Book Depository to tell the Secret Service. There he met a man who said he was Secret Service, who Craig said didn't seem very interested in what he had to say. Craig later went to the police station and talked to Captain Will Fritz of the Homicide Division. By this time, Fritz said they had a man in connection with the killing. Craig asked to look at him to see if he was the same man he'd seen running toward that green rambler. It was the same man, but how could it be? Oswald said that station wagon belongs to Mrs. Payne. Don't try to drag her into this. Mrs. Payne, who Oswald and his wife had stayed with, owned a station wagon, but it was a Bel Air Chevrolet. This would all be refuted anyway when the Warren Commission would say Oswald walked out of the building and got on a bus. The witness, Helen Forrest, also said she saw the running man enter a green rambler. James Pennington corroborated what she saw, while some witnesses said they saw a man in a hat and tan or brown sports coat. Carolyn Walter said she saw a man in the school book depository leaning out of a window holding a rifle. Marvin Robinson and Roy Cooper both saw a man running down the hill toward the Green Rambler. The Warren Commission rejected all these reports of a Green Rambler. They couldn't use them because when Oswald was seen getting into the Rambler, Officer Marion Baker and Roy Truly said they'd seen Oswald on the second floor of the Texas Book Depository. What about JFK's injuries? His wife Jackie said, I was trying to hold his hair on, but from the front there was nothing. But from the back, you could see, you know, you were trying to hold his hair on and his skull on. The Warren Commission wiped these words from their investigation, saying they were in poor taste. What these words might also have done is help prove that her husband was shot from the front. We won't get into the magic bullet theory too much because it would make our story even longer, but just keep in mind that this very crucial fact was striked from the official report. On the day of the shooting, William Allen Harper was taking photos near the grassy knoll. He actually found a large piece of skull fragment, which he then took to his uncle, Dr. Jack Harper. Jack passed it on to Dr. Karens, the chief pathologist at the hospital where they worked. Both Karens and another pathologist looked at the fragment and said it was a piece of skull, 
belonging to the occiput, the lower back of a human skull. Nine years later, a student at UCLA realized that the x-rays of JFK's skull couldn't have been the real thing if these pathologists had been right. The x-rays showed a different part of his skull was missing. The x-rays fit the official story, which said there was only one gunman. But the skull fragment those guys had looked at suggested there must have been more than one perpetrator, meaning JFK was also hit from the front. Dr. David Mantic, a radiation oncologist, later investigated the x-rays and determined they were not authentic. They'd been forged, he said. As for Oswald, he told the cops that when the president was shot, he was having lunch on the first floor. He then went up a floor to buy a Coke from the vending machine. A key witness whose testimony was ignored by the Warren Commission saw Oswald there at 12.15. Her name was Carolyn Arnold. She said she knew Oswald well because he was always stopping by her desk and asking for change for the vending machine. She said she knew the time when she saw Oswald as it was lunchtime. She went into the canteen for some water and saw Oswald sitting there with his coke. She said he was alone as usual and appeared to be having lunch. This was apparently 15 minutes before he must have raced up three flights of stairs, set his sights on the president, shot him, and then escaped. JFK was also supposed to pass there at 1225, so the killer was apparently sitting back and acting relaxed 10 minutes before getting ready for the shooting in a different part of the building. About one and a half minutes after the shooting, Dallas patrolman M.L. Baker flew into that second floor canteen where he saw a calm Oswald. Baker then asked the superintendent, do you know this man? Superintendent said yes. Oswald then finished trying to get a coke from the machine. One minute later, the clerical supervisor, Mrs. R.A. Reed, also saw Oswald on the second floor. He had a can of coke in his hands. They all testified that when they'd seen Oswald, he was not out of breath and looked totally calm, and yet the Warren Commission was trying to say he pulled off the crime of the century and moved about as fast as Casper the Ghost. Fifteen years later, Arnold found out that the FBI had changed her statement from seeing Oswald on the second floor to seeing him in the hallway off the first floor. This doesn't make any sense to me, she told a journalist. Her testimony of Oswald calmly eating lunch just did not fit the narrative. There are many more witness statements as to what happened at the book depository and in the street, and many of them are contradictory or not very reliable. This has been discussed time and again, and yet no one can say with certainty what happened. So, we'll move on to focus on broader aspects of the case. As you know, the Warren Commission said Oswald then killed Officer J.D. Tippett and later fled into a movie theater. This is only one story, though. There is another take on this tale, say the conspiracy theorists. The Warren Commission says Tippett pulled over Oswald at 1.15. They exchanged words, Tippett walked around the car, and Oswald shot him. Oswald hit him with four bullets, after which he took off on foot, reloading his gun on the way. The report says 12 people saw the shooter and at least five made Oswald out in photographs at the station. Calvin Brewer, manager of a shoe store, also saw Oswald. He said he saw Oswald acting weird, and then he went into a movie theater. Julia Postal, who was in the ticket booth, saw the man sneak in, so she called the cops. The time was 1.45. Even so, Warren Butch Burroughs, who ran a concession stand in the theater, claims to have seen Oswald at 1.05. He didn't see Oswald enter the theater, but he saw him inside. Butch said he was 100% sure of that. He also said Oswald bought popcorn from him at 1.15, exactly when Tippett was shot. Again, it was as if there were two Oswalds. 18-year-old Jack Davis also saw Oswald at this earlier time. Davis said he was weirded out because there was loads of space in the auditorium, but this guy sat really close to him as if he was trying to be seen. The man then got up and went to sit somewhere else. He proceeded to get up again and went to the lobby. Davis said Oswald returned about 20 minutes later, although Butch said the Oswald he saw instead went to sit by a pregnant woman. Butch then said after Oswald was arrested in the theater after being wrestled to the ground, he was astounded. He said he saw another Oswald like a twin brother. One Oswald was carted out of the front of the cinema, and Butch said he saw the other Oswald being taken out the back. Bernard Hare, who owned a hobby shop, saw the commotion out in the street at the front and then went into the back of his store where there was an alley behind. Regarding what he saw at the back, he later said police brought a young man out, they put him in a car and drove off. That was all fine at the time for Hare, but years later he learned that Oswald was taken out the front, which he said he knew was wrong because he'd been there and seen he was taken out the back. Both Hare and Butch's stories seem to suggest there were two Oswalds, as does the story of police officer L.D. Stringfellow, who said in a police report that Oswald was arrested on the balcony at the theater auditorium, but he wasn't. He was arrested in the main bottom part. So, who did Stringfellow see being arrested? 
and who was the Oswald that the motor mechanic T.F. White saw around 2 p.m. who was wandering around a free man? The other Oswald by now was in a police station. White saw a car that seemed suspicious, a red Falcon. He took the license plate, PP4537. A man in a white shirt got into it, who White realized later that night when he saw the man on TV was Lee Harvey Oswald. But how had he seen him at 2 p.m. when he was apparently in custody at the time? White's wife said, say nothing, keep your mouth shut. Years later, a journalist got that license plate number. When he checked it out, it belonged to Carl Amos Mather, who worked for Collins Radio, a contractor for the CIA. The FBI then talked to Carl Mather's wife, who said Carl was very close to the deceased Mr. Tippett. It was she and Carl who broke the news to Tippett's wife after he was shot. Fifteen years later, Carl said he'd testify to the House Select Committee, but only if he was granted immunity from prosecution. There were too many coincidences, say the conspiracy theorists, too many connections, but the best one follows. The official timeline is further complicated by the story of Robert G. Vinson, who worked in the U.S. Air Force for the North American Air Defense Command, or NORAD. He saw the second Oswald, too. He was on the same getaway plane as Oswald. Let us explain. Vinson wanted to go to Colorado Springs, which was home, so he went to Andrews Air Force Base and, as was customary in the Air Force, asked if he could hitch a ride on one of the planes. No planes were leaving, so he wrote his name and serial number on a sheet, so he was on the list to go next. He then went to breakfast, but halfway through it, he heard his name called on the loudspeaker. He was told a C-54 cargo plane was leaving for Denver. Great, he thought. The plane had no markings on it, and when he got inside, it was empty. He saw two men in overalls working on the plane, but strangely, they also had no markings on their clothes. Vincent was also surprised that no one asked him to sign the manifest, which happened every time he hitched a ride. When he was high in the sky, he heard a voice on the intercom say, the president has been shot. The plane suddenly banked left and headed south. Soon in the distance, he was very surprised to see the skyline of Dallas. Two men in Dallas got on the plane, a taller man and a shorter man. He thought nothing of it until sometime later when he saw Oswald on TV and he knew he was the shorter guy. Both these guys got off the plane when the plane landed again. Vincent later said, I couldn't understand why they were in such a rush. Vincent later found out the plane had landed in New Mexico. He eventually got home and sometime later he told his wife that Oswald had somehow been on his plane. His wife said he was nuts. He kept quiet about it for 30 years and in all those years, despite immaculate service, he never got a promotion. Let's remember, he put his name and serial number down at that Air Force base. If the man really was Oswald, someone must have known Vinson had shared a plane with him. In 1964, Vinson was called in for what he was told was a special project. He soon discovered it was with the CIA. They put him through a series of psychological tests and then asked him to work for them. He refused as he had still had his ambitions in the Air Force. It seemed in the end he had no choice. His bosses later told him he was going to work with the CIA at Area 51 on the Blackbird SR-71 spy plane. The conspiracy theorists believed that the CIA wanted Vincent close, working on top secret projects and unable to talk about his job. Vincent later said that he wasn't dumb. He knew that this work meant he was being asked to keep quiet about his plane ride. He later said he knew the CIA would never let him out of their sights. The CIA, he thought, could have killed him, but instead they hired him. But in 1992, when Congress passed the JFK Records Act and Vincent was already retired, he contacted Dan Glickman, a Democratic representative for Wichita, Kansas. Vincent now knew under the new act he was able to talk. Vincent's story made the news, and later it became a book. Investigations showed that the C-54 could have landed about five minutes from where White had seen Oswald in the Red Falcon. So this is how the second Oswald got away, according to the theory. After JFK was killed, the first man to inspect the body was resident surgeon Dr. Charles Crenshaw, who was then working at the Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. Jackie Kennedy was beside herself, he later said. She just recently tried to put her husband's brains back into his head. Crenshaw and the other doctors noted a small opening in the middle of JFK's throat, about the size of a tip of a finger. They'd all seen this many times in the ER. It was a bullet wound, an entry wound. There was absolutely no doubt about this, they said. They put a tube in Kennedy's throat as he wasn't breathing well, a process known as a tracheotomy. Crenshaw then looked at the empty cavity in the president's head, later saying that there was no doubt in my mind that the bullet had entered his head through the front. Still, on that day, the Secret Service took the body. This was not in line with the U.S. protocol. 
Coroner Earl Rose tried to stop them, telling them the chain of evidence meant JFK could not leave the hospital. The agents pushed him aside. They really wanted that body. As you know, the following autopsy at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland revealed something very different than what the doctors had seen. The conspiracy theorists say that the CIA's Alan Dulles made sure the doctors soon changed their minds and agreed it was possible that an entry wound could suddenly become an exit wound. There was one lone gunman, said Dulles, and you better make well sure you tell the story that fits that. Dr. Malcolm Perry changed his statement, telling a friend that men in suits had visited him. Secret Service agent Elmer Moore later admitted that he'd been told to pressure Perry. Moore said, I did everything I was told. We all did as we were told. Crenshaw said in 1992, we believed the medical truth would be asking for trouble. I was as afraid of the men in suits as I was the men who assassinated Kennedy, adding that anyone who would kill a president wouldn't think twice about killing a doctor. He wrote a book titled JFK, Conspiracy of Silence. He was subsequently smeared. It was reported how much money he'd made from the book. The Journal of the American Medical Association said in a paper that he might not have been in the trauma room that day. Doctors and nurses at least came forward and said he had and that what he said was the truth. It didn't matter. Once he was smeared, there was always a shadow of doubt hanging over him, say the conspiracy theorists. Even the doctors that did the official autopsy were under pressure. They were told not to examine the throat. Navy medical corpsman Paul O'Connor was there. He said they were told to leave the throat because the wound was just a tracheotomy wound, not a gunshot wound. It got very tense, he said in an interview, later adding, we were all military, we could all be controlled. Lieutenant William Bruce Pitzer, who was head of the Navy's audiovisual department, got something worse than a good old smearing, according to this theory. He worked on a 16mm film of the Bethesda autopsy. He saw everything. First class corpsman Dennis David saw Pitzer working on the film. They both knew what they saw, that JFK had without a doubt been hit from the front. David later said in an interview, I can assure you, it was definitely an entry wound. He said it was inconceivable that it could be anything else. David assumed that Pitzer had taken the film. He realized later what he had seen would contradict the evidence that a lone gunman shot JFK. Pitzer had in his hands the most important footage in America. On October 29, 1966, Pitzer's body was found on the floor of the National Naval Medical Center where he worked. The FBI said he was found in a pool of blood with a bullet wound to the head. The 38 caliber pistol was lying nearby. His family said straight away that what the FBI said happened could not have happened. Pitzer was neither depressed or suicidal. We know from his wife and friends that he was thinking about retiring from the military and taking a new job. David said, They were afraid that he would take the pictures that he and I had seen, the 35mm slides and 16mm film, that he would have taken them with him. Pitzer was thinking about moving to a major studio, so David said they'd be afraid Pitzer would have given them this evidence to work with. Both the slides and the film have never been seen again. This allegedly incontrovertible evidence disappeared when Pitzer died. Naval Intelligence went to see his wife, Joyce, after she died and told her not to talk to anyone. She kept quiet for 25 years. Even at 80, she said she was afraid if she spoke, they'd stop her pension. She'd actually been told something incredible, something darker than the dark side of the moon. A retired Army Special Forces lieutenant named Daniel Marvin had visited her. She said he told her in 1965 the CIA had approached him with an assignment. The job was to assassinate her husband. She always knew someone had killed him, but Marvin said he hadn't been the man to do it. He'd refused to take out anyone on American soil, but he was still telling her someone in the CIA had her husband killed. Marvin had been a Green Beret and later trained as an assassin at a secret training camp in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. It was called the Special Warfare School. During that training, he and others were told that a perfect assassination of a government leader would consist of using snipers and setting up a crazed loon who could easily fit the description the public would believe. In fact, in 1966, the CIA asked Marvin to assassinate Cambodian Crown Prince Noradum Chianuk and make it look like the work of Viet Cong. The operation was later aborted, but Marvin said his entire military career consisted of such black operations. He told Mrs. Pitzer that Colonel Clarence W. Pattern summoned him to the office one day and told him that he was to meet a company man. This company man asked him if he'd be willing to execute a man who was a national security risk. Marvin assumed this would be in Southeast Asia, where he worked before, so when he was told the target was William Pitzer and he was in the US, he refused to do it. He said he would only do it if Pitzer were abroad. Marvin later said in an interview, it was common knowledge in mafia and CIA circles that Green Berets were tapped by the company to terminate selected targets in foreign countries 
whereas the Mafia provided the CIA's pool of assassins for hits in the US. Marvin was also in contact with Captain David Vanek. He said in interviews later that Vanek, who he trained with regarding assassinations, might have killed Pitzer. In 1993, Marvin went looking for Vanek, hoping that he would admit what they'd done in the 60s. He said when he contacted the Veterans Service Directorate, he was told Vanek did not exist. There was no record of him. That's when Marvin thought, hmm, they took him out too. But AARB found Vanek in 1996. By then, he was a colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve Medical Corps. Vanek admitted to training at the Special Warfare School, but said he didn't know Marvin. He also said he couldn't recall a meeting with the company man and didn't know William Pitzer. An investigation showed that Vanek had worked for the CIA cover organization in Thailand from 1965 to 1967. As for Jack Ruby, while in prison a doctor diagnosed him as psychotic. He'd lost the plot, apparently, even though according to documents discussed in Tom O'Neill's book Chaos, Charles Manson, The CIA, and The Secret History of the 60s, Ruby was perfectly healthy and in a fine mental shape when he was visited just days before that diagnosis, and each time before that. How come he suddenly started suffering from psychosis? The New York Times wrote on March 10, 1964, Mind Expert says Ruby was insane. Anything he said now would be the words of a madman, which the conspiracy theorist said came in handy for some people. The man who diagnosed Ruby was Louis Jolien West, a doctor who became notorious in time for dosing people with large amounts of lysergic acid dithylamide in his top secret work with the MK Ultra interrogation, hypnosis, and mind control program. One of the most outspoken people about JFK conspiracies, and apparently how ridiculous they were, was the prosecutor and author, Vincent Bugliosi. This same man threatened to sue Tom O'Neill when during the 25 years O'Neill researched his book on Manson, he discovered Bugliosi's famous book, Helter Skelter, was full of provable lies and completely missed the CIA's many connections to the Manson murders. It's just another coincidence that Bugliosi became a kind of spokesperson for the CIA and the US government in detailing how the conspiracy theories were not true. According to James Beard, who often played poker with Ruby back in the day, Ruby stored and shipped guns to rebels in Cuba for the CIA. The journalist Dorothy Kilgallen was working on a story about Ruby's CIA connections when she died mysteriously. She just had an interview with Ruby when she was found dead in her Manhattan townhouse, apparently from alcohol and sleeping pills. Next to her body was a glass with dust on it, as if someone had crushed some pills. In the CIA's assassination manual from 1952, in the Techniques section, Part 3 describes how a forced overdose is effective and not easy to detect. Kilgallen had worked for 18 months on the JFK story, conducting numerous interviews. She said the Warren Commission report was laughable. She said she would shake up America with her story, and then she died. And according to the book, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, her death had CIA written all over it. Jim Garrison always said Ruby was working for the CIA, not as an agent, but as a mafia asset, as many mafia gangsters back then worked for the CIA in return for favors. Ruby knew if he killed Oswald, he would be next, say the conspiracy theorists. That's the way it went. At 3 a.m. the Sunday before he did it, he called police officer Billy Grammer. Grammer later confirmed the speaker was Ruby. Ruby told Grammer, if you move Oswald the way you're planning, we're going to kill him. Grammer later said that Ruby was trying to foil his own assassination job so he wouldn't end up having to do it, and so die himself. The Dallas County Sheriff's Office received calls at 2.15 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. from a man saying Oswald was about to be killed. Even so, Ruby defied reason when he was able to get into the police station and walk right up to Oswald. This should not have been possible, especially after those two phone calls. You've heard a lot today, and there's more to this story, but what you've heard is the general outline of conspiracy theory that has convinced many people to question the official narrative. The question is, are you now one of those people? She's been shot at by a crazed high school psycho whose only mission in life was to murder her. Another teenager wanted her dead for the only reason that he wanted to be famous. But perhaps the most astounding assassination attempt was when a mystery figure tried to derail her train, a plot that was subsequently covered up by the government. The way old Lizzie has survived three assassination attempts will blow your mind. We're going to start with the most recent assassination attempt on Queen Elizabeth. The year was 1981, and she was in New Zealand, fulfilling her duties as a traveling monarch. The perpetrator of the 
crime? A 17-year-old kid named Christopher John Lewis. You might wonder why a teen would want to blast the queen to kingdom come, but you only need to look at his background to understand that his proverbial screw was loose. According to news reports, this boy lived in a house with a tyrannical father. Life was so chaotic for the kid that he couldn't even read or write until he was 8 years old. After assaulting another kid, he was expelled from school. He cut the heads off birds. His favorite man in the world was none other than Charles Manson. He got into petty crime while he was still young, culminating with his gang taking just over $5,000 from a post office after holding two workers at gunpoint. That was a lot of cash in the 70s, especially for a teenager. But for Lewis, the thrill from the violence was more important than the money. But he didn't stop there. He and his mates put together what they called a guerrilla army. They gave the outfit the name the National Imperial Guerrilla Army, spelling guerrilla wrong. With Lewis at the helm, they terrorized the neighborhood. Those that were close to him knew him as a bona fide psycho. As an adult, he wouldn't disagree. We know that from his memoirs, aptly titled Last Words. It was during these tumultuous years that he concocted a plan to do something to the queen that would put his name in the history books. He later said that living with his father was a living hell, which rendered him feeling in a constant state of terror. It's hard to say why he wanted to go as far as killing the queen, but he blamed what he called the twisted wreckage of his life and the fact that he very dearly wanted to become an outlaw. He was close to it already, feared in his town for many reasons, such as when he held up an elderly woman in her car and demanded a ride. And so on October 14, 1981, this troubled boy decided that he would take out his problems on the British monarch. At the time, she was visiting a museum in Dunedin, the town where Lewis lived. That day, he hid his 22 caliber rifle, stolen earlier from a gun shop, in a pair of old jeans and walked into a seven-story building from where he'd set up his shot. His getaway vehicle, a 10-speed bicycle, he left outside the building. Inside, he sneaked into a toilet cubicle and unwrapped his gun. He was seething with anger when he put on his gloves and readied the rifle. The queen he knew would soon pass by in the street in her Rolls Royce. As the motorcade got closer, his hands trembled as he heard the cheers of the many people in the street. He stood up by the window and waited, his gun pointing toward the road. Suddenly, a loud crack was heard by many people in the crowd. The queen had just stepped out of her car. She wasn't hurt. The shot wasn't very close. If Lewis actually meant to kill her is not certain. He later said he didn't actually want her dead, stating, I felt that giving her a scare somehow, that the issues and problems that were evident in New Zealand might finally be brought into the public attention, and as a bonus, if the Queen would look at these issues, she might well take notice. That's not what the New Zealand Security Intelligence Service said after he'd been picked up by cops eight days later. They believed that this kid had tried and failed. All this was actually a hush-hush and led to a cover-up because it wasn't a good look for New Zealand. But this cover-up doesn't even come close to what you'll see later. When he was charged, all the public heard was that his crime was illegally possessing a firearm and illegally discharging one, not that he had tried to kill the queen. As we said, people in the crowd that day had heard gunshots, but cops later assured them and some curious journalists that it was nothing but an unrelated racket. When Lewis heard the charges in court, his words were, only two charges? What? Had the bullet hit her, would it be treason? But the whole story remained classified until February 2018, when a media company found out the truth. By this time, Lewis was long since dead. His death is a grim story if there ever was one. After the incident, he was sent to a psychiatric hospital. There, he once pulled a knife on a guard, and in his spare time, he concocted another plan to take out Prince Charles. After his release, he wrote these memoirs, and while he did try to stay away from crime, intelligence services never let him out of their sights. They thought he was still dangerous, knowing that if he had a more powerful gun that day, he could well have killed the Queen. That's why in 1995, when the Queen was visiting New Zealand again, they exiled him to Great Barrier Island for an expenses-paid 14-day vacation. As a friend of his once said, he always wanted to know what it would be like to take someone's life. The next year, Lewis was accused of doing just that after a mother of three named Tanya Furlan was found dead in her house, her head smashed by a hammer. Lewis was accused of the murder and of kidnapping her child in an effort to secure a ransom, but the evidence against him was weak to say the least. Cops had listened to an informant, a friend of Lewis's, and he told them that Lewis had killed the woman. From his jail cell, Lewis wrote, I stand firm in my convictions that the present nightmare will soon be over. I know in my heart that I didn't commit these crimes, so this is all the hope I need for myself. It's very likely he wasn't guilty, and the culprit was probably that informant, a man who later committed a similar murder. But Lewis didn't get to clear his name. He was electrocuted in his prison cell before his case went to trial. What's amazing about that story is the fact that Lewis really could have killed the Queen. There's no doubt about it. It's also fascinating that no one but the royals and some chosen authorities knew about it. With this next young chap, his assassination attempt was never going to hurt the Queen much, but it was spectacular in itself. It happened again in the same year on June 13, 1981. This time the Queen was on home turf, and again, her would-be assassin was just 17 years old. His name was Marcus Sargent. On the day he managed to get off six bullets as the Queen was riding a horse through 
through central London for what's called the Trooping the Color Ceremony. That day, the crowds filled the street as the soon-to-be-married Diana Spencer rode in a carriage with Prince Andrew. Her lover and future husband, Prince Charles, like the Queen, rode on horseback. Sargent didn't have anything near the psychological problems that our first assassin had. He was a Boy Scout who'd done pretty well in school, and as a youth, he'd won awards for marksmanship at the Air Training Corps, a kind of cadet school for young folks. But then, at the age of 16, things started to go wrong for him. He joined the British Royal Marines but left after a few months for what he later said was bullying. He then joined the Army and only managed to get through two days of induction. To add to this list of failures, he was also turned down by the police and the fire brigade. Angry and disappointed in himself, he ended up working at a zoo. At age 17, he was out of work again, and he'd taken upon himself to become a member of an anti-royalist group. Things could have really gone badly for the Queen if this young lad hadn't failed in finding ammunition for his pop's 455 Webley revolver. He tried in vain to get his hands on another gun, but as you know, it's not easy in England. Even though Sargent joined a gun club to get himself a license, it seems he gave up on trying to buy a real gun and instead paid about 80 bucks for two blank firing replica Colt Python revolvers that were sent to him via mail. If he couldn't kill her, he was damn well gonna scare her. Not long before he did the deed, he actually sent a letter to Buckingham Palace stating, Your Majesty, don't go on the trooping color ceremony because there is an assassin set up to kill you waiting just outside the palace. The letter arrived three days after the ceremony. As she rode on her horse, Sargent seemed to appear from nowhere and fired off six shots. Needless to say, this shocked and scared onlookers. No bullets came out of the gun, of course, but the noise frightened the queen's horse, named Burmese, and it reared up a little. Like a champ, she steadied the beast. Guardsmen and cops were on Sargent like a flash, and the queen, according to one of her bodyguards, rode on as cool as a cucumber. He told the press she looked shaken by the episode, but soon recovered her composure. Sargent was charged with the 1848 Treason Act and sentenced to five years in prison. It turned out that this failure of a kid had been obsessed with the assassinations of John Lennon and John F. Kennedy. When investigators unearthed his diary, one of the entries read, I'm going to stun and mystify the whole world with nothing more than a gun. I will become the most famous teenager in the world. He didn't deny it later, telling the cops to their face, I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be a somebody. Psychiatrists didn't think he had any kind of severe mental health issues, saying he was merely a messed up, insecure kid who'd studied the Lennon assassination and couldn't believe how easy it had been. He thought, why not? I would like to be the first one to take a pot shot at the Queen. He was released from prison at the age of 20, and due to him being disliked by a lot of royal-loving Brits, he gave himself a new identity. All the time he'd been locked up, he apparently sent letters to the Queen apologizing for what he'd done. She didn't reply once. We can't tell you what happened in the end to this boy that was called by the media a traitor and a fantasy assassin, but we reckon he sure would have been looked on with interest had the truth about the Queen's later visit to New Zealand had been told. And that brings us to another cover-up, easily the strangest tale of the three assassination attempts. Like the New Zealand attempt on her life, the story only became public knowledge many years after the event. In 1970, she was on a royal tour of Australia. On the 29th of April, she was riding a train with her husband, Prince Philip, heading from Sydney to the city of Orange, a distance of about 161 miles. The incident happened close to the town of Lithgow, population of 13,000. We now know that prior to her boarding that train, someone had laid down a large log on the tracks. At around 7 feet long and about 8 inches in diameter, it was big enough to derail the train. Someone had obviously left it there in the dark and they'd wedged it in enough so that it would do some serious damage. In fact, the train did hit that log and was momentarily shaken. But it just happened that at the moment, the train had been going much slower than usual. Had it been traveling at the usual speed, there is every chance it could have derailed and the Queen been seriously injured or killed. A report written many years later said the train continued on brakes for about 200 meters with the log still wedged under the front wheels before finally coming to a halt at the level crossing near Bowenfell Station. As things turned out, the Queen didn't know a thing about it. The Australian cops didn't report the matter, and a local newspaper that knew what had happened made a so-called gentleman's agreement with the cops not to publish the story and so embarrass them and the country. The newspaper, the Lithgow Mercury, kept hold of the story for close to 40 years. One of the investigators later admitted he pulled the editor to the side and told him not to publish the story. He said, I took him for a drive and I told him the story and I said, I want your assurance that you don't print it. And he didn't print it. In 2009, it was finally published. For many years, Australian cops investigated the plot, but nothing came of it. One of the reasons for that was because they couldn't actually talk to many people about what had happened. The lead investigator recalled, We never came up with any decent suspects because if we interviewed people, we seemed to be talking in riddles. Who is behind the plot remains a mystery, with IRA sympathizers being high on the list of suspects. Still, it could have been another kid trying to make a name for himself or just a regular run-of-the-mill loon. It seems Buckingham Palace had also been kept in the dark all those years, although it's possible the British authorities also kept the story under wraps. In 2009, the palace issued a statement saying it didn't want to comment on the matter, but in the royal diary there was no mention of anything strange happening on the train that day.
Here at the Infographics Show, we try to brainstorm all kinds of topics we think you'll find interesting, but it's even better when we get a great suggestion from our viewers. Viewer Robert suggested we cover the many attempts to assassinate Adolf Hitler. It's quite a story, so Robert, here's the video. July 20, 1944 was a sweltering day at Germany's Eastern Front headquarters, near the town then known as Rostenburg, East Prussia. Weather is always a factor in war, but even though there was no battle at Rostenburg that day, the unpleasant heat would alter the course of history. Someone made the call that it was too hot to hold the high-level meeting in the concrete bunker within the so-called Wolf's Lair or Wolfschanze. Instead, they would meet in a wooden room with windows. You'd think that the Nazi leadership would be more vulnerable in the less fortified setting, but the change of venue may have saved Adolf Hitler's life, at least for a little while. Today was to be the culmination of an assassination plot by the German resistance, including several high-ranking military officers and civilians, that had been years in the making. Hitler had no idea there was a briefcase containing a bomb underneath the oak table just two seats down from him. Neither did anyone else in the room save the man who placed it there, Lt. Col. Klaus Scheck von Stauffenberg, who excused himself on the pretext of making a phone call. At 12.42 p.m., the bomb went off and Stauffenberg hurried away to set the rest of the plan in motion. The July plot was only the latest of more than 30 assassination attempts against Hitler, both before and after he'd seized power. The Nazi dictator had literally been dodging bullets left and right. In 1921, an unknown person in a crowd took a shot at Hitler as he was speaking. Two more shooting attempts followed in 1923, the first also in a crowd, the second a shot at the car Hitler was in. There were four attempts in 1932. The first in January was an attempted poisoning. Others dining with Hitler at Berlin's Hotel Kaiserhof contracted severe food poisoning. Hitler took ill as well, but wasn't as sick as the others, possibly because of his vegetarian diet. A few months later, someone fired a shot at the train carriage where Hitler was sitting. In June, a group planned to ambush Hitler's car, but without success. At a speech on July 29th, several people lobbed stones at him, one of which did hit him in the head, but not hard enough to take him out. In 1933, Karl Luttner, a communist and labor leader, plotted with others to kill Hitler by planting a bomb. The day before the election of March 5th, which brought Hitler to power, he was to deliver a public speech and Luttner intended to use the opportunity to assassinate the Nazi leader before it was too late. But the authorities in what was still the Democratic Weimar Republic found out about the plan and arrested Luttner and his collaborators. Later that year, a separate group never identified dug a tunnel underneath a church in Potsdam where Hitler was scheduled to speak, accompanied by other Nazi leaders. Presumably, the tunnel would have been used to plant explosives had security forces not discovered it. As Hitler tightened his stranglehold over the German government, members of the right wing outside the Nazi circle also began to plot against him. Helmuth Mitlus, head of the radical middle class party, joined forces with the retired Navy captain Hermann Erhardt to recruit 150 collaborators to infiltrate the SS. The plan was uncovered by the Gestapo, and most of the conspirators faced severe punishment. A few avoided discovery and remained in the army to continue the internal resistance. The Night of the Long Knives was a deadly purge of the SA, the Nazis' original core group, which was being sidelined in favor of the elite subgroup the SS. Otto Strausser, a disaffected former Nazi whose brother was killed in the Night of the Long Knives, led other German exiles in Prague in the anti-Nazi Black Front. They carried out an unknown number of assassination attempts in the late 1930s. Josef Goebbels named Strasser Germany's public enemy number one. In 1938, the military intelligence chief Major General Hans Oster, along with several other military leaders, conspired to arrest Hitler if he reneged on his commitment not to invade western Czechoslovakia, which the Nazis called the Sudetenland. They were counting on British support for this action, which they intended as a prelude to the reinstatement of Kaiser Wilhelm II. But when British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain acceded to Hitler's annexation of the Sudetenland, the conspirators lost their opportunity, and instead of coming across as an illegal warmonger, Hitler gained popular support in the German public. Members of the Osterplot would also continue as part of a secret resistance. Also in 1938, Maurice Bavoud, a Swiss national who held the bizarre belief that killing the Fuhrer would also somehow bring down the Soviet government and restore Russia's Romanov dynasty, launched a one-man operation. He planned to gun down the dictator at a party in Munich, celebrating the anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch, the Nazis' failed attempt to seize power in 1923. But he couldn't get a clear shot, and since he didn't want anyone else to die, he didn't fire. 
Bavout then traveled to Berchtesgaden, where he hoped that forged documents might get him closer to his target. He learned that Hitler was still in Munich, so Bavout tried to make his way back by train. He was arrested and confessed under interrogation by the Gestapo. Like several other would-be assassins, Bavoud was executed by guillotine. The following year, the carpenter George Elser skillfully hit a bomb inside a wooden pillar ahead of time for the Beer Hall Putsch anniversary and set it to go off at the customary time of the observance. But Hitler rushed for time, started and ended early, and was gone by the time the bomb exploded. Elser was caught, but the Gestapo kept him alive until almost the end of the war, believing that he must have been part of a conspiracy. If so, he didn't talk. Over time, the number of upper-level military leaders in the Wehrmacht with grievances against the Führer grew. Henning von Treschkow, part of the leadership in the German campaign against Russia, became the ringleader for Project Valkyrie, an elaborate plan to replace all of the Nazi leadership loyal to Hitler upon completion of an assassination. Following the fall of Stalingrad, Hitler paid a visit to the site in western Russia. Coup plotters considered simply shooting him while he was there, but that action was called off, in part because Himmler wasn't present. But there was a second strike in motion that went ahead. Treschkow asked Lt. Col. Heinz Brandt, who would be flying with Hitler back to the headquarters in East Prussia, if he'd deliver a bottle of liqueur to a colleague. Brandt put the bottle in his luggage, unaware that it was a disguised bomb which was time to explode when the plane was over Minsk. But the bomb malfunctioned and the cold cargo hold. Learning that the plane had landed intact, Treschkow dispatched an aide to retrieve the bomb before it could be found out. In another attempt, Hitler along with Himmler and Hermann Göring, commander of the Luftwaffe, were reviewing new winter uniforms. The handsome officer, Axel von den Busche, who was to serve as model, volunteered for the suicide mission to wear a bomb under the overcoat, but the planned meeting was delayed. The conspirators continued seeking a chance to kill all three leaders at a stroke. In the end, Stauffenberg was the only conspirator who could get close enough to the increasingly wary Führer who by now had decided it was a good idea to wear a bulletproof vest. A veteran of both the African and Russian campaigns, Stauffenberg had lost a hand and an eye in battle. He was to carry out the assassination, but many others now were involved in another key aspect of the plan, which required a military coup by the German Reserve Army. The co-plotters in Berlin would use the assassination as a false flag operation, accusing the Nazi leadership of taking out Hitler themselves, providing a pretext for the overthrow, after which they would sue for peace and restore civilian government and the rule of law. But first, they had to kill the man who had led Germany down the ruinous path of war. Friedrich Fromm, the Reserve Army's commander-in-chief, had agreed to turn a blind eye to the actions of the conspirators, but he appointed Stauffenberg as his chief of staff, enabling close access to Hitler during meetings. Without understanding the new subordinate's intentions, Stauffenberg was to carry a British-built briefcase bomb to the meeting at the Wolf's Lair. It was equipped with two explosive devices. After arriving at the fortress, Stauffenberg ducked away, saying he needed to change his shirt but interruptions prevented him from arming both devices. He went ahead with the single bomb, though. The physics of a wooden porous room would make for a less deadly blast than the one that was sealed in concrete, so Stauffenberg made sure to sit as close to Hitler as he could, just one seat over. But this wasn't to be a suicide mission. After placing the briefcase under the table as close as he could manage, Stauffenberg slipped out, but once the spot at the table was empty, a colonel came to fill it, wanting a closer look at the maps being reviewed. Unknowingly, he kicked the briefcase behind a table leg. When the bomb went off, that made the difference. One person was killed instantly, three others later died of their injuries. Hitler was wounded. He suffered temporary paralysis and a dislocated arm. His buttocks were bruised and he had a broken eardrum. His pants were torn to shreds and his hair was a mess. But he lived, and that message was relayed to Berlin, preventing the coup. Hitler, who was now boasted of being immortal, gave the order that the conspirators should die like animals. They were hanged with meat hooks and piano wire. One account describes a prolonged torture, with the condemned repeatedly taken to the edge of death and then revived. The following year, the nightmare of the Nazi rule would end with the Soviet capture of Berlin, and Hitler would become his own last victim, shooting himself in the head rather than face justice for his crimes. In the early post-war years, German public opinion remained hostile to the conspirators in Operation Valkyrie, with most people considering them traitors. Meanwhile, following the Nuremberg trials, many rank-and-file Nazis received amnesty from the West German government. It took time, but Germans did come to confront their complicity in Nazi atrocities, and the view of the German resistance began to change. In the early 21st century, only a small minority 
minority of Germans polled held negative views of the resistance, who are now officially memorialized. Perhaps the greatest symbol of respect for the resistance fighters comes in a ceremony every year, when new recruits to the German military are sworn in on July 20th. Hitler, a man so evil he ruined an entire mustache style. If anyone deserved to die, this man was it. Here's the craziest ways history's most notorious villain was almost rubbed out. Bad Schnitzel Way back when Hitler was first embarking into politics, some brave citizen heard Hitler speak and smelled trouble for Germany. This prompted the unknown individual or group of individuals to try and eliminate Hitler before it was too late. As Hitler and his staff had dinner at the Hotel Kaiserhof in Berlin, they shortly after became seriously ill. Poisoning was immediately suspected, but alas, whoever carried out the assassination attempt failed to realize that Hitler was a vegetarian and thus was spared. Next time a vegan tries to tell you meat is murder, remind them that vegetables basically killed over 40 million people in World War II. The pen is mightier than the sword, especially if it's poisoned. It takes a special kind of man for people to want to kill you twice in the same year. In February of 1932, Ludwig Asner, a member of the Bavarian State Parliament, didn't exactly like the cut of Hitler's jib. He penned a poisoned letter to Hitler, but an acquaintance of Asner spilled the tea and the letter was intercepted. Mercenary Death in 1934, Hitler had been named Chancellor of Germany, but not everyone was triumphantly throwing up their arms in Nazi salutes. In fact, many political and military leaders were extremely wary of Hitler and his Nazi government. To solve this little problem, Hitler kicked off what would become known as the Night of the Long Knives, a series of political killings that effectively eliminated or silenced any opposition to Hitler. Beppo Romer, a member of a German mercenary unit, vowed revenge. He and a group of men made plans to kill Hitler, but sadly the Gestapo would catch on to the plot before any real progress had been made. Sometimes crazy can take care of crazy, or at least try to. Murder from within When Romer failed to kill Hitler, Helmut Milius, a member of the right-wing radical small class party, took matters into his own hand. Under his direction, 160 men infiltrated the SS in order to conduct secret surveillance on Hitler. Milius quickly learned Hitler's schedule and daily routines, allowing him to plot the perfect time to kill him. Yet again, the Gestapo, who we have to admit was super on the ball, discovered the plot and put a stop to it. Milius managed to avoid any serious punishment due to the influence of German Field Marshal Erich von Manstein, who would go on to be one of Germany's best generals in the Second World War. Allegiance to country, not a man. A year later, a group of government officials from the German Foreign Office knew that they had to act to prevent a disaster. They weren't buying Hitler's Make Germany Great Again and insisted that Hitler was leading the company to disaster, not a resurgence of her glorious imperial days. They knew they had to do something to save the nation they loved, even if it meant killing the man who now ruled it. The group attempted to drum up support with a letter where they penned, The oath of allegiance to Hitler has lost its meaning since he's ready to sacrifice Germany. Sadly, the plot never took off and the world hurtled ever forward into global war. Explosive Briefcases By 1936, Hitler had whipped up hatred for Jews across much of Germany, and German Jew Helmut Hirsch knew he had to act. He filled two suitcases with explosives with a plan to plant them inside the Nazi Party headquarters in Nuremberg. Unfortunately, a Gestapo informant learned of the plot and Hirsch was discovered. Pronounced guilty, Hirsch was executed via beheading, a far better fate than many of his fellow Jews would suffer in the years to come. Back to the crazy though, our next assassin thought he could kill two birds with one stone. Crazy Killer You know you're a terrible person when even insane people want you dead. That's exactly what happened in November of 1937, when mental patient Joseph Thomas traveled all the way to Berlin to shoot Hitler. However, Thomas also had a beef with the Nazi head of the Air Force, Hermann Göring, and plotted to assassinate both on the same day. Discovered by police, Thomas spilled the beans on himself, putting an end to the plot. Interestingly enough, it may have been a good thing that Göring was in fact not killed by Thomas. In the build-up to the war, under Göring's direction, the Luftwaffe did not add any significant number of long-range heavy bombers to its fleet, a move that would haunt Germany during the Battle of England, as it was forced to attack with light and medium bombers only. Further, Göring's inflated ego assured Hitler that his Luftwaffe would be able to keep German troops under siege in Russia supplied, and thus Hitler did not dispatch ground forces to relieve them. This strategic blunder would spell disaster for over 100,000 German soldiers and for the war effort against the Soviet Union. That one time the Allies saved Hitler's life. 
Yeah, you heard that right. The same allies that Hitler would go on to nearly crush saved Hitler's life just before the war began. In September of 1938, conservatives in the German army feared what a renewed war against the Western allies might do to the nation. They could smell disaster on the horizon, despite all the Nazi propaganda to the contrary. They vowed to enact a coup the moment Hitler declared war on Czechoslovakia, eliminating Hitler and placing the exiled Wilhelm II back on the throne as emperor. Much to their astonishment, Britain and France agreed to the annexation of the Sudetenland in a bid to appease Hitler, and thus the risk of war was temporarily removed. The group nixed their plans to replace Hitler, for the time being. That wouldn't be the last time the Allies saved Hitler's life. But next is an assassin who wanted to kill Hitler for pretty wild reasons. Killing Hitler in order to make Russia great again? Maurice Bavaud was a Swiss theology student and a member of an anti-communist group in France. The group's leader, Marcel Gerbohe, convinced Bavaud and others that he was in fact a member of the Romanov dynasty who had escaped execution at the hands of the dirty Bolsheviks. In fact, Gerbohe was full of Bolshevik himself. But that didn't stop him from convincing Bavaud that if he murdered Hitler it would somehow help hint communism in Russia and the Romanovs could retake the country for themselves. As if that would be much better. Bavaud traveled to Germany in 1938 and bought a pistol, then remarked to a policeman how he'd like to meet Hitler personally. The police officer suggested he travel to Munich for the anniversary of the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch, which Hitler attended every year. Bavoud bought himself a ticket to the event on the reviewing stand and posed as a reporter, prepared to bust a cap the moment Hitler strolled by. Unfortunately, Bavoud aborted the attempt as Hitler was in company of other Nazis that Bavoud didn't want to accidentally injure, which makes about as much sense to us as it does to you. Bavoud now used the last remaining bit of his money to purchase expensive stationery and forged a letter of introduction under the name of French nationalist leader and friend to the Nazi, Pierre Titongy. He took the letter with the hopes of using it to gain an audience with Hitler to Berchtesgaden, but Hitler had decided to remain in Munich. Broke and destitute, Bavoud was forced to stow away on a train to Paris, but was discovered by the conductor. Interrogated by the Gestapo, who again were seriously on the ball, Bavoud admitted to the assassination plot and was executed. Hitler's abundant and incredible luck. Back in World War I, Hitler narrowly avoided being exploded after the exact spot he'd been standing in just moments prior became ground zero for a British artillery round. The explosive luck, get it, would last well into Hitler's life and pay off yet again in October 1939. On a victory parade of Warsaw after Hitler's conquest of Poland, Polish Army General Michael Karasowicz Tokarewski hatched a plan to blow Hitler sky high with explosives buried under his parade route. In a stroke of insane luck, Hitler's parade was diverted at the last minute and completely avoided the planted explosives. And because life is 100% not fair, history's biggest a-hole also happened to be history's luckiest man. Even more explosive luck. Just a month after being nearly blown up, Hitler was once again nearly blown up. For weeks, German carpenter George Elser planned the construction of a timed bomb inside one of Germany's largest beer halls, where he knew Der Fuhrer would soon be making his annual speech in commemoration of the Beer Hall Putsch. The bomb was planted just a few feet away from where Hitler would eventually stand, its timer muffled by a cork. The bomb was timed to go off right in the middle of Hitler's speech, but with World War II on his mind, Hitler cut his speech off early and rushed back to Berlin to convene with his military leaders. Instead of Hitler, the bomb killed eight others and injured over 60, with the ceiling collapsing right where Hitler had been standing. The subsequent crackdown by the Gestapo made the components needed to create explosives so difficult that multiple other assassination attempts in the works had to be cancelled after the organizers were unable to get their hands on the needed explosives. If you fail, try, try again. In 1939, Beppo Romer was released from prison for his 1934 attempt to murder Hitler. Apparently either the authorities had not been too impressed with Romer or were convinced that he was a reformed man. They would be extremely wrong. Romer joined a resistance group of German intellectuals named the Soul Circle who were dedicated to opposing the Nazi party at every possible opportunity. The group tracked Hitler's movements carefully, but Hitler's security had been dramatically increased due to all the pesky attempts on his life. Failing to find an opportunity to strike, the Self Circle was eventually discovered and its members arrested in a Gestapo sting. The Self Circle members were betrayed from within by a Gestapo spy, pretending to be a Swiss sympathizer, and most would meet their end via torture and execution. There was the one time Hitler was almost blown up by his own tanks. Even his own army wanted him dead. Many German generals were starting to warm up to the fact that Hitler was leading their nation to disaster by 1943. 
A group of them plotted to arrest Hitler upon his visit to a military detachment in Ukraine. One general's tanks would surround Hitler and his escorts completely, and if Hitler refused to surrender, they would simply kill everyone. Hitler's visit was cancelled at the last minute, and once more Das Führer escaped certain death. Multiple attempts all in the same day. March 13, 1943 would be the day Hitler would evade certain death three times, and he never even had a clue. First, a group of officers vowed to kill Hitler as he drove from the airport to a local army headquarters. Hitler, however, was accompanied by a heavy SS escort, and the plan was cancelled. Briefly delayed to lunch, a new plan was put into effect. During their lunch together, at a specified signal, several officers would rise and fire their pistols at Hitler. Hitler, however, was a no-show, and the plan was cancelled. In a last-ditch effort to kill the luckiest SOB in history, a bomb was camouflaged as liquor bottles and planted on Hitler's airplane. The timer was set to blow as the plane was in flight and over Poland. However, the plane's hold iced over from the extreme temperatures and the fuse of the bomb failed. Our next killer's weapon of choice would be hugging and explosives. The Death Hug Hitler's luck was so unbelievable that we wouldn't blame you for fact-checking us on the sheer number of times Hitler avoided death purely by coincidence. Just a week after he was almost gunned down twice and then blown out of the sky, Hitler would evade death yet again. German officer Rudolf Christoph Freiherr von Gerstorf decided Hitler had to go at any cost. Hitler, along with several prominent Nazi and military figures, planned to visit Gerstorf at a Berlin armory where they could inspect captured Soviet weapons. Gerstorf then set about packing his coat pockets with time-delayed explosives, set for 10 minutes. Just as Hitler arrived, Gerstorf set off the timers, with a plan to hug Hitler right before the explosives went off in order to ensure his death. It would be a suicide attack, but a necessary sacrifice for Germany. Incredibly, Hitler breezed through the entire exhibition in less than 10 minutes, which prompted Gerstorf to rush to a bathroom in order to disarm the explosives. The Allies save Hitler's life again. In late 1943, the Allies were pushing back hard against the Luftwaffe's domination of Europe's skies. This opened up opportunities for Allied planes to raid German infrastructure. One such raid would end up saving Hitler's life. The German army was preparing to put out a new winter uniform, and Major Axel von den Busche was chosen to model it for Hitler in a private viewing. Busche was tall, handsome and blonde, and blue-eyed, basically the perfect Nazi in Hitler's view. But Busche actually planned to kill Hitler during the viewing by detonating a mine he would be carrying in his backpack. The planned viewing, however, was cancelled when an Allied air raid destroyed the rail car containing the new uniforms. Hitler immune to explosives By 1944, it was clear that Germany was losing the war. It was largely due to Hitler's ineptitude as a military leader. A group of senior German military officials concocted what would be known as Operation Valkyrie, as they attempted to kill Hitler and make peace with the Western Allies as soon as possible in order to avoid the complete destruction of Germany. The conspirators managed to plant a 2.2-pound bomb in a briefcase inside a meeting room where Hitler and his senior military advisors would discuss the ongoing war. Incredibly, Colonel Heinz Brandt is believed to have nudged the briefcase behind one of the legs of the table, effectively deflecting the bomb blast and sparing Hitler's life. He came, he saw, and he damn well conquered. He was the greatest of them all, and that greatness in the end led to a bloody conspiracy that would shake Rome to its very foundation. This is the story of Julius Caesar. He was born on July 12, 100 BC, to a family who lived in considerable comfort. His father, Gaius Julius Caesar, was a senator and the governor of Asia, and his mother, Aurelia Cotta, also came from a well-off family. Julius had two older sisters named Julia Major and Julia Minor. We don't know much about his early years since these ancient biographers left that part out of their books, but what's certain is that no one could have guessed that this little boy would one day turn into the most famous man in Rome. Nothing in his family history pointed to stunning feats of conquest and devastating political potency. What we do know is that during his childhood, Roman politicians were split in two different factions. They weren't official political parties, though, and were much more in line with strategies and certain ideologies. The sides were the optimates, whose influence was based in the Roman Senate and the upper classes, and the popularis, or populists, whose political strength lined more with the masses and the public assemblies. Their differences would spill enough blood to fill every last bath in Rome. One of the biggest influences on the young Julius was his uncle, Gaius Marius, a brilliant general general who had startling victories in wars against the so-called savages in Europe and as far away as North Africa. Caesar's close relationship with his uncle further cemented when, at the age of just 16, his father died, apparently while putting on a pair of running shoes. This was a hell of a violent time in Rome, something that shaped Caesar forever. He watched on as his 
Uncle Marius fought in the Social War, and he beheld him fighting against his arch-rival, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. In short, Sulla belonged to the Optimates, and Marius to the Popularis, and they went toe-to-toe -to -toe in what's now called Sulla's Civil War. Sulla won and made himself the dictator of Rome, while Uncle Marius was exiled to Africa. He'd return three years later and commit himself to a reign of terror in Rome. To say this was a fiery time would be an understatement, with each side slaughtering their enemies. But what's important in terms of Caesar's influences is how Marius treated his soldiers. He gave them land and citizenship, creating a more professional army that answered only to their commander, not the Republic itself. Prior to these reforms, conscripted soldiers were more of a ragtag bunch, low paid, and after their battles, their regiments disbanded, hoping they'd be able to acquire some loot on the way. If they survived the conquest, they often returned home after years away with nothing to show for it. Their lack of presence back home on the farm meant they were likely even poorer than when they left. This was hardly a standard that would create a loyal and professional army if those conscripts were recalled. Caesar saw how after his uncle's reforms made so-called citizen soldiers into loyal fighting machines, men would give everything for the cause and fully embrace what was asked of them by the respected commanders. This transformed the Roman army. It was these skilled fighters whose lives were now steeped in career combat that gave Rome the outstanding military successes it became renowned for. This is a complicated tale, but the short version is that Marius died and Sulla was the top dog in town again. By this time, the young Caesar was already married to Cornelia, daughter of the influential and sometimes tyrannical consul Lucius Cornelius Cinna. Cinna had been aligned with Marius until he was murdered by his own soldiers over what historians said was not politically motivated but rather over some heated disagreement. So where did this leave Caesar, nephew of Marius and husband of another enemy? We should say it was these two men who had initiated bloody purges against Sulla when he was fighting outside of Rome. They might have now been both dead, but Sulla wasn't about to forget their connection to Caesar. It was a precarious time for the young man. Sulla butchered many of his enemies in Rome, a legal kind of killing called proscription. It was invented by Sulla, who said enemies of the state were fair game for execution. As you'll see, this became popular again under another brutal period many years later. Anyway, you could say that Caesar was lucky to have not ended up on that same heap of dead bodies. Every day, Sulla posted more names of people on the wall who he said should have their land confiscated or be executed, and Caesar's name never joined the list. Sulla put bounties on men's heads, and once those heads had been chopped off, he used them for decoration. Then after filling the Senate with men only loyal to himself, he was pretty much untouchable. It's thought between 1,000 and 9,000 upper-class Romans were murdered in these purges, but Caesar's punishment was not so severe. He was told to divorce his wife. He didn't do that, but he also lost his inheritance and his dowry, both taken under the orders of Sulla. It's surprising that Sulla didn't just have him murdered when he had the chance, given that he ordered Caesar's uncle Marius, his corpse, to be taken from its crypt, torn up, dragged around the city, and thrown into a river. Caesar did, however, have to get out of town for a while. Understanding the gravity of the situation, he did the sensible thing and joined the army. He fought in two campaigns and won himself the civic crown, the second highest military decoration in the Republic. It was during these campaigns that he needed the fleet belonging to King Nicomedes of Bithynia, although it seems he spent quite a long time with the king, which led to rumors that the two had been in a sexual relationship. Was this true? We can't say, but Caesar did become known as not just the bald adulterer, but also in some circles the queen of Bithynia. As some historians have pointed out, when Caesar came, some and conquered, sometimes it was in a sexual sense, as we'll show you further on in the show. Sulla, after adopting many reforms that suited him and his Roman elite friends, stepped down as dictator. But soon after he put his feet up in his retirement, he was struck by a terrible fever and died. Another story has it that he boozed day and night and lived a life of utter decadence, which ended with liver failure and possibly a ruptured gastric ulcer. Same story says he hemorrhaged from the mouth just as he was ordering someone's strangulation, which you have to admit is better tale than a fever. The year was 78 BC and Caesar was just 22 years old. Knowing he was safe, Caesar went back to Rome, where it said he lived in a fairly average neighborhood. It was during this period that he turned to law, often giving moving speeches about Rome's vast corruption. The great Roman statesman Cicero took note, once saying, about Caesar, come now, what orator would you rank above him? Cicero wasn't a bad talker either, and Caesar knew that, so he went over to Rhodes in Greece to study with Cicero's former rhetorician teacher, Apollonius Milan. He never even got there though, because as he was sailing across the Aegean Sea, his ship was boarded by a bunch of Cilician pirates. Cilicia was in present day Anatolia in Turkey. It would turn out that this was some really bad luck for the pirates. Although, how could they know that some smooth-talking 25-year-old would turn into quite the formidable foe? As you know, Caesar had already made a bit of a name for himself, but he was far from being famous in Rome. Still, when the pirates told him about the ransom they were asking for him, he told them that they should double the price. 
even though it was Caesar that would be footing the bill. He was apparently not set back at all by the kidnapping, telling the pirates that their day would come. Caesar sent some of his entourage out to get the ransom money while he was held captive by the pirates who spent all day mocking him. They soon changed their tune though, with historians saying the pirates suddenly started being ordered around by Caesar. He gave them speeches and read poems and they listened intently, or at least that's how the legend goes. It's unlikely that the historians would have said Caesar was scared senseless and sat in the puddle of his own pee all day. The history books say he played games with the pirates and always spoke to them as if they were his own subordinates. When they annoyed him, he told them he'd have them all crucified. They apparently thought it was a joke. It wasn't. You don't joke about crucifixion in Rome, that's for sure. It took 38 days to get the ransom money, and when it was handed over, the pirates did as they said they would and they released the cheeky young man who they all agreed was fun but had a bit of a chip on his shoulder. He certainly did. Caesar somehow managed to raise an entire fleet not in Rome but in the ancient Greek city of Miletus. It was some fleet, given he really didn't know anyone there and had no political status. With the ships ready, Caesar said, alright boys, that way. Didn't take long to find the pirates, who quite stupidly had stayed on the same island. Caesar had them all put on board and transported to the Greek city of Pergamon, where they were quickly put in chains and sent to prison. Still feeling some loss of face from the ordeal, Caesar wanted them all executed, but Marcus Junctus, the governor of Asia, refused to do so and said the pirates were to be slaves. Why waste a bunch of healthy men by executing them, he said. Caesar didn't see it that way, and he later secretly returned to the pirates and had them all crucified, just as he promised. He at least showed some mercy and cut their throats first. Again, remember, we're talking about legends. Mercy is often right up there with bravery as an attribute of a great ruler. Still, you can't deny that Caesar was special. Otherwise, on his return to Rome, he wouldn't have been given the title of a member of the military tribune, which was then a foot in the door of becoming involved in serious Roman politics. One of Rome's most formidable enemies was Mithridates VI Eupator, the king of Pontus, an exemplary conqueror himself. Pontus, by the way, is in present-day northern Anatolia. The great Mithridates was now in another war with Rome. It's here where the ambitious Caesar saw his chance to prove his greatness. He raised his own army and set off to repel Mithridates. The smooth-talking Caesar was later elected as a quester, which was kind of a public official. He might have been made up by this, but probably a bit downcast too, as at that point his wife died. Still, it seems he had some other things on his mind, because as the story goes, it was around this time that he saw a statue of Alexander the Great and realized he'd done very little in his life for his own age. Alexander had conquered half the world in his 20s, Caesar was embarrassed by his own shortcomings. He did, however, succeed in quite a few ventures. After borrowing a ton of money, he helped to build public works and roads, including paying for a costly reconstruction of the Appian Way, where thousands of slaves had earlier been crucified. They'd fought for the slave Spartacus in his now famous revolt. They lost, but not after they they'd given the Romans hell. But Caesar still wanted more, much more, and so he ran for the position of Pontifex Maximus, which was pretty much the most sought after position in ancient Rome. Let's just say that he and the other two men in the running did their fair share of bribing, but Caesar came out victorious despite accumulating massive debts during his campaign. Caesar was now powerful, but hardly the world changer he was about to become. It was after this that a man named Lucius Sergius Catalina, a soldier and a senator, conspired with others to take over the Republic by dealing with all the aristocrats in the Senate. This his plan was thwarted, but the question is, was Caesar one of the co-conspirators? Some thought he was, perhaps more so because he argued against the death penalty during the proceedings. Then at some point during the debate, someone handed Caesar a note. A man that would become an enemy of Caesar, Marcus Porcius Cato, saw that and demanded to see the note. Turns out it was nothing more than a love letter, but Caesar now had a good idea of who was against him. The conspirators were eventually executed, but only by the skin of his teeth was Caesar granted his innocence after another trial. It seems he was never far away from scandal those days. One of them involved the populist and rabble rouser named Publius Clodius. One evening, this guy sneaked into Caesar's house during a ceremony only for women to seduce Caesar's now wife. Clodius, even though dressed up as a woman, was found out. The only major outcome was Caesar asking for a divorce. You get the picture by now. Caesar Caesar's life was anything but a quiet one. He was given the governorship of Hispania, and there he led some successful military campaigns against two tribal groups. For that he was called the Imperator by his men, meaning their commander. Caesar's soldiers had great respect for him, which is an important matter as we go on. The problem was all the debt that he racked up, and so he turned to who was known as the richest man in Rome. That man was Marcus Licinius Crassus, one of the key figures in this story. Crassus was a general and a statesman who took advantage of the real estate market and was later praised for his victory in Spartacus' slave revolt. This was a good friend to have, and that friendship would greatly influence history. With his debts paid by Crassus and a fair bit of loot from his conquests, Caesar returned to Rome and some amount of applause. He was officially designated as Imperator and his victories were publicly celebrated, something called a Roman Triumph. A triumph was about as good as it gets, but to accept it, he would have to have stayed a soldier. 
so he couldn't do that because he also wanted to be a consul, the highest elected position in Rome. Again, there was a lot of bribery going on during the election and you can bet many of the people were engaged in corrupt practices to ensure Caesar would not become consul. He still won though, as did the old school conservative named Marcus Bibulus. These two would forever remain enemies. Remember, Caesar was kind of the opposite to the conservatives. He was a progressive, a so-called man of the people, and many of the people, especially the soldiers that fought under him, were devoted followers. That still made Caesar tons of enemies among the established elites. Caesar needed friends in high places in this viper's nest that was Roman politics, and as you know, he already had one in Marcus Moneybags Crassus. But he found another one in one of the most remarkable and ruthless generals in all of Roman history. That was Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, better known as Pompey the Great. Just to give you an idea about this guy's ruthlessness, when he was starting out, he got the name Adulescentius Carnifex, meaning teenage butcher. For his many stunning victories, he was awarded three Roman triumphs. If there was a man who didn't want to come up against, it was Pompey. And one day, Caesar would have to do just that. It became one of the biggest beefs in ancient history. But for now, Caesar managed to persuade Pompey to take his side. Pompey even agreed to ally with Crassus, even though the two had never really gotten along. They'd both been lieutenants of Sulla back in the day, but since then had fallen out for various reasons. Still, Caesar convinced both guys they needed each other, and a secret pact was made. They made a mighty trio, or as it became known, the first triumvirate. Just you wait until you hear about the second triumvirate. To make matters even better, Pompey married Caesar's only child, Julia. Caesar also got hitched again, but it seems tying the knot didn't really mean much to him. It wouldn't be long until he'd have one of the most infamous affairs in human history. What's important though is that his wife was the daughter of another very powerful man which was never a bad thing in ancient Rome. If Caesar wanted support from the public, he certainly ticked the right boxes. With help from his secret allies Pompey and Crassus, he passed a law to redistribute public land to the poor. It was only then that the people realized those three guys were working together, which, as you can imagine, was a huge threat to other powerful men in Rome. Cut a long story short, these three guys were killing it and Caesar himself now had four legions under his control. He was ready for some conquest and by God was he about to shake up half of Europe. No one had ever done anything near to what Caesar was about to do, not in Rome anyway. Caesar was about to become an equal to Alexander the Great. No longer would he have to sit in the shadow of that statue. He still had some debts and he knew Gaul was where the money was at. This was an area covering modern day France, Germany, Switzerland and the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg and Northern Italy. It was also home to a lot of tribes, some of which Caesar intended to conquer and some he'd make alliances with. There's no walk in the park defeating them, especially the Germanic tribes, but Caesar's men had better weapons and were more advanced when it came to strategic warfare. Man for man, horse for horse, the Gallic tribes were just as good if not better, but Caesar had the brains. The Romans also had solidarity and leadership, and the Germanic tribes had always fought between themselves. Had they united, it would have been a different story, but ain't that always the case. After subjugating more tribes and enforcing Roman rule, Caesar made plans to enter Britain, something no Roman had done before. The first incursion didn't go so well, since he didn't know the land, and in no time after causing a fair bit of damage, he returned to the relative safety of Gaul. King Vercingetorix of the Averni tribe did succeed in doing some uniting and did beat Caesar's army at the Battle of Gergovia, but in the end the Romans were victorious. This had been some undertaking, with ancient historians later writing that Caesar had fought against three million men from various tribes, of which a third were killed and a third were enslaved. The claim, while disputed these days, was that Caesar and his men took 800 cities and a total of 300 different tribes. Disputed or not, it was still some victory. Caesar would never conquer Britain in his lifetime, but the Romans would rule there later, although with a giant wall to keep those from the far north out. These Gallic Wars, including many of the revolts, had gone on for eight years. As you can now understand, a lot can happen in Rome in eight years. In eight Roman months, there was usually enough backstabbing and scandal to fill a small library. Caesar was well aware that in his absence, someone would be plotting his downfall, which is why he used a lot of his looted money to buy powerful friends back home. Still, those not on the payroll were either angry or envious, spreading gossip about Caesar's military adventurism abroad. That triumvirate, too, was also becoming frayed. They managed to patch things up with a meeting in Gaul, but it was a about to come undone. Caesar's conquests in Gaul weren't just about Roman expansion. Caesar was selfishly building a faithful army, and with that and his new prestige, he could set about reorganizing things in Rome. Finally, he was ready to go back home. But there were tensions rising back there. Caesar's only daughter, Julia, died while giving birth. Remember, it was this woman that was married to Pompey, and that connection between Caesar and him was an important one. Caesar offered him his great niece, but Pompey said, nah, no thanks, bud. This guy had his own ambitions. Then the other part of the triumvirate, Crash who was not in the same league as Caesar and Pompey when it came to warfare, died in battle. He and his son and much of his army were absolutely slaughtered fighting the Parthians at the Battle of Carhae in a part of Turkey. 
It was a humiliating defeat, and later Crassus was roundly criticized for his greed and lack of military prowess. Despite having the stronger army, he and his men were lured into the desert, where arrows rained down from the sky. His commanders told him to negotiate with the Parthians, but when he attempted, Crassus was slain by General Serena. Rome was humiliated, with rumors going around that the Parthians had poured molten gold down Crassus' throat to symbolize his utter greed. Another rumor was that his head was used as a prop in a play at the wedding party of the Parthian king's son. Whatever happened caused turmoil in Rome. The triumvirate was done, and now Caesar and Pompey both vied for power in Rome. Civil war loomed, so the Senate discussed the possible disarmament of both Caesar and Pompey. This gained a lot of support, but in the end, the vote was not passed. Even after, the Senate had received a proposal from Caesar himself, stating that both he and Pompey should lay down their arms at the same time. It was around then that the consul named Gaius Claudius Marcellus asked Pompey if he wanted command of a massive force all over Italy and the power to raise a bigger army. Pompey accepted, and he was the man the nobility preferred so it was looking like much of the power in Rome was turning against Caesar. He was soon told that he'd be declared an enemy of the state if he didn't put down his arms. But let's just remember here that Caesar, man of the people, had the loyalty of a large army, men who'd fought by his side with him for a number of years. On January 10, 49 BC, a historical event took place. That was Caesar and his army marching across a small river called the Rubicon in present-day northern Italy. He only took one legion, Legio 13 Gemina. It was one of his best. This was not the outcome that anyone really wanted. Caesar didn't want a civil war, and neither did Pompey. And for that matter, neither did a lot of the nobility. But Caesar was between a rock and a hard place. Had he laid down his arms, what would he have ultimately faced? He was a powerful man now, and he didn't want to give that up. At that same time, the old regime of nobles wanted to cling to their own power, in a Rome that was quickly changing. They believed Caesar was one of the reasons for this turning tide, accusing him of aspirations to rule over Rome and its growing territories. But Caesar had negotiated with Rome, going so far as to ask for the minimum in terms of demands that would keep him safe. He was turned down, so what choice did he have? At the same time, while Pompey didn't want a civil war, you can bet he was incredibly envious of Caesar's many successes. It's said at this point Caesar said the immortal words, Alia iacta est, let the die be cast, and cast it was. Members of the Senate ran in fear as Caesar marched on Rome. Pompey and his army also fled, not confident in their ability to fight Caesar and his legion. In pursuit of Pompey and Hispania, Caesar left Rome in the hands of the Roman politician and general Mark Anthony, one of the stars of this story whose life was certainly a complicated one. We like him. He was a good general. He seemed loyal. He just had some bad habits that led to him making some bad decisions. We'll come back to him soon. After running Pompey out of Spain, Caesar fought with Pompey's men at the Battle of Dyrrhachium in present-day Albania. Caesar now had legions close by in Greece, and he needed them to support his war effort, while Pompey had also raised more troops. As Caesar's men hunkered down, supplies were low. Pompey knew that he could wait it out and let Caesar's men succumb to hunger. Pompey had the advantage, being high up and also in a position to receive more supplies from the sea. Things at this point were looking very bad for Caesar, his troops inland having to rely on foraging. Pompey, now believing he had won, built a fort overlooking Caesar's much smaller army. The winter was harsh for Caesar's men, but Pompey was also about to face some hardships himself. Caesar started cutting off streams, the water supplies to the fort, and soon disease was rife in Pompey's camps. Later, Caesar almost completely encircled Pompey, hoping that the general would have no choice but to flee into the sea. There was intermittent fighting between the sides, but this was more about waiting. For now, anyway. Soon, a battle commenced, and it looked as though Pompey had the upper hand. Caesar was forced to retreat, having lost a large number of men. He knew he could have lost, but for some reason Pompey had ordered a halt in the attack. Famously, Caesar said Pompey's forces would have won today if only they were commanded by a winner. Caesar had lost close to a thousand men, and those that were captured were executed on the orders of one of Caesar's most trusted lieutenants who had gone over to fight for Pompey. As Caesar and his men retreated, they asked for entrance into the city of Gomphi. They were roundly turned down only for a furious Caesar to attack the town and kill many of its inhabitants. The leaders in Gonfi had made the mistake of thinking it was better to size with the Pompeians, thinking Caesar was as good as beaten. Word soon got around that if Caesar turns up at your gates, you better let him in. Back in Rome, many people wanted Pompey to either return home and protect Rome, or to endeavor to launch a full-scale attack on Caesar. He did neither, and instead he waited for more troops from Syria. He got his back up, and the biggest battle was about to begin. On August 9th, Caesar's experienced legions met in Greece with Pompey's much bigger Republic army at the Battle of Pharsalus. Pompey was confident, but he still was hesitant. It was very likely his officers convinced him that he was ready to attack. 
Spoiler alert, he wasn't. Caesar had around 22,000 Roman legionnaires from eight different legions, as well as something close to a thousand German and Gallic cavalry. Pompey's army was in the realm of 40,000 strong with an estimated 5,000 to 7,000 cavalry. It was a giant force made up of Roman men as well as Germans, Gauls, Greeks, Jews, Syrians, Phoenicians, and Thracians. Many of these men were ordered to fight by their own rulers, rulers who answered to Rome. It was basically everyone versus Caesar, but Caesar, as you know, had highly skilled and eternally loyal fighters. Under the orders of Mark Anthony and Gnaeus Domitius Calvinus, Caesar's infantry made a move, followed by a sneaky, well-hidden attack that took Pompey's cavalry off guard. Caesar ordered his men to use their javelins to pick off Pompey's men, and when Caesar's own cavalry advanced, it turned into a massacre. Of Pompey's cavalry that was killed, many retreated, leaving his infantry exposed. Caesar ordered more of his battle-hardened men to attack, and suddenly Pompey's much larger army was on the verge of losing. Caesar gave Pompey's men no quarter after capturing them, killing almost every last one of them. Pompey's army was in total disarray when Caesar gave the order to capture the Pompeian camp. It was a bloodbath, in spite of Pompey's men making a valiant defense. The battle was won by the much smaller side, with Caesar claiming he only lost about 200 regular men and 30 of his commanders. When later asked how this unbelievable victory happened, he said it helps when you know the names of every last commander, or as the Romans called them, centurions. You can now understand the influence his late uncle Marius had on him. Yet again, Pompey fled. Rome now knew who was the boss, although Caesar was a rational man, a forgiving man, and he said anyone who asked for mercy would be spared. He believed there was no point in mass executions, just as Sulla had done. He forgave most of those who had been against him in Rome, including the politician Marcus Junius Brutus. Don't forget that name. We'll just say right now that Brutus had actually been an ally of Caesar. But due to Caesar not always doing what the Senate wanted, he switched his alliance to Pompey during the Civil War. Despite this, Caesar let him live and allowed him to stay in the Senate. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Where was Pompey? The answer to that question is in Egypt, a place where he wrongly thought that he'd be offered protection by King Ptolemy XIII. Back when this guy's father was in charge, he'd been told that when the time came he'd marry his older sister Cleopatra, a woman famed for her beauty. Although, we'll challenge that. She was nothing special. She was more brains than beauty, and when it started looking like she wore the pants in the co-rulership, Ptolemy arranged to have her murdered. She subsequently fled to Syria and raised an army, hence the breakout of a civil war. Pompey should have known better because shortly after he was taken under Ptolemy's protection, the king had him killed. He believed this would put him in Caesar's good books. But when Caesar arrived in Egypt and was shown Pompey's head, he was less than pleased. After all, Pompey was a great Roman general. Decapitation was just not fitting for such an esteemed man. Caesar ordered that Pompey be given a proper Roman funeral. Meanwhile, he said that Pompey's assassins should be executed, and the king was asked to make a rather large payment. Caesar also tried to fix the rift between brother and sister. We should mention at this point, Caesar wasn't with a large part of his legions and not all of his best commanders. It's estimated he had around 3,000 infantry and 800 Germanic cavalry. Soon after, they were attacked in the Siege of Alexander which saw Ptolemy and his allies much larger armies against the armies of Caesar. It was at some point during the siege that Caesar met Cleopatra, and the two fell in love. Well, maybe. Or more likely, Cleopatra was wielding her intelligence unbeknownst to Caesar. They got it on, and while Caesar still recommended she and her brother share the throne, Ptolemy rightly concluded that Caesar might have taken sides. Caesar, somewhat rattled by everything that was going on, ordered his men to destroy the Alexandrian fleet. They did that to some extent, and also badly damaged the Great Library, but the Alexandrians soon had 27 warships at the ready to face Caesar's 19 warships and a bunch of smaller ships. The Romans got the upper hand, forcing the Alexandrians to retreat, although in a later scrap Caesar could easily have lost his life in the battle for Pharos. At one point, he had to relieve himself of his armor and jump into the sea to escape an onslaught, although later, with the help of thousands of Jewish reinforcements, Caesar was finally victorious. The short story is, Ptolemy drowned sometime later and Cleopatra became ruler of Egypt along with her other brother Ptolemy XIV. She and Caesar remained in a relationship despite him being married in Rome. They had a bastard child, Caesarion, and he took her to Rome on a few occasions, not as a lover but a client. Talk about the scandal as they both vacationed in Caesar's villa. Now the dictator of Rome, in fairly quick succession, Caesar achieved many resounding military victories. The first was against Pharnaces II, king of Pontus. It was an absolute annihilation, which according to Caesar took no more than four hours. That's when he uttered those famous words, Vini vidi vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. His next routing was in Africa. But all the time Caesar was away, his enemies in Rome, always jealous of his achievements, criticized him and said this guy's ego is through the roof. They feared he'd have way too much power. Yep, some of those were people he'd shown mercy to, which actually is one of the reasons for Caesar's downfall. He could be brutal when it came to the barbarians, but he was often way too kind when it came to his foes in Rome. 
Amazing games with exotic animals and fearless gladiators were held, and there was much blood and merriment. Caesar was certainly celebrated by the masses, but his opponents were miffed that he should have had a triumph for his victory in the Civil War. They said triumph should not be held when the defeated party, in this case, wasn't a foreign army but the Romans. They also didn't like the fact that he'd made himself dictator in perpetuity, that means forever. At this point, he was ushering in quite big changes in legislation, much of it in favor of the poor and certainly in favor of his military veterans. He changed the calendar system too, as well as reformed the taxation system. This was all pretty progressive, but you could say it didn't go down well with some of those other nobility. Then when he filled the Senate with new people aligned with himself and put term limits on governorships, well, some people secretly reviled him. Many of those reforms, of course, were put into place to cement his eternal power. He was doing what all dictators do, making himself beyond reproach. Then there was his diss of senators at the Temple of Venus Genetrix, when he refused to stand up while they gave him gifts to show their appreciation. This was made worse when he told them to their faces that he'd had enough of honors and perhaps it was time to cut back on that kind of thing. Ouch. It seemed as if he didn't just care not about gifts, but he was openly mocking the Senate. Then there were his actions again in the tribunes. Tribunes were your everyday working class plebeians that had lower rank status in the Roman government. One day Caesar saw some of them taking a diadem like a crown from the top of a statue of Caesar. They decided this was not in line with customs since the diadem was not for a politician but a king or a god. Later Caesar was riding down the Appian Way on his horse when one of his devoted fans shouted out the word Rex, meaning king. Caesar put the man straight and replied, I am not Rex, but Caesar. That man in the crowd was then arrested by the tribunes. So there were now two incidences with the tribunes and both annoyed Caesar. He then announced that from now on there would be no tribunes in the Senate. This was a bad move in terms of public relations. It was the tribunes that represented the working folk. People in the streets said things such as, and I thought he was supposed to be with us. Man of the people, my ass. Then came the worst thing. Caesar was at a fertility festival called Lupercalia, and at some point during the celebration, Mark Anthony put a crown on his head saying, the people give this to you through me. As you know, crowns weren't for dictators. Some people were shocked into silence, a few clapped, and some started whispering, who does he think he is? Tongues wagged, even though to Caesar's credit he took off the crown and said, Jupiter alone of the Romans is king. Some people later said Caesar had set the whole thing up, just to gauge the crowd's reaction so he might know if they wanted him to be king. Just so you know, Romans had gotten rid of kings and replaced rulership with a more modern kind of government. Kings they agreed were dangerous. On the evening of February 22nd, 44 BC, somewhere in the shadows, two men and machinated about a certain downfall. One was Brutus, who you already know Caesar had spared. The other was his brother-in-law, the senator named Cassius Longinus. They decided that killing Caesar wasn't good enough, seeing as Caesar was still well-liked by the people. They didn't want a revolt. They agreed that Caesar's death should be at the hands of a large group of men, and then they could announce that they'd only murdered a tyrant for the good of Rome. Almost like picking a jury, they went through a list of powerful men. The assassins, they decided, should include some senators close to their own age of 40. The difficult thing was, to bring such a thing up in conversation. After all, tell the wrong person you intend to assassinate the leader and that would not only foil the plot but get you killed. So they decided to ask questions like this. Okay, hypothetically, just that, just hypothetically speaking, if, if a certain man was uh, like an evil ruler of people and caused much damage to his land, do you think like A, his people should rise up and kill him or maybe B, you should just let sleeping dogs lie? Remember, hypothetically speaking. In the end, they got around 60 people to agree with the assassination, folks from all sorts of backgrounds. But most who had a beef with Caesar were skeptical of his growing authoritarianism or felt that they hadn't been rewarded enough by him. Some were merely peeved that Caesar had been too kind to folks that had once supported Pompey. He had plenty of enemies, that's for sure. They even thought about trying to enlist Mark Anthony, but it was decided that Anthony wouldn't go for it. They also wondered if they should kill Anthony, and while they were on the topic, they asked if they should also undo all of Caesar's reforms. Now that wouldn't work, it turned out, because some of the assassins actually liked the reforms. Still, most of them were good with getting rid of Anthony. Brutus then said the sensible thing. He told the others that if they killed Anthony, the people would start asking too many questions. Anthony was no tyrant, said Brutus, and the people knew that. Brutus also said if they reversed the reforms, people would ask if the assassination was because of a tyrant or because some greedy men wanted their own way. It was finally agreed that they would keep the reforms, spare Anthony, and only kill the man that they say wanted to be king. 
Ok, so how would they get the job done? They mulled over a few murder plots. Some men said just do it on the streets, a daggers in the heart scenario, easy. Others said no, nothing public, and offered the proposal of throwing him over a bridge and when he landed in the water stabbing the hell out of him. This also sounded a bit messy to some of them. Someone else ventured that they should kill him quickly at the gladiatorial games when the place was erupting in chaos. Then no one would know what was going on. It was finally agreed that the best course of events would be to get him at one of the senate meetings. This was pretty much the only time he wasn't surrounded by friends, people that knew how to fight. The other senators though, the ones forever allied with Caesar, couldn't punch their way through a paper bag or whatever was the expression in ancient Rome. It would also look much nobler, doing it at a meeting rather than down an alley or in a river. The 15th of March was picked, in which the Roman calendar was the Ides of March, a date for Romans was often reserved for paying back debts. Caesar had visited a seer around this time and the seer had told him his life was in danger. It's thought Caesar also knew something strange was going on around him. Everyone looked suspicious. Then one day Caesar said to an aide, what do you think Cassius is up to? I don't like him, he looks pale. When the big day came, the senators and some others turned up for the meeting held at the Senate House of Pompeii, which was in the Theater of Pompeii. Nearby gladiators were preparing for the games. That made the plotters confident, knowing that if they met with resistance they could get them on their side. One of the leading conspirators was Decimus Brutus, a man who had his own team of gladiators. They waited and waited, but Caesar didn't come. The reason could be a legend, but it's said that Caesar's wife had awoken him that morning and pleaded with him not to leave. She said she just had a nightmare in which he'd been murdered. Another story says she dreamed of a river of blood oozing from Caesar's body. It seems she did indeed have some kind of bad dream because the historians say after Caesar decided not to go and asked Anthony to cancel the meeting, gladiator owner Decimus turned up at his house. After hearing Caesar's reasons for shutting down the meeting, he said, what do you say, Caesar? Will someone of your stature pay attention to a woman's dreams and the omens of foolish men? Anthony followed Caesar and the others to the meeting, but as soon as they were in the door, someone grabbed Anthony and shoved him into another room. He must have known right then he'd never see his friend alive again. Caesar, not knowing what was happening, took a seat and was handed a petition to review. Most people around him were his enemies, all of them with daggers at the ready. What cowards they were about to kill a defenseless man, the greatest man Rome had seen and would ever see. It was Senator Kimber that made the first move, grabbing at Caesar's toga and pulling it down. Caesar shouted, why this violence? Then Senator Casca brandished his dagger, viciously inserting it in Caesar's back. Blood spurted out in streams. Caesar grabbed him and said, Casca, you villain, what are you doing? Then they all piled in, including Brutus, and it was stab after stab after stab, 23 hits in total. But the one to the aorta was the fatal blow. Caesar died, said the autopsy, from blood loss. He may have had no final words, although some historians wrote that he said, you too, child? When he saw Brutus was one of the conspirators, he may have said nothing, and on seeing Brutus, the gravity of such betrayal made him pull his toga over his eyes. Brutus, we are told, was actually a man of morals and Caesar had known that. Brutus had never actually wanted a bloodbath, but he reckoned, sincerely, Caesar had to be killed for the good of Rome. Many of the conspirators fled from the scene, but some of them walked through the streets shouting, people of Rome, we are once again free. The people locked their doors, not knowing what to think. Caesar, meanwhile, lay on that cold, hard floor, only moved later by slaves. Many of the lower classes were furious that their beloved Caesar had been felled by a group of greedy aristocrats. They didn't buy into the tale, this being for their own good. Mark Anthony realized that this was a good time to exploit the anger and threatened to release the angry mass on the aristocrats. Caesar hadn't had all-out support from the people of Rome, but he had enough devoted followers to ensure this time was fraught with tension. We're missing out on a lot here, but as time passed, some of those plebes got to work burning down the houses of the conspirators. 18-year-old Octavian, Caesar's grandnephew and adopted son, had been made heir by Caesar before his death. Turned out he was a formidable ruler too. We'll come back to his fate soon. War was here again, with Brutus and Cassius both raising armies, and Anthony doing the same. In short, Brutus and Cassius lost. A second triumvirate was formed, this one consisting of Anthony, Octavian, and Caesar's master of the horse, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. As for Caesar's enemies, there was no forgiveness this time. It's a long story, but as you know, power vacuums are often very bloody. It was agreed that the Second Triumvirate should rule various provinces of Rome, and they did so openly and legally, unlike the First Triumvirate. Lands were divided, and Octavian married Anthony's stepdaughter, Claudia. And later, Anthony got hitched to Octavian's sister, Octavia. Proscription, which as we said, made it legal to banish or execute Romans who'd been condemned, was brought back. This hadn't happened since Sulla was around. Everything might have been hunky-dory if all those men didn't have their own dangerous ambitions and insatiable hunger for power. Lepidus and Octavian fell out over the matter of territories, and Octavian then accused Lepidus of trying to start a rebellion and take all the power for himself. Lepidus lost that argument and ended up being booted out of Rome and exiled to Africa. Anthony then ended up with Caesar's old flame, the extremely wealthy Cleopatra. They lived in Alexandria and had 
had kids together, and together with their joint armies they did a fair bit of conquering. Anthony even gave himself a kind of fake triumph and minted coins for his victory. Octavian didn't much like this, Anthony was getting too big for his britches. And then when Octavian got hold of Anthony's will by illegally breaking into the sacred temple of Vesta, he saw that Anthony intended to bequeath a hell of a lot to Cleopatra's kids. He even asked to be buried in Alexandria, not in Rome. Disgraceful, thought Octavian. That was fighting talk, especially when Octavian saw that Anthony and Cleopatra wanted to be queen of kings in the lands of Egypt and Cyprus and Caesar's bastard son with Cleopatra, Caesarion, to be named king of kings. The upshot was Octavian declaring that Anthony had failed to conduct himself as befitted a Roman citizen. The Battle of Actium was the result of this fallout, sometimes called the Final War of the Roman Republic. Turned out that Cleopatra and Anthony were no match for Octavian's forces, not even close, and Cleo and Tony soon perished. Believe it or not, Rome saw quite a long period of peace after that, with Octavian becoming the first ever emperor and initiating what would be called the Golden Age of Rome under the name Pax Romana, Roman peace. Talk about having to break some eggs to make an omelet that Caesar had started. Few people have made more enemies than Vladimir Putin, and the dictator of Russia hasn't given them many ways to express their grievances. Sure, they can shout it in the public square, but the odds are the police will be right behind them. So it's not a surprise that some of them have resorted to other, more violent methods. But the KGB agent turned politician is ruthless, and he's managed to survive more than one assassination attempt. Some of them may just put action heroes to shame. Putin didn't just take office by election. He was appointed to the office of prime minister in 1999 by Russia's first and some would say only democratic leader, Boris Yeltsin. When Yeltsin stepped down, Putin became Russia's new president, and he's held one of the two positions ever since taking down every check and balance in his way. That's 23 years of him wielding increasingly tight control over Russia, while his enemies are getting ever more desperate to remove him. The current laws mean he could hold power until 2036, and that's if he doesn't declare a permanent state of emergency as a result of the war. And for many of his opponents, Mother Russia's death grip feels even tighter. Russia is still technically a democracy, with elections being held at regular intervals. But are these elections truly free? That's much trickier. Arrests of protesters, opposition leaders, and businessmen who fall out of favor are increasingly common. And for those who Putin can't find any legal dirt on, he often gets them another way. Assassinations by poisoning have become a common trick of the trade for Putin, with noted Putin critic Alexander Litvinenko being fatally poisoned with polonium in 2006, and a double agent as well as his daughter being targeted with a nerve agent in 2018. While the latter two survived, what scared the world about these two attacks is that they happened in London, meaning Putin's agents wouldn't even tolerate dissent outside of Russia. And soon enough, Vladimir Putin would go from hunter to hunted. But Putin is notoriously secretive, rarely appearing in public. Even when he's in meetings with his inner circle, he often insists on being safe distances from them, just in case anyone thinks about returning to a common Soviet method of settling disputes with leadership. It happens so often, in fact, that it's become a running joke. If a Soviet citizen turns on the TV and they're playing Swan Lake instead of news and propaganda, odds are there's been an unexpected change in leadership. It's no wonder that Putin, who has ambitions of restoring much of the Soviet Union's territory, also employs some of its tactics. Which raises the question, how did we find out about the attempts on his life? It started with an unusual source, the acclaimed filmmaker and notorious conspiracy theorist Oliver Stone, who actually got to interview Putin in 2017. While asking the Russian president questions, Stone casually mentioned that Putin had survived five assassination attempts, which probably wasn't something that Putin intended to get out. While no secret police bundled Stone off to the gulag, it probably didn't help the case of any of the journalists who wanted to get interviews after that. But Putin's been making close escapes for over 20 years now. It all started in February 2000, not long after Putin took power. While attending the funeral of the former mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak, Putin suddenly came under attack. Not many details are known of this attack, because Putin keeps him close to his chest. But what is known is that his security team quickly intervened and kept him safe. More ominously, when asked about this at a later date, the Federal Guard Service's press secretary would only comment that they had identified the organization behind the attack, which meant it wasn't a lone wolf attack, and more attacks were likely coming. They wouldn't have long to wait, only August of the same year, and on a much bigger scale. Putin was attending a summit of the former Soviet nations at Yalta many of whom were likely worried that the Russian bear was looking to reclaim its old territory. But in the grand Soviet tradition, the reports didn't come out immediately. It would be weeks before anyone even revealed that an assassination attempt took place, 
and even longer before it was revealed that the attempt was against Putin. But once the details came out, everything fell into place. The Commonwealth of Independent States gathering brought a lot of grievances to the table, but one issue that wasn't on the table was the situation of the Chechens, a Russian Muslim minority group that had long been pushing for independence. Russia had cracked down on them multiple times, and that brought a group of radicals to the summit. Ultimately, four Chechens were arrested and a number of Middle Eastern nationals with them. But that was about all we know, because the documents were classified. It seems these plotters were arrested without ever getting close to Putin. But the same can't be said for later plots. If you asked the Russian security services for more information, the answer would probably be a solid nyet, which is why much of this information comes from third-hand sources much after the fact. But the higher profile the attempt, the harder it is to keep a lid on the incident. That was the case in January 2002 when Putin was getting ready to visit the former Soviet state of Azerbaijan. While Putin wasn't there yet, his security forces were, and it turned out that they knew more than the Azeri security forces did. Which makes you wonder, what else did they know about their former subject state? The Azeri leaders didn't have time to ponder that. There was an assassination to foil, and this one was an international affair. The main subject of the investigation was an Iraqi citizen, and tracking him showed he had been working with both Chechen rebels and the agents from Afghanistan. They had been planning to deliver a large number of explosives likely to be deployed against Putin during his visit. But once again, they never got close enough to pull it off. The plotters were arrested, with at least one being sentenced to 10 years in prison, and Putin's eventual visit went off without a hitch, something the Azaris were likely even happier about than he was. But none of the plots were this competent or elaborate. It was 10 months after the Azerbaijan plot was foiled when a threat came very close to Putin, but it was far from being a competent terror assault like something out of an action movie or at least the Russian bootleg, a man drove into the Kremlin complex and demanded to address Putin personally. His name was Ivan Zyatsev, and he had a bizarre claim. He thought he was the legitimate president of Russia. Was this some long-lost descendant of the Romanovs or a Soviet loyalist next in the line of succession? Nope, it was just a crazy person, but that's where the story got wilder. Zayatsev was quickly arrested and bundled off to the nearest psychiatric hospital for observation. While there, he continued to make one wild claim after another, including that this was the second time he tried to get close to Putin. His motivation? He thought Putin was a secret Nazi who was planning to turn Russia into a fascist state, which some might say wasn't that far off. But he also claimed to be an undercover spy and that he was avenging the beheading death of his brother years ago, and he planned to cut Putin's head off as a trophy. No evidence was found of any of those claims, but Putin's security forces no doubt made sure that Zayatsev wouldn't be getting a third chance to get close. As time went on, Putin tightened his grip on Russia and the attacks would get more serious. It was only a few months later when Putin was heading back to the Kremlin headquarters. A group of workers showed up at the highway leading up to the complex, announcing that they had been hired to install new signs, except that the work had not been ordered by the city and soon the area was swarming with police. What they found was shocking. 40 kilos of explosives timed to detonate when Putin's motorcade would be passing. It was the most competent attempt on Putin's life yet, and came dangerously close to succeeding. Not that people would know it, the explosives were quickly removed, the plotters were no doubt tracked down, and soon the Russian government would insist the whole affair never happened. But Putin's security didn't do enough to keep it from happening again. Assassination attempts on Putin seem to be a yearly affair in Russia, and if he stays in power, who knows, it might become a tradition. Someone dressed up as a plotter pulls it off and is foiled by the actors playing the police, while the street vendors sell the spectators pierogies. There wouldn't be much of a difference between the success rate of the plotters and the actors because they seem to be foiled constantly. In 2003, a plotter used the same tactic as a previous plotter, bombs by the side of the road where Putin was supposed to be passing. This time though, the bomb was a small pipe bomb object hidden in a bag. It was unlikely it would have even exploded. When asked for more details, such as if a culprit had been found, the Russian authorities once again said, yet. But as time went on, the plotters started to get smarter. It was 2008, after a relative era of peace, and Putin was planning to leave office for another office. His longtime ally, Dmitry Medvedev, was ascending to the office of president as Putin stepped down to become the new prime minister, his old office. Many assumed this was a way for him to maintain power behind the scenes. But some people would rather neither be in power, and they decided to take action. While the two were walking in an area surrounding the Kremlin, no doubt discussing their plans for Russia, a sniper struck, reportedly firing at them. However, the security presence was able to protect the two politicians and neutralize the threat. Once again, the identity of the shooter and their eventual fate is unknown. But old enemies were about to strike again. It was 2012, and sure enough, Putin was president again. The laws involving term limits had been changed, and Putin had taken back his old office from Medvedev 
and now looked to rule indefinitely. And the Chechen radicals who had plotted against him before knew that likely meant bad things for them. Once again they planned an often tried tactic of a roadside bomb, and once again they were foiled. Like with the other attempts, the security team got a tip and took action before the bomb was detonated. And just like those other tries, the Russian authorities remained tight-lipped about the details of the plot. It's likely the Chechen areas where the attackers came from felt the impact. At least eight attacks, none of them successful. What is Vladimir Putin's secret? Not only did none of the attackers kill Putin, none of them even managed to injure him or get particularly close to him. Each time it felt like the attackers were running behind the eight ball, with the Russian security forces knowing where they'd be and neutralizing them before there was even a disruption. Ironically, the closest anyone got to actually creating a major incident was the fabulous Ivan Zyatsev, whose wild stories and unpredictable behavior likely made him much harder to track than the organized plotters. And the failure rate comes down to a number of factors. For one thing, Russia's security is good. Very good. While much of Russia's military is made up of conscripts mostly consisting of draftees who are often poorly trained and underfed, the security team is the best of the best. The Russian Presidential Regiment is all armed and trained in unarmed combat, and they patrol the Kremlin relentlessly. The massive guard towers surrounding the complex let them see full range around the area. The regiment has strict entry requirements, and only those with excellent eyesight and hearing are accepted. One benchmark potential members are tested on is being able to hear a whisper from up to 20 feet away. They're also put through rigorous fitness tests and need to match a certain height and weight to be considered suitable to protect Putin. But it's not just the security team. Putin is a paranoid man, but his paranoia is not unfounded. He wanted advice from someone who had much reason to fear assassination as him, if not more, and so he went to an old friend of the Russian regime, the elderly dictator Fidel Castro, who had ruled Cuba for close to half a century by the time Putin took power and had been targeted by more than 600 attempts at assassination, all unsuccessful. Some of those attempts were by domestic enemies and some were by foreign governments, including the United States, which once took aim at him with exploding cigars. So it's no surprise, he was very paranoid. In the interview with Oliver Stone, Putin reminisced about his conversation with Castro, and the old Cuban revolutionary had one key bit of advice, don't be afraid to be a control freak. Castro claimed that he was always the one to personally deal with his security forces, hand-picking them and promoting or dismissing them when he felt like it. This gave no one on the outside the chance to influence them and sabotage the leader's security. The result? A security team that looks a lot more like a private army only loyal to one man, rather than a large organization of the US Secret Service. But it's possible for this to go too far. There are some national leaders who keep an even tighter grip on their country than Putin. And the odds are, he looks at the leadership of North Korea and goes, dude, lighten up. Run since its founding in the 1940s by one family over three generations, their security forces are trained to fend off enemies from both the general public and the ambitious agents in the government who might think they could run things better than that son of the previous leader. Which is why the security system in North Korea looks a little bit more like a cult than a government agency. Like Russia, they have a conscript army, but unlike Russia, being selected for the leader's personal security team means cutting ties with your old life. Members of the team are never allowed to have contact with their family again because Kim Jong-un wants them to have loyalty to only one person. Russia doesn't go that far, but his security team are no slouches themselves. In addition to physical skill, everyone who works for Putin's security team is highly trained in psychological profiling. They're not, however, trained to fade into the background. The training for Russian bodyguards is much more offensively focused than for the Secret Service. If something even appears to be a possible threat, they're supposed to take action hard and fast, and their responsibilities extend well beyond assassins. They're supposed to be so thorough, in fact, that their duties begin months before Putin is supposed to appear at a location. They're also all under the age of 35 and trained to speak multiple languages, preparing to protect Putin effectively when abroad. In some ways, they're more like spies than bodyguards. If your country is supposed to be hosting Putin, the odds are you won't even know that they're there. They'll simply make their way in, usually without much fanfare and only with a few people in the know to start scouting the area. This will involve looking for any signs of criminal activity or social unrest, as well as the presence of known enemies of Putin. These issues will usually be shared with the local government so they can coordinate, if the Russians trust them. Beyond that, the security will be observing infrastructure issues, looking for potential weak points, and Putin likes to have everything under control. That includes planning for what would happen if a natural disaster strikes during his visit. So if any super spies are packing an earthquake device in their next attempt, the odds aren't great. But if all the preparation fails, Putin is anything but defenseless. When he's appearing in public, Putin is typically protected by four squads. His first is his visible security detail. They're armed, ready to take a bullet and fire a lot of them if needed. 
This group is Putin's first line of defense, similar to the ones that protect the president, and they have only the best gear, including a pistol that can fire 40 rounds a minute. But many people who observe them notice they don't actually seem to do much. They're a constant presence, but they seem to take action less often than any other presidential security teams. And that's because they don't have to. For every visible squad guarding Putin, there are three other squads backing them up, and they're largely invisible. One is in plain clothes and assigned to blend in with the crowd, looking for any unusual movements toward the Russian president. If they see something, they'll strike and take down the assailant without them expecting it. Another group stands outside the crowd, undercover but armed, and ready to strike if anyone gets past the first two lines of defense. And in the event of a larger threat, a team of armed snipers keeps watch from the sky, ready to shoot down any attacker. But not all of Putin's lines of defense are armed. It's revenge of the nerds Russian style, because one of Putin's biggest secret weapons is his IT team. Today, most assassination attempts are pulled off digitally, with bombs being detonated remotely, while hacking is used to confirm the location of a target. That's why Putin's security team commonly places jamming devices around his location blocking cell phone operations and keeping remote-controlled bombs or drones from being used in the area. It also has the side effect of letting the government spy on any electronic device in the area, exposing assassination plots or anyone saying something the government disapproves of. An invasion of privacy? Probably. But don't say that when Putin and his men are listening. And if someone gets too close, Putin has failsafes in place. Not only does Putin have this highly trained security force, but there's usually a convoy of armored vehicles stationed around, ready to swoop in with backup and extract him from the situation at a moment's notice, and maybe plow through a hostile crowd if needed. Back at the Kremlin, Putin has some guards with their own unique and both tasty and terrifying duties. It's a tradition going back to medieval times, but the need hasn't lessened. Food tasters sample every meal Putin eats before he digs in, and so far no one has tried to poison him that we know of. But one other X factor might protect Putin from assassination attempts. It was 2017, five years after one of the botched attempts against Putin's life. While it's not known if the culprits were ever found, one of the top suspects was Chechen radical Adam Osmayev. He'd been arrested in Ukraine, but due to a lack of evidence was never charged, and Ukraine refused to extradite him to Russia. He was eventually released, and one day he and his wife were near a railroad crossing when a mysterious assassin shot them both, killing his wife and wounding Osmayev. Was it a message from Russia? If yes, they're not saying, but everyone knows Putin has a long-lasting memory, and if you target him and fail, the odds are good that his security apparatus will come for you no matter how long it takes, and he doesn't care who gets caught in the crossfire. But now those threats might be ramping up. The Russian invasion of Ukraine changed everything in the conversation about Vladimir Putin, and that included who started talking about taking him out. While previously only local radicals and the occasional crazy man were thinking about it, now US senators like Lindsey Graham are openly talking about assassination. While most countries were staying out of the fray, especially once Putin casually reminded everyone how many nuclear weapons Russia has, there's no doubt that his security forces are likely tightening their grip. So what does it look like now? It's hard to tell because Putin's control over Russia is only getting stronger. A combination of sanctions and stricter laws means most foreign media is heading for the exits. Netflix pulled the plug on their service in Russia due to a new law that stated they'd have to carry Russian propaganda channels. Netflix doesn't have channels, so we're guessing that Putin probably isn't a fan of streaming content and may not be up on the latest lingo. But all indications from those reporting from the inside are that Putin's paranoia and isolation have only deepened, and that means the biggest threat to him might be coming from within. Could Putin's own inner circle be plotting against him? Early indications are that he at least may think so. As the war in Ukraine drags on and Russian forces lose massive numbers of soldiers, with some even being captured and appearing on TV to condemn the invasion, Putin gets increasingly desperate. The country is under massive sanctions that have basically kneecapped the economy, and Russia has reportedly been forced to ask for military aid from China to keep the invasion going. This has led many people to compare him to Hitler in the dying days of the war. Is Putin trying to prevent his own Operation Valkyrie? Reports out of Russia are that Putin has fired or even arrested many of his top generals and security advisors. Some have been placed under house arrest, some have fled the country, and others have just not been heard from in a while. Many of his oligarch friends have found themselves personally sanctioned, even losing their massive yachts, and had no choice but to return home to Russia. There, it's entirely possible that all these powerful businessmen might decide that Putin's gone too far and needs to be removed by any means possible. But that's becoming more and more unlikely. As the war rages on, the bad news grows for Russia and the odds are more attempts on Putin's life might come. But for those who try, they might find themselves facing increasingly long odds. Not only is Putin appearing in public less and less, but the list of people who get to see him in the Kremlin is getting smaller and smaller. Even his closest advisors find themselves kept at arm's length, 
or the length of the longest table they can find, and anyone plotting an attack knows that if they fail, it's not just their fate at risk. It could be their family or even the whole countries. And in a building that is starting to look a lot more like a fortress, Vladimir Putin waits for his enemies to make their next move. The date is August 14, 1961. The location, a dingy basement in the American Central Intelligence Agency's West Berlin headquarters. Just a few miles distant lies the Soviet KGB's own headquarters, both sides separated by a political demarcation splitting Germany into East under influence of the Soviet Union and the Democratic West under the protection of the United States and its allies. For years, a secret spy war has waged between both sides the life of each operative always just a single trigger pull away from ending. Or at least that's what the man claims to be and want. He appears to be in his late 30s or early 40s, a tall, handsome man with dark hair, a clean-shaven face, and an easy-going manner. Nothing about him screams assassin, and yet the man insists that he is one responsible for at least two major political assassinations on the Soviet side of Europe. The American agents interrogating him are skeptical. The West German intelligence officer assisting his American partners is less skeptical. Go on, the German officer nods. Tell us how it happened. Stashinsky takes a sip of water and clears his throat. It's now October 1957 and the weather is pleasantly cool. Stashinsky sits on a park bench in the middle of Munich, newspaper on his lap. To all appearances, he's nothing more than another German citizen enjoying the mild weather. In reality, he's a dangerous predatory animal, carefully eyeballing every man who crosses his path. He's looking for his prey, and he knows he'll find him soon. Originally, Stashinsky was instructed to abduct Lev Rebet, the editor of a Ukrainian nationalistic newspaper that called for the independence of Ukraine from the Soviet Union. Needless to say, this didn't sit well with the Soviet government, and with the paper's growing influence, something had to be done to stop the agitators. Six months after his original tasking to abduct Revit, the KGB changed its mind and encouraged the assassination of Revit instead. The Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev personally approved of the killing, and soon Stashinsky found himself with the different orders – kill Lev Revit and leave no witnesses. Stashinsky watches the crowd carefully as it moves. He's been here in the city center for two days knowing that eventually Rabbit will appear. He doesn't have to wait long, and early on the second day, Stashinsky spots Rabbit from a distance as he steps off a train and immediately picks up his newspaper and begins to follow him. Rabbit has only minutes left to live now. Hidden in the rolled up newspaper is a very simple device, a single shot, single barreled pipe gun of sorts loaded with a nearly foolproof tool for assassination, a capsule of potassium cyanide. The weapon fires the capsule directly into the face of its victim, which bursts on impact, releasing a small cloud of the deadly poison. Within seconds, the victim will be unconscious, moments later, dead, and best of all, any medical examination that doesn't look too closely will determine the cause of death to be nothing more than a simple heart attack. Now, Stashinsky follows Revit, the deadly weapon hidden in his newspaper. On an ankle holster, Stashinsky carries a small revolver just in case there are any witnesses. Nobody can be left alive to tell the tale of Revit's death and certainly not to link it back to the people who most want him dead, the Soviet Union. Revit leads Stashinsky through the streets of Berlin, finally arriving at his apartment block. He opens the front door and lets himself in. Stashinsky slipping in behind him just before the door closes. Revit begins to climb the stairs to the second floor, completely unaware of the deadly assassin stalking his every step. Stashinsky clears his throat. The surprised Revit immediately spins around to face him, only to stare into the barrel of the deadly poison gun. With a silent hiss, the weapon fires, a potassium cyanide capsule bursting directly in Revit's face. Revit staggers forward but falls to the floor. The assassination has been perfect no witnesses, and the medical examiners will discover only a small amount of potassium cyanide in Revit's system, not enough to trigger suspicions that his death was anything but natural. Back in 1961, the CIA officers looked skeptical. A poison gun that shoots potassium cyanide capsules? That sounds ridiculous to them, pure fantasy. They're growing less and less convinced by the minute that this man is truly who he says he is, let alone a Soviet assassin. The German officer, however, isn't so sure. An autopsy of Revit did discover potassium cyanide in his system, and the same was discovered in another prominent political enemy of the Soviet Union just two years later. Could the two be connected? Tell me more, Herr Stashinsky. It's once more October, but this time it's 1959, two years after the assassination of Lev Revit. Today, the target is another Ukrainian antagonist, a political leader now living in exile from his former home and still calling for independence from the Soviet Union, Stepan Bandera. This has naturally placed him in the crosshairs of the KGB. 
Bandera lives in Munich on an apartment block at Kreitmeier Street, not far from his office. Stashinsky has been watching Bandera closely for months. The man is not easy to track or to approach. Bandera is all too aware that he has a target on his back and has been careful to mix up his routines and maintain tight security at all times. This has made pinning down his commute in best places to ambush him very difficult. Stashinsky has already tried to penetrate Bandera's home on a previous occasion, but the lockpicking tools provided him by the KGB failed to open the lock on the front door of the apartment building. He tried his own key to see if perhaps they were similar enough, but that too failed and actually broke off in the lock. Panicked, Stashinsky called off the assassination attempt, fearful that the sabotaged lock might give the plot away. Lucky for him, the building inspector fixed the lock and suspected no foul play. Bandera remained unaware of just how close he had come to death. Stashinsky was determined to kill him on his first trip though, and as he followed closely from behind through the streets of Munich, Bandera happened to glance behind him and spot Stashinsky, making the assassin fear he'd been made. The hit was called off. But now, weeks later, Stashinsky is determined to at last get his victim. He's filed down one of his own keys to match the lock to Bandera's apartment building door, and he undertakes a quick trial run to ensure it works. Sure enough, the key fits and the door opens. The assassination is a go. The next day, Stashinsky takes a yellow pill meant to protect him from potassium cyanide he'd be using to kill Bandera with. His weapon is an improved version of the one he used two years ago, featuring two barrels which will allow him to ensure a deadly dose is delivered. The assassin makes his way to the Ludwig Bridge near the German Museum in Munich, and from there finds a place to observe the Ukrainian emigre office. He spots Bandera's car, and about an hour later, at 1130 hours, Stashinsky watches a man and a woman exit the office and enter Bandera's vehicle, driving down the street. He's not close enough to identify the man, but is convinced it's Bandera. Stashinsky decides to simply wait for Bandera at his home and takes a streetcar to the apartment building Bandera lives in under a fake name. He finds a place to sit and observe the street, and not long after, spots Bandera's car drive past him. Bandera, who is typically escorted by a bodyguard everywhere he goes, is completely alone. Now is the time to strike. Stashinsky watches Bandera drive into the apartment building's garage and quickly makes his way inside the building using his file down key. He heads up the stairs and takes a perch in between the ground and second floor. It's still early in the afternoon and the building is quiet, there's no foot traffic coming or going, perfect for an assassination. Suddenly there's the sound of a door opening somewhere above Stashinsky and two women bidding goodbye to each other. Stashinsky tries to calm his nerves and wills the woman to quickly move to the elevator and take her leave. She doesn't, she decides to take the stairs. Stashinsky grips the weapon hidden in his newspaper roll. It has two barrels, two charges. He could kill two people with it if need be. The woman draws nearer, and at the last second, Stashinsky decides against killing her. He moves down the stairs and begins to fiddle with the elevator button, pretending to be waiting for it. The woman passes him and exits the building. The moment the door closes behind her, Stashinsky curses silently and rushes back toward the stairs. But before he can take more than two steps toward the stairs, the front door once more opens. It's Bandera, and he's spotted Stashinsky. For one brief moment, the assassin fears that the game is up. Maybe Bandera will run, maybe he'll reach for his weapon. Stashinsky is only armed with the poison gun, useless except at point-blank range. Bandera would surely kill him before he could get that close. It's well known that the Ukrainian leader in exile always carries a firearm in a shoulder holster. The question racing through Stashinsky's mind is, does he recognize me? Did he spot me weeks ago as I was following him and he happened to glance over his shoulder directly at me? Will he remember my face? Bandera does not. He nods briefly at Stashinsky before turning his attention back to extricating his key from the front door. His arms are loaded with groceries and he's having trouble removing the key from the sticky lock. His back turned to the deadly Soviet assassin standing only a dozen feet away. Stashinsky makes his move, it's now or never. Walking to the door, Stashinsky grabs the front door knob as if to help Bandera. Doesn't it work? asks Stashinsky, causing Bandera to look directly at him. Yeah, it works, comes the reply. As Bandera turns to look and answer Stashinsky's question, he's met by both barrels of the poison gun. Two capsules of potassium cyanide burst at point-blank range in Bandera's face, and the Ukrainian leader staggers backwards. Groceries fall to the floor as Bandera struggles to free his pistol from his holster hidden under his jacket. It's too late for him, though. Stashinsky doesn't even wait to confirm Bandera's death. He walks out the door and closes it behind him as Bandera falls to the floor. The massive dose of poison takes only seconds to kill him. The police will find him with his hand still clutching at the weapon in its holster. Back in 1961 once more, the Americans still aren't buying it. A poison gas gun? Whoever heard of such a thing? What a load of hooey. 
The CIA agents don't believe Stashinsky or his stories, and make a recommendation to headquarters that he is useless as a double agent and is possibly a Soviet mole himself. His stories don't add up, and the CIA releases him to the West German intelligence service. The Germans, however, aren't as skeptical of Stashinsky's stories. They have Stashinsky walk them through a recreation of the murders and become increasingly convinced that he's the real deal, given his incredible familiarity with the murder scenes. Maybe he can be a valuable intelligence asset, but first he has to answer for his crimes. As a valuable asset, Stashinsky is jailed for only eight years. Shortly after his release, the CIA changes its mind on Stashinsky and brings him into the fold. They eventually provide new identities for him and his German wife and fly them to South Africa, where he's granted asylum. But not before he delivers a gold mine of intelligence to the West on Soviet operations. Abraham Lincoln, James Garfield, William McKinley, John F. Kennedy, all four fell to an assassin's bullet while President of the United States. But they weren't the only ones targeted, and some presidents actually survived more than one assassination attempt. Number 12. The Two for One Gerald Ford wasn't having an easy time of being the president. He was the only president not to be elected by the public, being appointed to fill the empty seat after the vice president resigned for corruption, only to have the president resign for corruption and then put him in the big chair. He also had a hostile Congress led by the opposition, and the world was largely in chaos at the time. But there were more dangers coming to him, twice in one month. The Manson family cult was terrorizing the United States, pulling off multiple senseless killings, but they had their biggest target in mind the president. Gerald Ford was visiting San Francisco, planning to head to the California State House, but danger was following him. An assassination threat had already been called in by an ex-convict, but he was quickly arrested. But in September 1976, someone else would strike. Lynette Squeaky Fromm had gotten involved with the Mansons early on, but wasn't involved in their notorious killings. She was obsessed with the environment and believed Ford was a danger to the health of the world. She also had some less than normal views about what caused environmental destruction, like the idea that redwood trees would fall because of automobile smoke. As Ford headed to the state capitol, Fromm was able to get within a few feet of him and pulled a gun. Having managed to get past security, she pulled the trigger and nothing happened because she neglected to chamber around. This makes some people wonder if she was pulling a stunt rather than attempting a true assassination, but no one was taking chances. She was quickly taken into custody. But it wouldn't be the only time Ford's life was in danger that month. Sarah Jane Moore didn't belong to any cults, but she was no less unstable. She was obsessed with kidnapping victim and armed robber Patty Hearst. Seventeen days after Fromm's assassination attempt, she attended a crowd across the street from Ford's hotel. She was over 40 feet away from Ford when she pulled a revolver and fired, but the sights she was using on the gun weren't properly equipped and she missed. As she raised her arm to fire again, she was tackled by former Marine Oliver Sippel, who restrained her and potentially saved Ford's life. She was arrested and Ford, undeterred, continued to make public appearances. Two disturbed women, but they had something else in common. Fromm pleaded not guilty and was convicted at trial, while Moore pleaded guilty, but both received the same sentence of life imprisonment. While at first they were both unrepentant, they maintained sterling disciplinary records in prison, a law requiring inmates who had served 30 years of a life sentence without discipline issues to be granted parole allowed both of them to get something highly rare for presidential assassins, a second chance. The two women were released from prison in 2007 and 2009, shortly after Gerald Ford's death of natural causes. Another president barely made it to the White House. Number 11. The Mad Bomber John F. Kennedy met a tragic end and the shot heard around the world, but whether you think there was one gunman or two, it wasn't the first time for the young president. He was a highly controversial candidate as only the second Roman Catholic nominated for president and the first to win, and some conspiracy theorists even thought that he would turn the United States over to the control of the Pope if he won. Where conspiracy theories go, unstable people follow, and one of those unstable men was Richard Paul Pavlik. A World War II veteran and postal worker with no family, he was known for being a local crank in Boston, where he would disrupt council meetings and complain about how the American flag was displayed, but he also held a deep and unabiding hatred for Catholics. And with one about to take control of the country, he decided to do something about it. Pavlik watched as the 1960 election went in Kennedy's favor and decided to take action. Whatever the plan, he made clear he didn't intend to come back. He turned over all his belongings to a local youth camp and drove off, but he didn't keep his intention secret. He started mailing weird postcards to his New Hampshire hometown, boasting that he would be known in a big way soon. The Secret Service got a hold of them 
them and discovered that the places Pavlik was mailing them from paralleled where Kennedy and his family had been staying in the lead-up to his inauguration. They also discovered that he had purchased large amounts of dynamite before heading for Palm Beach, one of Kennedy's last destinations. It was now a race against time. Pavlik loaded up his car with dynamite, planning to blow himself up along with Kennedy as the president-elect left for church. But as he did, he noticed something. Kennedy was accompanied by his wife and two kids, and as much as he hated the president-elect, he couldn't bring himself to kill his family. He drove off looking for another opportunity, but the Secret Service caught up with him before he could strike. Pavlik was arrested and taken to a mental hospital. He was indicted for the assassination attempt, but never went to trial and stayed at the hospital for several years. Ultimately, what saved Kennedy and let him take office was that his would-be assassin had just enough humanity left in him to not go through with it. Sometimes what separates an assassin and a failed assassin is luck and time. Number 10. The Superfan Ronald Reagan had no shortage of enemies when he took office. The arch-conservative actor-turned-politician was not only hated by the other side of the fence, but he had come into office boasting of taking a tough line on Russia and Iran, which made it all the more shocking when he was nearly killed three months after taking office, and it had nothing to do with his politics. Instead, it had to do with a movie that was released a short time earlier. John Hinckley Jr. was a disturbed man in his 20s who'd become obsessed with the teenage actress Jodie Foster after she appeared in the movie Taxi Driver, but he despaired, what would she want with a nobody like him? Clearly, the only answer was to become famous or infamous. He initially tried to stalk President Jimmy Carter, but was arrested for trespassing and illegal possession of a firearm. The FBI didn't flag him as a threat to the president, so he was free to start again with the next president. When Reagan was making a speech to the AFL-CIO representatives on March 30, 1981, Hinckley cased the hotel, and when Reagan exited to take a short walk to his car, Hinckley struck, firing six shots. They all missed the president, critically wounding Press Secretary James Brady and injuring a DC police officer. Hinckley fired again, hitting Reagan, but his aim was off because he was tackled by Secret Service agents. He had been caught, but Reagan was bleeding out. So, how did he survive? Hinckley didn't make any critical mistakes that made the assassination attempt fail. He planned effectively, got close to the president, and had the right weapon. What he didn't have was the ability to account for the advances in medical science. It had been almost 80 years since the last president had been hit in a survivable way, and both James Garfield and William McKinley died from post shooting complications. Reagan, meanwhile, got the best doctors in the world working on him in sterile conditions and was able to fully recover from his injuries. Ironically, this might have saved Hinckley's life because he was now an attempted assassin rather than a successful one. He went to a mental hospital instead of death row and was eventually released decades later after being declared cured. One might say this next assassin was nothing but a hound dog. Number 9. Elvis impersonator. When Barack Obama took office in 2009, the Secret Service was bracing for the worst. After all, the country's first black president was sure to bring out a whole host of racist would-be assassins, and certain elements would be spending a lot of time whipping up anger about what the liberal POTUS was sure to do. Many people were pleasantly surprised that no one took a shot at the president during his eight years, but that doesn't mean there weren't any plots to do so. The Secret Service was working overtime to make sure no one got close, and along the way they investigated many leads. Some turned out to be harmless cranks rattling on the internet, but others got a lot closer to reality, and one might have been one of the most bizarre assassination plots ever. It was 2013 when a letter addressed to the president was intercepted at a postal sorting facility. When it was investigated, something terrifying was discovered. It contained ricin, one of the deadliest poisons in the world. This potent neurotoxin has been used in terror attacks and is hard to treat once it hits its target. The poison letter also contained a ranting note claiming that there were missing pieces and threatened that someone would die. The FBI and Secret Service were on the case and they quickly zeroed in on Kevin Curtis, an Elvis impersonator from Tennessee who used the same sign-off as the note. I am KC and I approve this message. It seemed to be a slam dunk, and Curtis would soon be doing the jailhouse rock. But this case turned out to be more days of our lives than 24. Curtis was completely confused when interviewed. Not only did he not admit to sending the rice in, he kept on insisting that he didn't even like rice. The agents were used to playing dumb, but after a seven-hour interview, they were convinced Curtis wasn't playing. When Curtis was asked if he had any enemies, he quickly identified Everett Duchka, a self-described genius who had gotten into a bitter online rivalry with Curtis. And naturally, his response to being flamed on the internet was to assassinate the president and pin it on the Elvis impersonator. The rice never made it to President Obama, but that didn't help Dushka. He was quickly arrested and eventually sentenced to 25 years in prison, which puts that Twitter suspension for calling someone names into perspective. This next assassin was undone not by aim but by biology. Number 8. Falling Short 
It seems like most presidents enter office with some degree of hard feelings, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt was no different. The left-wing governor of New York won a massive majority amid the backdrop of the Great Depression, but many on the right feared he was about to turn the United States communist. There were even rumors that a cabal of powerful businessmen were planning to stage a coup before he could take office, so the Secret Service was on high alert. But the real danger came from somewhere they weren't looking. Giuseppe Zangara was an Italian immigrant and bricklayer who was a militant communist, and he wanted to strike against the leader of the biggest capitalist nation in the world. There was just one problem. Zangara planned to assassinate FDR as he was giving a speech in February 1933, only a month before he was to take office. Roosevelt was accompanied by Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak in Miami, Florida, when Zangara struck. But the problem was Zangara was only five feet tall. He needed a chair to get a clear shot at Roosevelt. And when he got off the first shot, the people around him pulled him down. He began firing wildly, hitting five people, including Cermak. But Roosevelt was completely unharmed and was able to get away. Zangara was arrested, but the seriously injured Cermak was taken to the hospital. But the story of the tiny assassin was far from over. Many of the would-be assassins were repentant and were confused when captured, but not Zangara. He boasted that he was there to kill kings and presidents and mocked the judge when he was sentenced to 80 years in prison for attempted murder. But there would be another tragic twist to the story when Cermak succumbed to his wounds 19 days later. Zangara was quickly indicted again and sentenced to the electric chair. He once again mocked the court and was executed only two weeks after Cermak's death, no doubt cursing his short stature. But did he truly work alone? Some people allege that Zangara's true target was actually Cermak and he was working for Chicago crime syndicates, but no hard evidence of this has surfaced. But a surprising number of assassination attempts have happened outside of U.S. borders. Number 7. Hunt abroad. Herbert Hoover's presidency was mostly consumed by domestic affairs, especially once the stock market crash hit. But before he took office, he had ambitions for foreign affairs. He kick-started his tenure as president-elect by launching a tour of Central and South America, which included a tour of the Andes Mountains. But as he was heading over to Argentina, a terror attack by anarchists nearly ended his presidency before it began. Severino de Giovanni, a radical figure in Argentina, planned to blow up Hoover's train with explosives. When they were caught, an itinerary of Hoover's train and explosives explosives were found, but no one was harmed. The Giovanni would become the most wanted man in Argentina. But the one person who seemed unconcerned by this? Herbert Hoover, who didn't want any news coverage of the attack because he feared it would alarm his wife. It wouldn't be the only time presidents were attacked abroad. Iran would become the site of one of the biggest hostage crises in history only a few years later, but in 1972 it was still a place where presidents could visit. But resistance to U.S. involvement was growing, and the People's Mujahideen of Iran wanted to make a statement. When Richard Nixon planned a visit to Tehran, the terror group struck, planting a bomb at the mausoleum of Reza Shah, the first military leader of modern Iran, where Nixon was supposed to visit. It went off, severely damaging the monument, but it had exploded less than an hour before Nixon's planned arrival. Was it bad timing, or did the group not want to bring down the wrath of the United States on them yet. It's not known, but this is believed to be the first assassination attempt on a president by an Islamist group. And even in the modern day, presidents aren't safe. It was 2005 and George W. Bush was a controversial president around the world. Newly re-elected, he had successfully deposed the Taliban from Afghanistan and Saddam Hussein from Iraq, for now. But many people hated his aggressive posture. One of those was Vladimir Arutyunyan, a Georgian national who hated Georgia's government for being a pawn of the United States. He waited in Tbilisi's Liberty Square for when Bush and Georgia's president were speaking together. He pulled a grenade, yanked the pin, and threw it toward the stage, only for it to not explode due to it being too tightly wrapped with a handkerchief. This slight malfunction turned a political international incident into something Bush didn't even learn about until after the speech. Arut Union went on the run and was eventually captured after killing a Georgian security officer and was sentenced to life in prison. But back in the US, some would-be assassins had much more ambitious plans. Number 6. The Bad Passenger who would want to harm Richard Nixon? Okay, so the controversial president definitely had enemies, and not just those on his enemy list. And if one man could have waited a little longer, he might have been rid of him anyway. But Samuel Bike was not a patient man. The army veteran grew up in poverty and suffered from mental illness, but no one took him all that seriously when he became obsessed with Nixon. He blamed the president for oppressing the poor and even sent him threatening messages, but the Secret Service dismissed him as not a threat. The core of his grudge? He was unable to get a loan from the Small Business Administration, and this led him to send rambling manifestations to everyone from Nixon to polio-crushing scientist Jonas Salk. Everyone assumed he was just a harmless crank. On February 22, 1974, they would be proven very wrong. Bike had been stalking Nixon since the beginning of the year and planned to assassinate him. But he didn't intend to use a gun. He intended to use a commercial airliner that he would turn into a missile. The target? The White House, while Nixon was occupying. 
Today, this would be impossible. Not only are the cockpits reinforced, but passengers can't bring a bottle of water through security, never mind a weapon. But in the 1970s, airport security was lax. Bike stole a friend's gun and built a makeshift bomb. After making one last rambling audio recording, he made his move, ambushing a policeman and charging into the Delta Airlines flight. When the pilots refused to fly him to the White House, he shot them and commandeered the plane, and a tense hostage situation began. There was just one problem with the plan. Bike now had no one to fly the plane. Regardless of how easy Hollywood makes it look, a random person couldn't take control of a plane without training, and the hostages Bike still had were unable or unwilling to help. This left him trapped on the runway and police fired shots at the cockpit. When they entered the plane, they found Bike dead and the attempted assassination of Nixon never got off the ground. Bike had named his plan Operation Pandora's Box, but it led to a lot of tragedy without any of the changes he wanted to achieve. With three people dead and the other pilot injured, it was one of the deadliest assassination attempts in U.S. history. But if he had waited less than six months, Nixon would have resigned the presidency in disgrace anyway. Sometimes an assassin underestimates their target. Number 5. Never underestimate a bull moose Theodore Roosevelt definitely had his enemies. Not only was the brash progressive hated by many powerful people for his policies, but he was now trying to return as president and upend the two-party system with his new bull moose party. But that wasn't a grievance John Schrank had with him. The German-born bar owner was not exactly right in the head, and believed that the late president William McKinley was talking to him. McKinley had been assassinated with Roosevelt as his vice president, and Schrank believed that Roosevelt meeting the same fate would avenge him. And as Roosevelt traveled to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to campaign, Schrank made his move. But Roosevelt was no ordinary president. Roosevelt was famous, and infamous, for his daring deeds and larger-than-life personality. The man was a war hero and could shrug off pain quite easily. When Roosevelt waved to the crowd, Schrank stepped forward and fired, and Roosevelt was seemingly unhit, even intervening to prevent the crowd from killing Schrank. The would-be assassin was captured. Roosevelt headed to the speech, and only a few people knew he had actually been hit. The bullet had been derailed by an eyeglass case and a thick notepad containing the text of Roosevelt's speech. It had lodged in his chest muscle rather than penetrating his vital organs, and Roosevelt was no stranger to being shot. So he knew the difference between a flesh wound and a mortal wound. There was only one thing left to do, give his speech. It became one of the most famous moments in campaign history, as Roosevelt opened his speech by letting the crowd know he had been shot, and that it took more than that to kill a bull moose. Roosevelt's grit amazed the crowd, and his opponents even suspended their campaigns to give him time to recover. A quick talk with Schrank made it clear that the man was very mentally unwell, and with Roosevelt recovered, everyone quickly decided it would be best for him to spend the rest of his life in a mental asylum. Roosevelt did not win the presidential election, because the only thing more powerful than an assassin's bullet was the hold of the two party system, and doctors never removed the bullet, with Roosevelt carrying it in his chest muscle for the rest of his life. But there was one president who had an even wilder response to an assassination attempt. Number 4. Old Hickory's Wrath if there was one president you didn't want to pick a fight with, it was Andrew Jackson. The hard-nosed ex-soldier was an experienced duelist who had reportedly killed several people before he became president. But that didn't stop Richard Lawrence, a house painter who was convinced Jackson was responsible for many of his woes. Something most of these assassins have in common. They have an inflated opinion of how often the president thinks about them. He quit his job, behaved erratically, and became convinced that he was actually a long-lost King of England. Why wasn't he receiving his rightful due? Well, obviously it was because Jackson was personally keeping it from him by not establishing a national bank. Clearly, there was only one thing to do. Lawrence was viewed by most as an eccentric madman who wanted to be referred to as King Richard. No one thought he was dangerous, and this was before there had ever been a presidential assassination attempt. The president barely had any security, so Lawrence was able to stalk Jackson easily. Carrying two pistols, he staked out a position near Jackson's path at a funeral of a congressman, stepped out, and fired. Or rather, tried to fire. The gun jammed. Lawrence quickly grabbed his second pistol, and it jammed as well. Was it the worst luck in the world? Most historians believe the humid weather in South Carolina that day might have affected the old-fashioned pistols. One way or another, Jackson was no longer the one in danger. As soon as he realized what happened, the president immediately grabbed his cane and began savagely beating this would-be assassin. It took the crowd, including Congressman Davy Crockett, to separate the two and restrain Lawrence. Knowing Jackson, they might have just saved his life. Lawrence was put on trial and proceeded to turn the entire courtroom into a sideshow, where he claimed he didn't recognize the court and he was the only one with the right to pass judgment. It wasn't a surprise when the jury quickly found him not guilty by reason of insanity, and the presidential assassin went to a mental asylum for the rest of his life. But the plus side of that? Andrew Jackson probably can't get to him there. This next attempt had effects that rippled for decades. Number 3. The Gulf Plot 
George H.W. Bush had lost re-election due to the economy, but he still had one accomplishment to fall back on. He had successfully defended Kuwait from Iraqi invasion and was seen as a hero there. Three months after he left office, he was invited back to Kuwait to speak at their university. However, it wouldn't be a smooth visit. Before he arrived, Kuwaiti authorities worked overtime and captured a cell of 14 men from Kuwait and Iraq who had smuggled bombs near the site. The plan was to detonate a car bomb as Bush arrived and kill him, but that wasn't the shocking part. Two of the men confessed and implicated Saddam Hussein the leader of Iraq as their boss. The Iraqi dictator had been allowed to stay in office after the Gulf War, but he apparently held a grudge. That was enough for President Clinton to retaliate with missile strikes against the Iraqi government building. But someone else held a grudge for much longer. When George Bush's son became president eight years later, he would eventually launch his own war on Iraq and take Saddam Hussein out of office. But one assassination attempt literally got to the president's doorstep. Number 2. The Siege on Blair House Harry Truman hadn't had an easy presidency. First, he had to take over for the late FDR in the last days of World War II and make the decision to drop the atomic bombs. Then, he had won an election as a heavy underdog, complete with an unforgettable newspaper headline. And worst of all, he now had to move. The White House was under renovation, and he and his wife would be staring at the Blair House, the president's guest house in Washington, D.C. It was smaller, but it was also a lot less accessible, and that would spell trouble, because a group that had been looking to make itself known was about to strike. And the threat would be coming from the Caribbean? Puerto Rico had been a U.S. territory for a long time, and the island was split. Some wanted to remain a U.S. territory, others wanted statehood or a negotiated settlement. But some wanted their independence now, by any means necessary. The National Party of Puerto Rico hadn't had much success in elections on the island, so they were leading an insurgency on the island, one they were about to take to the mainland in a big way. Oscar Collazo and Gracilio Torresola, two militants, decided that killing the president was the ideal way to declare war. And with the president at Blair House, they decided to make their move. After training in firearms, they boarded the train to Washington, D.C. They were about to go down in history, but not the way they intended. While President Truman was napping, Collazo tried to ambush a policeman on the steps of Blair House. A Secret Service agent joined the fight and they successfully shot and wounded Collazo, but that allowed for Torresola to get closer, where he ambushed a police officer and fatally shot him. The only presidential security officer killed in action. However, the mortally wounded officer was able to successfully kill Torresola before succumbing to his own wounds, and Truman was only aware of the assassination attempt at the very end. Collazo survived his wounds and was sentenced to death at trial, but it was commuted to life in prison by Truman himself. Surprisingly, he would be released from prison in 1979 when Jimmy Carter commuted his sentence. The debate over Puerto Rico isn't settled to this day. One president may not have faced the deadliest assassination attempts, but no one faced more. Number 1. Who keeps trying to kill Bill Clinton? Bill Clinton didn't have the most enemies of any president when he came into office, being a moderate Arkansas governor without too much of a national profile. Well, except for maybe his wife, who probably came after him with a frying pan a few times after his affairs came to light. But that didn't keep him safe. He found himself at the center of one bizarre assassination attempt after another. It all started about a year after he took office, when Roland Jean Barbour plotted to take a shot at Clinton while he was jogging. He went to Washington, D.C. to put his plan into motion, but the retired military officer hadn't done his recon. Clinton was on a state visit to Russia at the time, and the unstable gunman's plot was exposed without him ever getting to fire a shot. He was sentenced to five years in prison for his plot, although it's hard to call it much of a plot. But the next plot would be much more explosive. Frank Eugene Corder was a truck driver and petty criminal who had failed attempt at a military career and no apparent grudge against the president. So what possessed him to steal a single-engine plane while drunk and fly it into the White House? He tried to crash the plane directly into the wall of the White House, but instead flew it into the lawn and crashed, killing the hapless assassin instantly. Fortunately, Clinton wasn't just saved by bad aim, he wasn't even in the White House at the time, staying at the Blair House due to renovations. And it wouldn't be the only time the White House was targeted. Francisco Duran grew up in poverty in New Mexico, and like the last two would-be assassins, he had military experience. But he didn't get it the usual way. He was ordered to enlist in the army or go to jail for Grand Theft Auto by a judge. Shockingly, it didn't work out. He was court-martialed for hitting a woman with his car while drunk driving and served prison time. A year after his release, he showed up at the White House in a trench coat and started firing a semi-automatic weapon at the building. He was quickly captured and no one was hurt, but this was only six weeks after Corder's fiery crash. What was going on at the Clinton White House? No one knows what drove these three twisted veterans to all make attempts on the life of Bill Clinton, but they wouldn't be the only ones. Halfway across the world, someone else was plotting against the president, a Saudi national by the name of Osama bin Laden. He would even mastermind an attempt to bomb Clinton's motorcade in the Philippines in 1996, but like the previous attempts, Clinton managed to survive without a scratch. No wonder they called him Slick Willie. Sometimes all it takes is one angry man with a gun or a knife to change the course of history. These are the 10 most shocking assassinations in human history. Number 10. Benazir Bhutto 
Benazir Bhutto was one of the first women to ever lead a Muslim country. She served as Prime Minister of Pakistan not once but twice. The head of the Pakistani People's Party, she had many supporters and many powerful enemies. Her father had previously been Prime Minister before being ousted and executed in a military coup. When she succeeded him ten years later, she would face corruption charges and return to exile but would return to Pakistan to run again and negotiate cooperation with the current leader, Pervez Musharraf. It would be a deadly mistake. She had been targeted for assassination before and knew her life was in danger. Only two months after she returned to Pakistan, a massive bombing nearly killed her. Thankfully, she survived, but 180 people didn't. She tried to obtain additional security but had been unable to by December 27, 2007, when she attended a political rally in Rawalpindi. As she was meeting supporters, an explosion rocked the crowd. Bhutto retreated to her vehicle and prepared to drive away when suddenly a man with a bomb attached to himself exploded right near the car as an assassin fired multiple shots. The car drove Bhutto to the hospital, but she was declared dead less than an hour after arrival. And this was only the start of the story. At first, reports came in that Bhutto had died of gunshots or shrapnel from the attack, but the Interior Ministry came up with a surprising claim. She'd actually died when her head hit the sunroof during the bombing. Many say that didn't make sense. Was Musharraf's government trying to cover up the truth? The assassination was blamed on the terror group Al-Qaeda, but many suspected that Bhutto's many enemies in the government might have had a hand in it. Arguably, Pakistan's most iconic politician was dead and that left a power vacuum in the country's political system ever since. This next assassination saw a young leader cut down in his prime, and that led to decades of controversy afterward. Number 9. Malcolm X As the 1960s dawned, the civil rights movement was dominated by two men, the diplomatic Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and the fiery Malcolm X. The Muslim minister and activist had risen from a troubled childhood and joined the Nation of Islam in prison, becoming one of its most prominent faces. His advocacy for black liberation gained him many supporters, but in the 1960s he became disillusioned with the Nation of Islam's unique brand of the faith and started practicing a more faithful type of Sunni Islam. This led to radicals in his own group turning on him, and some days it was hard to tell who wanted him dead more, white racists or the Nation of Islam radicals. But one was about to break through. The threats escalated as the leader of the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, called for Malcolm X to be beheaded. His house was burned down under mysterious circumstances, but he didn't let it deter him. On February 21, 1965, he spoke to a large gathering in Manhattan. Suddenly, there was a scuffle in the crowd and a man burst forward and shot Malcolm X with a sawed-off shotgun. As the minister collapsed, two other men came forward and began shooting with handguns, hitting him repeatedly. Malcolm X was rushed to a nearby hospital and pronounced dead, with a shocking 31 total bullet wounds between the three guns. A manhunt was about to begin. The first assassin, Talmadge Hayer, was captured and beaten by the crowd. Witnesses soon identified the two other assassins who were also arrested. But at trial, Hayer confessed and claimed the two other men were innocent. The jury didn't find the testimony of a confessed killer credible and convicted all three. All three served decades in prison but survived to be paroled in the 2000s, and in 2021 the District Attorney of New York announced that the two latter men had been wrongly convicted. Which begs the question, was this truly a hit job by Nation of Islam radicals or was there more more powerful figures involved. He wasn't the only leader assassinated by his own people. Number 8. Isaac Rabin Ever since the State of Israel had been established in 1948, after the conclusion of the War of Independence, the small country had faced conflict first at the hands of its neighbors and later with the Palestinian residents of the region, many of whom had been fighting against the Israeli occupation since Israel reclaimed more territory in the conclusion of the 1967 war. Terror attacks led to Israeli military raids and the cycle continued. But one man was determined to make a change. Yitzhak Rabin, the fifth prime minister of Israel, had taken a huge political risk to negotiate a peace deal with Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, and both sides hoped it would lead to the end of the conflict, but it wasn't to be. Rabin had made many prominent enemies as a result of his peace deal, with radicals on both the Israeli and Palestinian sides condemning the pact. Right-wing Israelis were engaging in street protests and Rabin decided to personally attend an anti-violence rally to show his solidarity with his allies. After speaking at the rally, Rabin walked towards his car and a solitary man stepped out, firing two shots with a pistol at the Prime Minister. They drove the wounded leader to the hospital where the surgeons were unable to save him after surgery. The assassin was arrested at the scene and many speculated that this might have been 
a terror attack to derail the peace process. It was, but the reasoning behind the attack shocked everyone. The assassin was identified as Yigal Amir, a law student and right-wing extremist who opposed any concessions toward the Palestinians and viewed Rabin as an enemy of the Jewish people. He would be sentenced to life in prison, but the fallout from his actions would span decades. Rabin's successor, Shimon Peres, would lose the next election and be replaced by far-right leader Benjamin Netanyahu. Without his negotiating partner, Arafat would once again become radicalized, and less than a decade later, a new surge in terror attacks destroyed any hopes that the conflict could be ended peacefully. This next assassination wasn't so shocking for the why, but the how and the where. Number 7. Alexander Litvinenko Alexander Litvinenko was a former federal security official in Russia who met the same fate as many others when he fell out of favor with the government. In 1998, he faced prosecution for revealing state secrets, but managed to flee to England where he began telling the government everything, revealing shocking details about the corruption of the Russian state. Some of his allegations were extreme and were never proven, such as accusing the Russians of organizing many of the worst terror attacks on their soil as false flags to justify wars. But his old enemy Boris Yeltsin would soon die and be succeeded by the more ruthless Vladimir Putin, and Putin was infamous for how he dealt with his opponents. In 2006, Litvinenko made another public accusation against Putin, claiming that he had been behind the death of a prominent Russian journalist, Anna Politkovskaya, who had been killed in what looked like a random attack in her apartment elevator. And only two weeks later, he fell severely ill. As he was hospitalized, his condition got worse and worse and doctors had no idea why. As he was breathing his last breath, he stated to officers that he believed that Putin had found a way to assassinate him from the other side of the continent. Before he died, photos were released of the dying man and the public was horrified. Litvinenko died on November 1st, but that would only be the beginning of the mystery. The investigation continued and while doctors weren't able to find any clues, an international team was soon assembled, one that specialized in radioactive weapons. They found polonium trails around London which indicated that someone had used a highly radioactive isotope to target Litvinenko in London multiple times before successfully poisoning him. They eventually zeroed in on two prominent Russian businessmen and politicians who had traveled to the UK around the time and had close ties to Putin, the kind of ties that could be used to compel someone to pull off an assassination on another country's soil. What was most shocking about the case wasn't that one man died, it was that it indicated that for Putin's enemies no part of the world was safe. But what could drive someone to assassinate the world's most famous pacifist? Number 6. Mahatma Gandhi It had been a trying time for India. The country had just gained independence from Britain years earlier, which was accompanied by the difficult partition of India that split the old colony into majority Hindu India and majority Muslim Pakistan. But amid it all was the country's guiding force, the tireless independence and anti-violence activist Mahatma Gandhi. The leader of the Indian National Congress since 1921, he was known for his humility and willing to suffer for his cause, which included extended hunger strikes against British oppression. He was imprisoned multiple times but lived to see his beloved country gain its independence. But he wouldn't live past 1948. Gandhi had moved to Delhi to try to calm tensions in the wake of the partition, and many Hindu activists in the area were enraged that so much territory had been given away. One of those was Nathuram Gotsi, a resident of the Deccan region who had been known for his rebellion campaigns against the local Muslim ruler. Like Gandhi, he also spent time in prison for his civil disobedience, but unlike Gandhi, he didn't come out of prison convinced of the worthiness of non-violence. He came out bound on revenge, and he was disgusted by what he perceived as Gandhi's betrayal. The leader was currently on a hunger strike to convince India to release promised funds to Pakistan, but Godsi wouldn't let him reach the end of that hunger strike. Gandhi was staying at a local temple, and Godsi and his accomplices plotted how best to reach him. They first tried to throw a grenade at Gandhi when he was giving his speech, but missed, and the crowd prevented him from trying again. The 78-year-old Gandhi continued to go about his life until Godzi ambushed him on January 30th and shot him four times. The elderly Gandhi was mortally wounded, and Godzi was captured by the crowd. He confessed that he didn't feel a shred of guilt for his actions and was executed only a year after his crime. Most of the public was still in shock. They knew Godzi was known for his strong beliefs, but few could have predicted that he would go so far as to prove them. This next assassination was much more predictable. Number 5. Reinhard Heydrich the Nazis were known for their brutal rules they placed upon occupied territories. As countries including Poland and Czechoslovakia were conquered, they were put under Nazi leadership. Citizens were conscripted into slave labor, minorities were deported and murdered, and national coffers were emptied as the citizens starved. One of the masterminds of this was Reinhard Heydrich, Hitler's commander of the Reich Security Main Office. Not only was he key in the creation of the Holocaust, but he served as acting governor of the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, which included the conquered Czechoslovakia. 
but the Czechs had something to say about that. The Nazis were notoriously well protected and none of Hitler's top officials had been successfully targeted during the war. But this operation was different. Not only was it organized by the Czechoslovakia government in exile, but they received training from the British Special Operations Division to ensure everything went to plan. Preparation for the assassination lasted almost a year, and a new weapon was developed, an armor-piercing grenade. The agents were covertly sent to Prague, and on May 27, 1942, Heydrich sent out on his daily commute. His car was ambushed by one man with a gun, and Heydrich ordered his driver to stop instead of fleeing. The armor-piercing grenade was thrown at Heydrich's car after after which a gunfight ensued, resulting in the Nazi officer being mortally wounded. It was the biggest blow against the Nazi war machine yet, but it would come at a heavy cost. This was a massive embarrassment for Hitler, and he wanted revenge. The initial plans he drew up involved killing tens of thousands of Czech citizens, but the Nazis needed the production of goods in the region to stay high. So instead, mass arrests were ordered, and thousands were ultimately killed. The assassins went on the run, with the Nazis in hot pursuit. And while it would be three more years before Hitler's regime ultimately fell, the death of Reinhard Heydrich showed the world one important thing. As protected as Hitler's inner circle was, they were not invincible. This next assassination would go down in history because of its target. Number 4. James A. Garfield Garfield had only been in office for three months and was seen as a fairly generic president. He had been elected on the platform of normalcy and maintaining the status quo. No one expected for him to have any political enemies. His vice president, Chester A. Arthur, also maintained a low profile, and no one would have expected him to be targeted by an assassin. But it turns out there was a man out there with a grudge against the inoffensive president. Charles Guiteau didn't fit the profile of a presidential assassin. He was a writer and a lawyer who was actually a supporter of Garfield's campaign and revised a speech in favor of him at one point, and in his mind he believed that was the key to Garfield's victory. Clearly, he should have been rewarded for this with a consulship, maybe to Paris. He wrote several times to Garfield demanding his due and was ignored. That led him to Washington, D.C., where he became increasingly poor as he fell deeper into insanity. As Garfield was set to depart Washington on vacation, Guiteau ambushed him at the train station and shot him twice. Guiteau was arrested and Garfield was tended to by doctors. He was severely wounded, but the gunshots didn't seem fatal. However, both the president and the assassin would be the victims of some seriously bad luck. One of the bullets had only grazed Garfield, but the other was lodged inside him. This led to months of strange treatments as doctors tried to find and remove it. Garfield's condition was unstable during this time, and he struggled to keep down solid foods. He lived almost three months before eventually dying from his injuries, and most historians believe this was the fault of the treatments he endured rather than the initial bullet wounds. But the fact remained that the president was dead, and Guiteau had shot him, which turned a first-degree murder case into a capital crime case. The hapless, deluded assassin would plead insanity, not a big stretch, but the jury didn't buy it, and Guiteau would make history as the first first presidential assassin to be executed. But this assassination was eclipsed by one that came before it. Number 3. Abraham Lincoln It was probably the most famous assassination of all time. Abraham Lincoln was one of the most beloved and most hated presidents in U.S. history. His determination to keep the Union intact and later end slavery made him many enemies in the South, something that continued after he had secured the surrender of the Confederacy. As he battled to pass an amendment and slavery once and for all, a plot was brewing. That wasn't the shock, but the circumstances of the assassination would shake the entire country again. Because his assassin was a household name. Imagine if Cary Grant really, really hated FDR, hated him enough to try to kill him. That was the situation with Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth. He wasn't just a die-hard Confederacy supporter and noted racist, he was one of the most acclaimed and famous stage actors of the mid-1800s. Lincoln and his wife were watching a play at Ford's Theater when Booth took advantage of a lapse in the president's security entered his box, and shot him in the back of the head before leaping off the balcony. He was injured but managed to escape, starting one of the biggest manhunts in American history. The assassination would have some of the most far-reaching consequences in American history. Booth would eventually be cornered and shot by police. There would be no trial this time, at least not of him, but many co-conspirators were captured and put on trial. The owner of the tavern where the plot was hatched was executed, and even a doctor who treated Booth's broken leg wound up in prison. But it couldn't undo what Booth had done, especially since Lincoln's new vice president, Andrew Johnson, was a known sympathizer toward the South's cause and undid many of Lincoln's reconstruction policies. It's likely that Booth's blood grudge may have set back civil rights many decades. But one of the most shocking political assassinations was also one of the first. Number 2. Julius Caesar Julius Caesar was a good emperor, at least in terms of expansion and prestige. His reign saw the empire rapidly grow in size and wealth, and many people in the public were happy to let him take whatever he needed to rule effectively. But it soon became clear he wasn't just expanding his power, he was seeking to become the sole voice of Rome. 
When the Roman Senate ordered him to disband his army, he refused and was soon declared dictator in perpetuity. He frequently disrespected the checks and balances of the government and seemed to be growing closer and closer to declaring himself as the king of Rome. Many in his inner circle were even starting to worry. After all, if he was getting close to putting the Senate out of a job, what would happen to them after? And the conspiracy would be started by those close to him. Cassius Longinus was one of the first to realize that something needed to be done about Caesar, and he soon recruited his brother-in-law, Marcus Brutus. They knew they had to strike soon, and they pulled in other powerful men to the conspiracy. They even considered recruiting the famous orator Cicero, but decided he was too cautious and too old. It was decided that they would ambush Caesar at one of his Senate meetings on the Ides of March. Of course, this was ancient Rome, no guns available, which meant that conspirators would have to get up close and personal. The attack would go down in history. The sheer scope of the plot would become clear when all the conspirators drew their knives. Caesar was stabbed 23 times in total, but an autopsy indicated that only one of them was fatal. The conspiracy was successful, but the larger goal was not achieved. Caesar's successors would continue in his footsteps, and public shock at the assassination led to less resistance to the growing dictatorship. In the end, Rome's day as a republic would soon be done, and the Roman Empire would dawn. A fascination over Caesar's fate would spawn a Shakespeare play and countless books, movies, and dramas. But no assassination had more shocking details than this final one. Number 1. John F. Kennedy The youngest president ever elected, John F. Kennedy gained the support of many Americans with his progressive policies, and as the first Catholic president he had many bitter enemies. Kennedy had survived an assassination plot as president-elect and had recently guided the country through a nuclear standoff in the Caribbean. But as he arrived in Dallas for a tour, history was about to repeat itself. Three presidents had previously been assassinated here, and security wasn't airtight. The biggest flaw being that the president would be able to sit in an open-roofed car and wave to the public. All the previous assassins had been close-quarter shooters, but not this one. Lee Harvey Oswald didn't seem to fit the profile of an assassin, but the U.S. Marine had been radicalized and had even defected to the Soviet Union at one point. He set up his sniper rifle in the Texas School Book Depository and waited to fire the shot that was heard around the world. Kennedy was killed immediately, and the Texas governor in the car with him was wounded. He would escape, killing a Dallas police officer in a confrontation, but he was eventually apprehended. But there was one more shocking twist to the assassination, because it came as a two-for-one deal. Two days later, Oswald was being held in the Dallas Police Department while plans were made to move him to another jail. While he was being transported, Jack Ruby, a local nightclub owner with mob ties, stepped out and shot Oswald once in the chest, killing him. The infamous assassin would never see a trial, and Ruby was arrested without incident. Some called him a hero, while others wanted him prosecuted for interrupting the course of justice. He would ultimately be convicted and end up dying in prison while awaiting a new trial on appeal, a month after being diagnosed with cancer. Was he an angry citizen wanting revenge for the president, or was there a larger conspiracy trying to silence Oswald before he could speak at trial? John Wilkes Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald, Charles Guiteau, and Leon Shogos. Their names went down in infamy as the men who killed presidents, but other would-be assassins faded into history because their targets survived. These are the 10 failed assassinations that didn't quite hit their target. Number 10. Canadian Prime Minister's Close Call Jean Chrétien was the Prime Minister of Canada for 10 years, a well-regarded Liberal Party mainstay. He didn't have many enemies that people knew of, but one young man from Quebec was developing a disturbing obsession. Andre Dallaire was a a paranoid schizophrenic who had quit his job after stealing from the grocery store and soon disappeared off the map. When he next serviced, he arrived at 24 Sussex Drive, the home of the Canadian Prime Minister, holding a pocket knife, and quickly broke in while Chrétien and his wife were sleeping. They seemed like sitting ducks, but Dallier made one miscalculation. The would-be assassin hadn't planned out his kill too well. With only one small weapon, he was surprised when Aline Chrétien spotted him, woke her husband, and locked them both in the bedroom. She called the police and tried to convince the groggy Prime Minister that she wasn't dreaming about the intruder. Dallier never tried to break down the door and was wandering around the house when the police arrived. He was found not guilty due to reason of insanity and committed to a mental asylum before being released to a group home. The Chrétiens were unharmed, but the incident led to many people arguing that Canada's PM needed better security. But this next assassination attempt was much more high-tech. Number 9. Khalid Michel's Bad Earache Khalid Michel had made himself no shortage of enemies by 1997. The leader of the Palestinian militant group Hamas, he was seen as an avowed enemy of Israel and a 
born in the side of Jordan, where he lived since fleeing Israel after the Six-Day War. He organized frequent terror attacks against Israel from the safety of Jordan, culminating in the bombing of Jerusalem Market that killed 16. Israel's security forces quickly responded, sending Mossad agents into Jordan to assassinate Michel, their weapon of choice, an aerosol poison that they sprayed into his ear. The only problem? Getting back out. The poison worked and Michel quickly became very sick. It looked like the Mossad operation would be successful, but the agents had been captured by Michel's bodyguards, and so began a tense negotiation between Israel and Jordan. King Hussein of Jordan demanded Israel turn over the antidote, while Israel demanded the release of their agents. It took the intervention of US President Bill Clinton to convince Israel's Prime Minister to turn over the antidote before the recent peace deal between the two countries fell apart, and Michel lived, only to be expelled from Jordan several years later by Hussein's successor. Almost 20 years earlier, the United States was nearly upended by a movie fan? Number 8. Ronald Reagan's Cliffhanger When Ronald Reagan swept into office in a 1980 landslide, he was already controversial as one of the most conservative presidents in modern history. But his closest call with death didn't come from a political enemy. It came from a deranged man named John Hinckley, who was obsessed with teen movie star Jodie Foster. He wanted to be noticed by her, so he decided to become famous in 1981 by stalking President Reagan and ambushing him after a speech, shooting him along with his press secretary, a policeman, and a Secret Service agent. It was a tragically familiar scenario, but with an unexpected outcome. It had only been 18 years since the last presidential assassination, but medical science had advanced a lot. Reagan's injuries were serious, including a punctured lung and internal bleeding, but surgeons were able to save his life and he left the hospital two weeks later. Ultimately, none of the four victims died, but the controversy over this incident was far from over. Hinckley would later be found not guilty by reason of insanity and would spend the next 36 years in a mental hospital before being declared rehabilitated. But several hundred years earlier, a much larger assassination plot was hatched. Number 7. Of Gunpowder, Treason, and Plot It was 1605 and King James I sat on the throne of England, with no small amount of controversy. The country's Roman Catholics had been repressed ever since the ascent of the Church of England, and a militant group sought to overthrow the king and replace him with his nine-year-old daughter as a Catholic queen. While the plot was led by Robert Catsby, it would be more associated with one radical member, the veteran and explosives expert Guy Fox. The target of their plot? The entire structure of government, by blowing up the House of Lords at the ceremonial opening of Parliament. But sometimes the biggest plot can be undone by a single spanner in the works. It was October 26, 1605, when William Parker, the fourth Baron of Monteagle, received an anonymous letter explaining the entire plot. Was it a conspirator with second thoughts, or a loyalist who stumbled upon the plot? It's never been discovered, but when the House of Lords was searched, they found Fox guarding 36 barrels of gunpowder, more than enough to obliterate the entire building. While the conspirators attempted to flee London, several were shot and killed by pursuing officers, and the others, including the notorious Fox, were executed for treason. And even 500 years later, the anniversary of the foiling of the plot has become a popular British festival. The next assassination was foiled by an unfortunate fact of nature. Number 6. FDR's Short Shot Franklin Delano Roosevelt had just been elected in a landslide, and many feared he would be a radical left-wing president. Rumors abounded of a planned coup by bankers and businessmen, but only one assassination plot actually emerged, and it was anything but a well-organized plot. Giuseppe Zangara was a struggling Italian immigrant who suffered from chronic pain and couldn't keep a job. The exact nature of his grudge against Roosevelt is unknown, but 17 days before before the president-elect's inauguration, he attended a speech of his in Miami while carrying a revolver with the intent to kill. But he needed an accessory, and that would be his undoing. Zangara was a short man, only five feet tall, and he needed a clear shot at Roosevelt, so he pulled out an old metal folding chair and stood on top of it to get a clean shot. As soon as he fired his first shot, bystanders grabbed him and yanked him down. Zangara fired wildly into the crowd, hitting five people, none of them the president-elect Roosevelt. The one fatality? The mayor of Chicago, Anton Cernak. While Zangara hadn't killed the president, he did kill a prominent politician, and that was enough to send him to the electric chair after only 10 days on death row. But FDR wasn't the only Roosevelt to have a close call with death. Number 5. The Longest Speech of Theodore Roosevelt It was 1912, and a former president, Theodore Roosevelt, was attempting a comeback. Always controversial, Roosevelt had made many new enemies with his decision to leave the Republicans and start his own bull moose party. But his deadliest enemy wouldn't be a political enemy, but a former saloon keeper named John Schrank. Schrank had hallucinated the late President William McKinley in a dream who supposedly told him to avenge his assassination by going after Roosevelt, who ascended to the presidency after McKinley's death. And so Schrank stalked Roosevelt to the Gilpatrick Hotel, where Roosevelt was having dinner before a speech. As Roosevelt waved to the crowd, Schrank took aim and fired, but he underestimated the grit of Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt was hit, with the bullet passing through his eyeglass case and lodging in his chest, but not deep enough to penetrate any vital organs. Bleeding but still conscious, Roosevelt kept the crowd from lynching Schrank, then assured his bodyguards that he was fine and asked to be driven to his speech. He spoke
spoke for 90 minutes before agreeing to receive medical attention, including the famous line, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you fully understand that I have just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Interviews with Schrenk after the assassination attempt indicated that he had delusions of grandeur and he was declared to be unfit to stand trial and institutionalized until his death in 1943. But one would-be assassin had a much more destructive plan. Number 4. Terror from the Air Samuel Bick was an unlikely choice for a would-be presidential assassin. A former army veteran who was honorably discharged and a father of four children, he seemed like a stable man. But after a divorce and financial troubles, he spiraled into depression. He became obsessed with the Nixon administration and blamed them for his financial woes, even sending them threatening letters over being denied for a loan. But the Secret Service considered him harmless and dismissed the case. He turned out to be anything but harmless in 1974. Bick planned to assassinate Nixon, but he didn't want to just be another gunman. He decided to hijack a plane and crash it into the White House. He stole a revolver from a friend, built a homemade bomb, and made several audio tapes full of rambling justifications for his attack. At the Baltimore, Washington International Airport, he shot and killed a policeman before boarding the Delta flight to Atlanta. He would then shoot the pilots when they told him he couldn't take off yet, and then ordered a passenger to fly the plane. Before he could take off, he was surrounded by police. Police shot and wounded him, and Bick shot himself before they could arrest him. In the end, one of America's most ambitious would-be assassins was undone by one simple problem. It's not that easy to steal a plane, but sometimes a much smaller problem can derail an assassination. Number 3. The Double Unlucky Assassin It was 1835, and the relatively new United States had not seen an assassination attempt. That was about the change with the ascent of a controversial populist Andrew Jackson to the presidency. Richard Lawrence was a simple house painter, but over the years, his behavior changed to become more violent and erratic. Many speculate that the chemicals in the paint might have contributed to his mental illness, and he became convinced that he was owed money from the U.S. government. He blamed Andrew Jackson's opposition to a national bank, but in reality, it was more likely because he wasn't actually an English king who died centuries ago, as he believed. But these delusions grew more severe as he started stalking Jackson until he planned to ambush him at a congressman's funeral with two pistols. But he was about to become very famous for a different reason. In 1835, presidential security was rudimentary, and Lawrence was easily able to get close to Jackson. He stepped out, aimed his pistol, and fired at the president, and the gun misfired. He quickly drew a second pistol, only for it to misfire as well. Old guns were vulnerable to moisture, and the weather that day was damp. But Lawrence had no chance to fix the problem, because President Jackson began beating him with his cane. The crowd eventually intervened, but it's not clear whose life they were saving. At his trial, Lawrence was obviously not well, still insisting he was Richard III, and quickly sent to an insane asylum for the rest of his life. This next assassination attempt was right out of an action movie. Number 2. The Wild Ride of Charles de Gaulle Charles de Gaulle had a long and storied career in French politics, which was approaching its last act in the 1960s. But he made some powerful enemies when he decided to accept Algeria's declaration of independence and end its status as a French colony. The OAS, or Organisation de l'Armée Secrète, was a far-right parliamentary group formed during the Algerian War, and they saw de Gaulle as a traitor. They made several attempts on de Gaulle's life, but it was the third that would become the most famous. Led by prominent French veteran and engineer Jean-Bastien Thierry, who served as lookout, three shooters armed with machine guns followed de Gaulle's entourage and opened fire. What happened next was one of the craziest escapes from an assassination in history. High-powered automatic weapons strafed de Gaulle's car with bullets, along with countless nearby shops. But de Gaulle, his wife, and his entire entourage escaped unharmed, despite 14 bullet holes being found in the car. De Gaulle would credit his tough-as-nail Citroën DS car. But whether it was the car or just good luck, he would serve several more years as France's president. Bastien Thierry, meanwhile, would go on before a military tribunal and ultimately become the final French convict to face a firing squad. Many failed assassinations spared a prominent leader, but this final one had the chance to end a world war. Number 1. The July 20th Plot It was 1944, and it was becoming clear that Nazi Germany was losing the war. The German war machine put the blame squarely in one direction, the absolute dictator of Germany, Adolf Hitler. Some of his top military men believed Hitler's crimes against humanity were a disgrace to the country, and they wished to restore the country's first world war prestige. The plot had been building when it was joined by Lieutenant Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, a wounded veteran and arch-conservative who would ultimately lead the assassination attempt. But it was about to go terribly wrong. The plan had many layers. First, von Stauffenberg would assassinate Hitler with a planted bomb. The many members of the German military leadership would quickly spread the word that Hitler was dead and use that opportunity to install a new government led by aristocrats and military leaders that would be able to win the war. But after von Stauffenberg planted the bomb, a colonel accidentally moved it, shielding Hitler and leading him to only be injured. The coup failed as soon as word got out that Hitler was still alive. The conspirators were arrested and almost 5,000 were executed, including von Stauffenberg and many political enemies of Hitler, as the mad dictator's regime would continue for another 10 months. For more on the most famous assassination of all, check out Why Did Abraham Lincoln's Secret Service Fail? 
or watch Insane But True Story of a Real Life Assassin for a look at what it takes to kill high-profile targets.